Hey everyone. Welcome back for the third part of Cammy's experiment. You guys seem to really be loving this story as much as me, and so I'm bringing you the next part as soon as possible. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the rest of the story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Team selections and Janan tests, the next day, Naruto bid farewell to Gara, Konkuro, Tamari, Mayuri, Rasa, Samui, Amoi, Karu, Yugito and gave a firm handshake to Ai, who smirked at him and declared that when Naruto was grown, they would have a spar. Naruto returned the smirk with one of his own and bumped his fist with the massive mid of the 4th rakage. He said goodbye to his friends, one by one, and he stopped Samui from kissing his lips with a soft turn of his head. He had been honest with her about his feelings for the other girls and didn't want to disrespect them in public. Of course, the attempted kiss didn't escape Tamari's notice, who rapidly pulled Naruto into an alley around the corner before she placed a passionate kiss on his lips. He returned the kiss and ended it with a nibble to her bottom lip and a firm squeeze of Tamari's ass. After reassuring her, he smacked her on the butt and forced her to rejoin the group. He locked eyes with Gara and gave him a firm nod of the head, which earned a smile from Suna's Jinchuriki. After the groups departed, the Hokage returned to his office and dispatched his Anbu to gather the potential Jonin Sensei. Three hours later, due to one silver-haired ninja with a face mask, the meeting was finally able to start. Hiruzen growled as he set down his pipe. Kakashi, this is the last time you will be late when answering my call. I care not for your petty rebellion, it was time for you to leave the Anbu. The next time you are late, you will be doing one week of D-rank missions solo with half pay. The punishment will double each time. The Jonin in the room sniggered and Kakashi glared at each of them with his single eye. We care not for the civilian teams that we know will fail, so we will cut straight to the good stuff dear readers. Hiruzen cleared his throat after Genma's protest of getting another purely civilian Janan team. Alright, Team 7, it will be led by Kakashi Hitake. Kakashi, any preferences for your team? Kakashi looked up from his orange book and I smiled. Sasuke Uchiha, Naruto send you and I don't care. Kakashi returned his attention to the orange book. Iruka, who had joined the Jonin as the fresh Janan's academy instructor, stood up in protest. Kakashi, if you read the portfolios I prepared instead of your smut, you would know that Naruto and Sasuke are oil and water. Putting them on the same team would be catastrophic. Hiruzen blew out a ring of smoke, Iruka is right. I will grant you Sasuke, but Naruto has already been claimed by another, that was approved by me. This earned whispers around the room, but Kakashi's I smile fell. Lord Hokage, he is the son of my sensei. It is my right and duty to train him. When I took him to Tsunade he said as much. Kakashi protested. Hiruzen cocked an eyebrow, you have no such right. As Iruka stated, the Uchiha boy and Naruto cannot be on the same team. Naruto would end up killing Sasuke before they even completed their first C rank. Kakashi scoffed, if I don't get my sensei's son, then who does? I do, senpai. Came a soft voice from the corner of the room. All eyes turned to see Itachi Uchiha making his presence know. I will be taking team 8 and I requested Naruto. I cannot take my little brother as it would be a conflict of interest. Kakashi turned a disbelieving eye to the Hokage. You are going to have an Uchiha trainer send you? Are you insane? Hiruzen stood up and flared his aura, which instantly got Kakashi to back down. That will be enough, Kakashi. If you will not end your tantrum, then leave. I will send an Anbu with your team assignment if you cannot refrain from disrupting the meeting further. After Hiruzen retook his seat, a beautiful red-eyed Kunoichi stepped forward. Um, Lord Hokage, I thought I was going to be the Jonin sensei of Team 8, Hiruzen sighed wearily, he had forgotten to have that conversation with Kurinai. Look, Ms. Ui, you are a very fresh Jonin. For this cycle, I will have you acting as a supplementary instructor when you are not on missions. You will learn from your peers and develop a teaching style of your own. In one year, you will be granted a Janan team. Kurinai bowed her head submissively and stifled the tears threatening to escape. As you wish, Lord Hokage. Hiruzen laid the to rest and looked at Itachi. I have already granted you Naruto Senju, do you have any other preferences, Itachi? According to the reports, the Hyuga heiress will be allowed to join the Janan teams due to her father's recovery. I wish for her because Naruto is already close to her, and she has great potential. I will leave the third to you, 
but I request that it is in Kiba Inuzuka due to conflicting personalities. Kurenai looked with heavy interest at Itachi. He requested her surrogate sister. Kurenai had tried to help Hinata throughout her childhood and she had redoubled her efforts after the massacre. She would definitely be talking to Itachi to take part in the team's training. Plus, he was the only person in the village that could outdo her in Genjutsu. Hiruzen puffed his pipe and looked at his son. Asuma, any requests? Asuma was chewing agitatedly on a cigarette. Ino Shika Cho. Enough said with that, Itachi chuckled, which caught the Jonin in the room off guard. If you think you will be able to coast by, think again. Ino and even Shikarmaru have been joining Naruto for his training sessions. If you aren't careful and attentive, they will lose all respect for you as a sensei. Asuma's cigarette fell out of his mouth. He thought he could take this team and ride their coattails as a Jonin sensei. He thought the Nara would lead and plan and be lazy. Thanks for the heads up, Itachi. Jonin, you are dismissed, Iruka please stay and help me plan these out. You will get your teams this Friday now that all students have returned. If you don't like your Janan teams, that is too bad. Deal with it. Hiruzen issued the warning in a vain attempt to prevent his week from being disrupted by whining Jonin sensei. That Thursday, Naruto, Ino, Shikamaru, Kuji, who was simply following Shikamaru, and Hanabi were waiting outside of the hospital. They didn't have to wait too long when they saw a nurse pushing Hyashi Hyuga out of the hospital's front doors in a wheelchair. The Hyuga clan head tried to maintain a dignified look as he rested with his back straight and face fixed in the wheelchair. As they exited the hospital doors, Naruto took over pushing the wheelchair for the nurse by disarming Hinata's protest with a smile. Hyashi noticed the interaction, but there were more important things to deal with. Thank you all for coming and thank you for supporting my daughter during my recovery. Hyashi slightly inclined his head to the group. No problem, Naruto chirped, Hinata is like a little sister to us. We would never let her go through something that awful alone. This earned a blush from the Hyuga heiress and a snigger from Hanabi. Ah, yes, Naruto sends you, it appears that I owe you a great debt. My daughter informed me that you removed and replaced the seals. How did you accomplish such a feat so quickly? Hyashi asked. I believe we can discuss that in private, Lord Hyuga. For now, why don't we enjoy the fact that you are out of the hospital? Naruto countered, not wanting to spill secrets in public. At Hyashi's reluctant nod, the group walked through Konoha where many villagers offered their congratulations on Hyashi's recovery and condolences for the loss of his clan. The Hyuga Patriarch did his best to remain poised as the many condolences came one after another. His expression started to crack, and tears were poorly hidden behind his white eyes by the time the group reached the front gate of the Hyuga compound. Unmarked guards displayed their foreheads proudly and welcomed Hyashi back to the compound. After a welcome back celebration, Hyashi pulled Naruto into his office for a long overdue conversation. Hinata attempted to join the pair, but Naruto got her to back down with a sorry smile and a please. Naruto sat across from Hyashi's desk and met the intimidating man's gaze. Where to start? I guess, I should say the Hyuga clan, thanks you for all your assistance over these past months. I specifically owe you a sizable debt of gratitude. Hyashi started after staring impassively at Naruto. No, Lord Hyuga, you do not. I have not done what I have for you. I did it for your daughter. Naruto countered. My daughter? Correct me if I am wrong, but you had no interaction with my daughter before your return to the village. Hyashi said with a raised eyebrow. During my time in hiding, she was one of my true friends. You could say I have been a part of her life since her 5th birthday, in fact. During my time away, I always kept an eye on her and some others when I sent clones to scout Konoha. Naruto answered truthfully. He knew that all Hyugas can easily tell when someone is lying, thanks to their bloodline. Hyashi cast an incredulous look at Naruto's statement and his eyes took in every small detail of the blonde in front of him. That was you? Naruto nodded. How? How did you know he was going to betray us? The fox grants me certain abilities. I felt their negative intentions tainting the village. As for how, my father stored some of his memories and abilities within my seal and those activated when I was four. I simply used that knowledge and what I learned in my self-studies to thwart the attempt. Naruto answered carefully. Everything he said was a half-truth, but it wasn't a lie and people like Hyashi were used to speaking in half-truths. So, you are the neighborhood watch? Hyashi asked incredulously. Part of it. I will not tell you more at this time. As a partial payment for my aid to your family, I am choosing to trust you with this information. The intimidating preteen met Hyashi's firm gaze with even intensity. Very well, I acknowledge my debt to you and to your father, for that matter. Answer me this, why has the branch family consented to Hinata and myself regaining control of the family? Why have they not finished what Izashi started? 
Did you know I was working with Hisashi to free the branch family? Naruto countered his questions with a question. Yes, he told me that he was working to create a counter seal. I was under strict observation by the elders, but he was able to move more freely. Hyashi answered. Do you know why he snapped? Naruto asked another question. No. Hyashi answered simply. Otaru went after Neji, whose prisoner seal I had disabled. When the seal didn't work, he ordered him whipped and beaten. Then the elders talked behind your back about executing him, which drove Hizashi into a state of madness. With his prisoner seal disabled by me, he tore through them. He killed them so nobody could take revenge on the branch family by activating all of their cursed seals. Then why did he attack me? Hyashi countered. Did he attack you or did you put yourself in his way? Naruto asked, unflustered by Hyashi's scowl. Hyashi processed the memories of the night and then nodded his head. I tried to get in his way. The fight moved from the courtyard because Hinata and Hanabi attempted to interfere, and I thought he would kill them too. Naruto shook his head, you should know your brother better than that. After I saved you, I talked to him after he disabled me. He never intended to hurt you or your daughters. He knew you wouldn't take revenge on the Branch family. Okay, let's say I accept that. Let's go back to why the Branch family is still deferring to my daughter. Hyashi redirected. Simple, because that was the condition for me removing their seals and placing the new one. They are all bound by Uzumaki contract to respect my wishes. If any of them attack with intention to kill your daughters, their chakra will automatically be sealed. It helped that Hinata had made her intentions to remove the seal known early on in life. Naruto answered. Why are you so committed to helping my daughter? This goes far past childhood infatuation. Hyashi couldn't wrap his head around this concept. Naruto shrugged. I have the rights to my secrets. Hyashi conceded and his shoulder slumped. Do you wish to marry my daughter? Whoa. No, no, no. That came out of left field. Naruto was flustered for the first time in the meeting and was shaking his hands rapidly in front of him. An amused smirk planted itself on Hyashi's face. Well, why not? It is clear that you care about her. Naruto regained his composure and glared at Hyashi. Look here, old man, your daughter is a great girl. That being said, we are 13, or I will be 13 soon. Marriage is not on the discussion block at this time. Your daughter is my friend, if something more comes naturally, then we will deal with it at that time. Hyashi's smirk changed to a small, concealed smile. Very well, I look forward to that day. So, what did the Hyuga owe you for your services? There should be a contract signed by your daughter on your desk. The payment can be at your leisure. I will hold on to the favor for a later date. For now, look after Neji. I haven't been able to interact with him much, but he is taking the loss of his father hard. I never asked, but what happened to his mother? Hyashi's smile faded. She succumbed to a brain tumor, likely due to use of the caged bird seal. It was one of the main reasons Hisashi bore a grudge against the main family. Then my first request is that you formally adopt Neji. Take care of him and help him heal. Naruto asked with a slight dip of his head. Hyashi nodded but looked with an analytical gaze at the blonde. Why? The question is going to bother me, Naruto Senju. Why go so far for my family? Why not do what I can to make the world a better place? Rest assured, your family is not the only one I have helped. Naruto answered without answering his question. The conversation continued in this evasive manner until Hyashi thanked Naruto once again and escorted him out of the compound. That Friday, Naruto picked Hinata up early from her compound and then walked to Ino's house. Shikamaru and Kuji were waiting with Ino, and the group made their way to the academy together. Shikamaru used the time to bring Kuji up to speed on Naruto and the rotund boy accepted Naruto easily. Naruto noticed that Kuji was much buffer than he remembered at this point, and he asked him about it. Kuji wore an abashed look when he answered the question. Well, Kumo was really committed to physical training. I was younger than everybody and I had to work really hard to catch up. Killer B took me under his wing and taught me proper dieting for bodybuilding. It went well with my family specialty and now I look like this. Kuji finished as he pulled a strip of jerky out of his pouch and began munching on it. Troublesome. You do bodybuilding and we get stuck with CrossFit. Shikamaru groaned. Aw, Shika, don't say that. CrossFit workouts are shorter and higher intensity than bodybuilding. Think of it this way, it gives you more time to look at the clouds. Naruto offered in an amused tone, which drew laughs from the group. Yeah, Shika, plus you look a lot better than you did six months ago. You actually look like a ninja. Ino added. Troublesome blondes. The group made it to the academy and took their seats. Nobody missed the scowls from Sasuke and Kiba when Naruto entered. 
Sasuke because the blonde was so much stronger than him, and his father chastised him for it. Kiba because Naruto was close to Hinata and had taken his self-claimed position as the class alpha. Even though Kiba felt a debt of loyalty to Naruto, he simply couldn't get past his feelings for Hinata and his jealousy for Naruto's station in the class. The group ignored the scowling boys, the screeching girls and Irika's closing statement for the semester. They only perked up when it was time for team announcements. Team 1, Nobody Cares, Team 7 will be Sasuke Uchiha, Kiba Inuzuka and Sakura Haruno under the command of Kakashi Hitake. Enter the usual screeching from Sakura and groans from Sasuke. Team 8 will be Naruto Senju, Hinata Hyuga, Shino Aburame under Itachi Uchiha. Sensei. Why does that bastard get to be on the same team as Hinata? Kiba growled out. Sensei, why does he get my brother? Sasuke exclaimed. After silencing the boys, Iruka provided an answer. Teams were chosen by the Hokage. Sasuke, family members are discouraged from taking their siblings on Janan teams because we want to avoid favoritism. Now, please remain silent. Team 9 is still in service, so Team 10 will be Shikamaru Nara, Kuji Akimichi and Ino Yamanaka. Ino groaned and leaned into Naruto. Damn it, I knew our dads would ruin this for me. Sorry, Ruto, looks like we aren't on the same team. Ino's pouty voice earned her a pat on the head from Naruto. It's okay, Ino. We can still train together before and after team sessions are over. It just gives you a reason to reach Chunin faster, that way we could be assigned missions together, Naruto consoled his friend. Ino used her puppy dog eyes, enhanced with unshed tears, to shoot her best pouty face at Naruto. You promise, Ruto? Naruto felt Hinata grip onto his arm and felt her glare at Ino. Yeah, we are friends. I will help you all train no matter what happens. Just because we aren't on the same team doesn't mean anything. You will just have to pester your sensei to do joint training with us. Kuji polished off another stick of jerky before opening a bag of trail mix. Yeah, I am interested in the crossfit. Count me in. Shikamaru groaned, must everyone be so troublesome? The group's talk was interrupted by three jonins entering the room. One was a raven-haired young man with deep tear trough set into his face. He wore the standard Konoha Jonin outfit and had a tanto secured to his back. The next was Asuma, look it up. The final one was Kurenai in her Naruto standard uniform, once again, look it up. Team 8, with me. Itachi called and began walking out of the room. The red-eyed beauty followed him out of the room as Naruto, Hinata and Shino rushed out of the room after saying their goodbyes to their classmates. Team 10, with me. Team 7, go grab lunch, your sensei is chronically late, Asuma said calmly while chewing on a cigarette. Team 10 waited as the other Jonin sensei entered the room to grab their teams before they were able to follow Asuma out. Ino squashed the urge to smack Shikamaru over the head for dragging his feet, but that didn't stop her from barking orders at him. Kuji just walked behind the duo with a heavy amount of amusement displayed on his chubby face. Back with Team 8, Itachi took the group and Kurenai to the memorial stone and took a seat on the ground. Alright, Team 8, we will start with introductions. I am Itachi Uchiha, I like my family, Konoha and Paki. I hate traitors and arrogance. My dream is to become the first Uchiha Hokage and lead Konoha well. My hobbies include training, working on new jutsu and mastering the Sharingan, Itachi said in a calm monotone. I am Kurenai Yuhi. I am a new Jonin and a Genjutsu specialist. I am here to gain experience as a sensei and provide assistance to this batch of Janan teams. I like Genjutsu, my friends and romance novels. I hate perverts and traitors. My dream is to be known as the best Genjutsu mistress, lead a Janan team and find a good man to start a family with. My hobbies are refining my Genjutsu arts and leading the women's empowerment movement in Konoha. The last part drew raised eyebrows from Itachi and Team 8, all of them thinking that maybe she was taking things too far. Kurenai pointed to Naruto to pass the mic to him. I am Naruto Senju Uzumaki, I am almost 13 years old. I am the Jinchuriki of the QB. I like my friends in Konoha, Kumo, Suna, and Wave. I also like training, developing new jutsu and my family. I dislike people that are judgmental, traitors and those that would harm my friends. My dream is to make the world a better place and settle down with a family of my own. My hobbies are practicing with my senjutsu, fuenjutsu and my bloodline abilities. I also dabble in writing, but I haven't published anything yet. Itachi, remembering that Naruto had used senjutsu during the Hyuga massacre, confirmed his thoughts. Have you been able to master senjutsu? Kurenai looked incredulously between Naruto and Itachi. Not necessarily master. It takes me far too long to absorb the energy. That being said, I can enter sage mode if I have enough time to meditate. 
I am still waiting on Jiraiya to develop it much further. Naruto answered nonchalantly. Um, sensei, what is Senjutsu in sage mode? Hinata asked. Itachi looked to Naruto, who cast an amused glance at him as if saying why don't you take this one. Itachi fixed his gaze back on Hinata. Senjutsu is the practice of using natural energy to enhance one's own body and capabilities. Sages are incredibly rare and are usually tied to summoning contracts. Jiraiya, the 1st Hokage, the 4th Hokage and Orochimaru were known sages. Everyone was gaping at Naruto, even Shino, though it was hidden by his high collar. Hinata looked super cute as her mouth gaped into a small O and Naruto couldn't stop the thought that maybe that was her O face. Shaking off his inner pervert, Naruto noticed Kurenai giving him an appraising look, but he could care less. She was a beautiful woman, but he was well aware of her genuine disgust for him. He smirked as he thought that he should send Yosuke her way, she looked like the kind of woman that would appreciate an old-fashioned, Bushido-style man. He actually started nodding as the plan came together in his mind. Itachi let the stunned silence hang for a minute before pointing at Hinata. I, I am Hinata Hyuga, heiress of the Hyuga clan. I like Naruto, training and adapting the gentle fist, training in use of the bow and cinnamon buns. I dislike people that attempt to control others, judgmental people and perverts. Naruto already helped accomplish my dream, so I am just trying to become a dependable kunoichi. My hobbies include flower pressing, tea ceremonies and creating medical creams. Kurenai beamed at Hinata while Itachi simply nodded and pointed to Shino. Shina answered in his usual monotone. I am Shino Abarame, and I am the heir of the Abarame clan. I like bugs, strengthening my hive and making my clan proud. I dislike people that abuse bugs, people that judge me for what I carry and traitors. My dream is to become the first Abarame to host five queens. My hobbies include bug catching and tending to my colonies. That's pretty cool Shino. You should stop by my compound. My Senjutsu practice gathers a lot of natural energy and it has some pretty cool effects on the surrounding wildlife. Also, since I am a Jinchuriki, I was wondering if your bugs would benefit from my specific chakra. Naruto offered, clearly extending an olive branch of friendship. If Shino wasn't held by his stoic clan traditions, he would have leapt over and glommed onto Naruto. As it was, Shino was a true Abarame, so he settled with a gleam in his eyes, hidden by his sunglasses, and a smile obscured by his high collar. Naruto was able to sense his excitement and he heard Shino's voice crack. That would be, that would be most appreciated, Naruto. Itachi smiled at the interaction but decided to get the Janan test over with. If Kurenai weren't there, he likely would have passed them straight through. He clapped his hands together to break the touching moment and snapped them all back to looking at Itachi. Alright, so if you didn't know, you aren't true Janan yet. Today, we will have a test. Itachi closed his eyes and a shadow clone popped into existence and started speaking for him. Your task today will be to destroy me. All it will take is one good hit. You have an hour to complete this task. Begin. Kurenai watched with an amused smile as the Janan darted into the tree line. Then, she lost them, which was strange since she was a natural sensor. Deciding to investigate, she cast a knowing glance at Itachi and his clone, who remained motionless in the clearing. She hopped into the tree line and started looking for the Janan. Her senses let her feel 200 meters and she calmed her breathing and stilled her motion to focus on spreading her chakra. To her amazement, the Janan were right below her, but their presences were obscured by a barrier that was layered with a genjutsu. After five minutes, Kurenai watched the Janan emerge from the barrier and noticed that Naruto glanced up and winked at her. Deciding to watch the impending show, she followed the team and took up an overwatch position high in a tree that bordered the clearing. She was joined. Shortly after by Itachi, who remained impassive and crossed his arms as he watched the Janan execute their plan. He activated his Sharingan to make sure he didn't miss anything. Itachi noticed immediately that there were two teams of three. One walking calmly toward Itachi's clone and another setting up behind the clone, who hadn't activated its Sharingan in the spirit of fairness. The clone watched the three Janan approaching cautiously and it stiffened its posture slightly to a more battle-ready stance. Itachi watched as the three figures in the open attacked in tandem with Naruto leading the way followed by Hinata using any openings he created. Strangely, the Abarame was only limiting the clone's movements with Shuriken, which clued Itachi into the fact that this was the clone group. Itachi noticed the three Janan using the chaos created by the clones to envelop the Itachi clone in a loose triangle, with Shino remaining in the clone's blind spot. Itachi's Sharingan picked up on the miniature chakra signatures of Shino's Kikaiku bugs that flew just above the ground and from high above. As Itachi's clone popped the final shadow clone, the three were in position and closing in fast. Flurries of shuriken and kunai were launched at the clone from three sides and the clone jumped into the air. 
Naruto, seeing the clone was airborne, used water style, water gun to shoot multiple, fast moving, condensed water bullets from the tip of his finger. Hinata also used the water element and used water style, water bullet and spewed two larger globs of water at the airborne clone. The clone, restricted from using the Kawarimi by its creator, spun rapidly and used fire style, mythical flower jutsu and spit globs of fire that intercepted each of the water jutsu that were attempting to collide with it. Shino, see that it was his time to shine, sent out the signal for his bugs on the ground to fly up at the clone's new trajectory while the bugs from above came down. The clone saw the swarming insects, but it was forced to use its kunai to intercept another three water globs that were shot out of the tip of Naruto's finger. Trapped by bugs, water and Janan waiting to strike, the clone accepted its defeat. Overall, it took less than 10 minutes for the team to destroy Itachi's heavily restricted shadow clone, but it was still a good display of teamwork from fresh Janan. Itachi appeared in the clearing and gathered his team around before breaking it down. Very good, you demonstrated an adequate level of teamwork and consolidated your skills quickly. Who came up with the plan? And whose barrier hid you while planning? Kurenai added. Naruto raised his hand. Well, we came up with the plan as a team, but you restricted your clone too much, Itachi Sensei. Kurenai Sensei, that was my Genjutsu Enhanced Privacy Dome. It is a standard tag that I carry. Itachi smiled at his team. Yes, my clone was restricted, but it would be more than enough to deal with your standard Janan team. In fact, it is rare for Janan to be adept with elemental jutsu at this stage. Who taught you water manipulation? Um, Itachi Sensei, everyone in Naruto's study group could do as much. He wasn't happy with what we were learning at the academy, so he started a study group and trained us up. Sorry, Shino, you were already in Suna. Hinata answered. Itachi turned his gaze on Naruto, care to explain? Naruto shrugged, Sensei, I have access to a metric crap ton of chakra and the Senju notes. Between Grandpa Hashi's and Uncle Toby's notes, water manipulation was one of the first things I learned. I could water walk before I left Konoha when I was five. Kurenai was gobsmacked and she stuttered out a question. WW water W walking at, at five? That, that is impossible, your chakra coils wouldn't be developed enough. Naruto shrugged before looking blankly at Kurenai. My chakra activated on its own when I was four and I was almost killed by a mob. Most people don't have a bijou fox sealed in their stomach either. So, when dealing with me, I recommend throwing the standard book out the window, Itachi chuckled at Kurenai's stunned and disbelieving look. Very well, Naruto, I will come and observe one of your training sessions. When is your next one? Tonight. Itachi raised an eyebrow. You thought you would be able to layer additional training into your first day as a Janan? Hinata giggled, um... Sensei, Naruto is a stamina freak. Even if you worked us half to death, he would be ready to go by the evening training session. Itachi smirked, is that a challenge, young Hyuga? Hinata paled, Shino buzzed nervously, and Naruto laughed outrageously. Hinata cast a pleading look at Naruto, who stepped to her defense. Well, Sensei, my guess is that you have to report to the Hokage so we would be dismissed after our Janan test. If you feel like putting me to the test, I will accept your challenge, but only if you do it with me. Itachi's smirk grew. Very well, since you all completed your Janan test so rapidly, follow me for an Anbu warm-up. Naruto wore a crazed look as he doggedly pursued Itachi throughout the workout, surpassing Kurenai and thoroughly impressing the Uchiha. Hinata was able to outpace Shino, but she was still being lapped by the competing duo. They were doing laps around the training ground with workout stations every half lap. Alternating running, burpees, crab walking, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups and lunges at the workout stations. Itachi called out a number of each given exercise. Every time he stopped before he blurred through the exercise and darted off, with Naruto nipping at his heels. An hour later, a sweaty Itachi came to an abrupt halt and watched with an amused smile as a panting and sweaty Naruto slid to a stop next to him. Kurenai was able to outlast Hinata and join the pair next, clearly exhausted with sweat dampening her uniform, which made Itachi fidget nervously. Maybe Naruto would halt his plan with Yosuke and play matchmaker with his two sensei. Hinata pulled up next, a couple minutes after Kurenai, but she was frustrated that Naruto and Itachi had lapped her multiple times. Shino struggled the most, having only endured academy-level workouts and his family's workout regimen. He joined the group nearing a state of total collapse with his bugs making an irritated and tired buzzing noise from within his jacket. Well, Itachi-sensei, when you are done with the old man, feel free to stop by and I will run you through a CrossFit session, Naruto said with excitement lacing his voice. Itachi noticed that Hinata shuddered at his words, but he couldn't stop the amused smile from growing on his face. 
Very well, Naruto. I will take you up on that. Tell me, what seals are you using to limit your movement? Itachi asked, which drew a shocked look from Kuranai. Well, I have 50 pounds on each forearm and calf. I have 100 pounds and a weight seal on my shirt. I was forced to reduce my resistance seals to level 1 to keep up with you. Before you freak out, my levels are regulated and monitored by Tsunade, she makes sure I do not limit my natural growth. Naruto answered. Itachi blushed in a state of nervous embarrassment, he had weight seals, but they were only at 25 pounds per limb. His illness was receding, thanks to Tsunade, but he would be the first to admit that he wasn't the most physically fit Jonin. After all, a fresh Shinan was able to keep up with him with that much of a handicap. He attributed it to the QB to save his bruised ego. Okay, well, once we have gotten the group up to the appropriate physical standards, I will ask you to apply seals to them as well, Naruto laughed before explaining his behavior. Hinata and my whole study group already have them, of course they have far less weight and resistance though. I can apply them to Shino whenever. Kurenai was hanging her head in embarrassment. Her little sister figure was already more physically fit than she was, and she wasn't even fully grown yet. She had devoted most of her efforts to her genjutsu and she was only at tuning level in speed and taijutsu. She would have to remedy that, so firming her resolve, she spoke to the group. And Naruto, see could I J join your workouts as well? Kurenai asked, cursing her stutter. Naruto shot an amused look at the red-eyed beauty. Is Hinaheim rubbing off on you, Kurenai-sensei? Kurenai's blush deepened and the group's laughter continued. I am just ribbing you, of course you can join. I think I'm going to enjoy my time with this group, Itachi thought, as a small grin appeared on his face. Now, Naruto, don't give her too hard a time. Sounds like we will be joining for you for your next CrossFit session. What time do you start in the morning? 5.30am since we are now in our teams. Evening sessions start at 6pm. Naruto answered blandly. Itachi and Kurenai failed to suppress their grimaces, they were Jonin dammit and they had earned their beauty sleep. Itachi and Kurenai went to join the other Jonin sensei at the Hokaye's office to report Team 8 passing and they found that Team 7 and 10 passed as well. No surprises there, but they were surprised when Hiruzen stated that all Jinan that failed would be moved to the reserve roster. He also asked the Jonin sensei that didn't pass their teams to act as part-time trainers for the reserve Jinan and said that each week of training would count as a standard B rank mission. Itachi, Kakashi, Asuma, Genma, Ebisu and Kurenai went to the Jonin bar to discuss what they wished to teach their Jinan. To their dismay, Mike Guy saw them walking through the village and decided to join his eternal rival in their youthful discussion. It all proceeded normally until Kurenai mentioned the CrossFit session at the Senju compound, which caused Itachi to give her a horrified look. Naturally, Guy had something to say about that. CrossFit? What is this CrossFit you speak of? At the Senju compound? What time may I inform my youthful students to attend the most youthful workout with the eternally youthful Senju? From what I have heard that boy's youth shines with the fire of a thousand suns, Guy shouted enthusiastically. Itachi banged his head on the table, Kakashi patted his junior's shoulder in a comforting manner and Kurenai shot an apologetic look across the table to Itachi. Um, 530. In the afternoon, right? Genma asked incredulously. Kurenai shook her head in dismay. No, in the morning. The afternoon session starts at 6 p.m. Guy stood up from the table and thrust his fist into the air. Oh, what a youthful demonstration of the youthful beauty that is the truest representation of the flames of youth. Count me out, Kakashi said blandly as he returned his attention to his little orange book. He wanted to get to know his little brother better, but he had no inclination to work out more, especially with Guy involved. Me too. Added Genma with a horrified look on his face. Me three, as my new student would say, that is far too troublesome. Asuma added. Itachi smirked, oh, Asuma, you would let your students work out without you? Itachi's normally stoic tone carried an unusually playful mirth in it. Asuma's cigarette fell from his mouth. You are kidding me, right? Asuma looked around at each of the Jonin, right? He asked in a pleading tone. Nope, Ino and Shikamaru have been part of his study sessions. Naruto even has them equipped with weight and resistance seals. Itachi was taking great joy in rubbing this in Asuma's face. As their new Jonin sensei, it would set a horrible example if you weren't there to join them. Guy's flamboyant shouts of youth rang through the Jonin bar and drew more than a few heads to their table. The next morning, at 5.30am, Naruto was scratching his head as Tsunade, Shizun, Itachi, Kurenai, Asuma, Shikamaru, Ino, Kuji, Mike Guy, Rock Lee, Neji Hyuga, Tenten, Hinata and Shino reported at his front gates for the morning CrossFit training. 
he immediately knew that he didn't have enough equipment, so he changed his plans and quickly addressed the group. Okay, while I am glad that my training has drawn the attention of so many youthful people, Naruto emphasized youthful and caused many of the attendees to flinch and cast a terrified look at Guy, who was bouncing on the balls of his feet excitedly. I had a different training session planned, but this will do. My clones will set up a chakra null zone and we will do a workout that will provide a baseline for your level of physical fitness. Huji raised his hand, since he was new, and he asked his question when Naruto paused and nodded to him. Um, Naruto, nice to see you again. What is a chakra null zone? It is a pleasure, Kuji. A chakra null zone is a seal I can set to completely negate the use of your chakra. It will also disable any resistance or weight seals, so be aware of that. Naruto started before being interrupted again. Naruto nodded to Kurenai this time. Um, why not let us use our chakra? Kurenai asked. Okay, everyone please follow my clones through the calisthenic exercises while I break this down for you. If you are already aware of this information, just bear with me so I can bring those that don't know up to speed. The group spread out and began warming up. Kurenai, I am depriving you of your chakra because chakra is a force multiplier. Unfortunately, too many ninjas rely on chakra to do everything for them. Think of it this way, let's say a standard jonin's chakra can multiply their strength and speed by a factor of 10 when they channel it throughout their bodies. 5 times 10 is 50, in this case 5 is the base level of physical fitness. Now, let's take Rock Lee for example and say his base level is 25. In that case, we are talking about a difference of 50 to 250. When chakra enhances a physically fit body, the results are multiplicative, thus a force enhancer. Naruto lectured as the group stretched. Asuma asked the next question, don't weight and resistance seals make up for that difference? Naruto nodded to Tsunade, who explained to the group. Weight and resistance seals operate off of your own chakra. They are more a tool to efficiently channel chakra than they are a raw strength enhancement. Trust me, medicine and science says that nothing beats a good old-fashioned, chakra-free, workout. Guy was jumping five feet into the air with each hop as he eagerly asked his question. Okay, Naruto-sensei, what is this physical assessment? Naruto smirked, which terrified the group. I am glad you asked, Guy-sensei. This workout is called 30 minutes in heaven. To start, the cycle for this workout is 20 seconds on with 10 seconds of rest. You will set a number of each exercise that you will complete each 20 second cycle. Your score for that exercise is the lowest number you are able to complete in a 20 second interval. Say you set your push-up goal as 20 per set but on your last set you only get 15. Then your assessment score for push-ups is 15 points. Each exercise will go for a total of 4 minutes. In between exercises, there is a 1 minute break. The exercises will be push-ups, air squats, sit-ups, bicycle kicks, pull-ups and burpees. You will be in pairs with your partner counting your score and vice versa. Push-ups are worth 1 point apiece, air squats are 1 point apiece, sit-ups are 2 points every 3 sit-ups. Bicycle kicks are worth half point apiece, pull-ups are 2 points apiece, burpees are worth 2.5 points apiece. Any questions? Rock Lee's hand shot into the air and Naruto suppressed a laugh as he pointed to the eager youth. What did the winners get? Naruto made a show of thinking over it and during that time a beautiful idea hit him. Well, Lee, this will end up being a competition against yourself and I will use it as a marker for your improvement. We will do this exercise once every two weeks to track our progress. Naruto noticed Lee pout and Guy was about to move in to motivate his student, so Naruto spoke. But if that isn't enough for you, I propose we have a competition between you and I. Guy started shedding anime tears. My student and Naruto sensei are so youthful. They're flames of youth. Guy's exclamation was halted by a bonk on the head from Ten Ten. Look, scores will be posted as a sort of motivation. Since Lee accepted my bet, the winner gets to make the loser do something until the next physical assessment, sound fair? Lee nodded his head enthusiastically. Indeed, Naruto-sensei, that sounds most youthful. The group got over their shutters and broke into pairs. Several Naruto clones were created and began observing the CrossFit participants. After creating the clones, Naruto deactivated the seal that exempted him from the chakra null zone and felt the disconnect to his potent chakra. Since he was competing against Lee, he paired up with the excitable youth and let him go first. A whistle rang out across the field, and everyone blurred into motion. 20 seconds later, the whistle rang again, and the movement halted as everyone tried to steady their pace. This process continued for the next 30 minutes. Naruto took great satisfaction in looking at the exhausted forms of everyone that went first in this exercise. He took particular enjoyment at the horrified look on Shikamaru's face, 
especially since Naruto's clone kept him from fleeing. Lee had pushed himself hard and fell victim to the nature of the workout. He set the bar too high for himself and burned himself out early on. In the first 20 seconds, Lee did 30 push-ups. In the last set of push-ups, Lee was only able to do 10, which made his score for that exercise a flat 10. This pattern continued with the spandex-clad youth for every exercise. Naruto told everyone to get ready for the next iteration and all those yet to complete the workout firmed their resolve. When the whistle blew, they blurred into motion and began their 30 minutes in heaven, if Kami were a sadistic bitch. Naruto set a high bar, but he paced himself in a manner that he would be able to complete the max number for each set. He paced himself through the workout, despite him gasping for air and feeling the intense burn of muscle groups throughout his body. Finally, the last whistle blew, and he joined his compatriots in Shikamaru's pastime as the sun began to rise over Konoha. After deactivating the null zone and collecting and compiling everyone's scores, they panned out about how Naruto expected them to. Guy won with a total of 283 points, Naruto in second with 262 points, Kuji in last with 112 points and Lee came in with 152 points, thanks to him constantly burning himself out. Naruto wrote the totals on a chalkboard and turned it for everyone to see how they matched up to their peers. Okay, so this assessment requires knowing your limits and setting realistic goals. I think we all know Lee would have scored much higher if he paced himself better and set realistic goals. Remember, the idea is to complete your given number every 20 second interval for the duration of the exercise. If you commit to the ideology behind the workout, it is an effective measuring tool. We will complete this again in two weeks to give you another shot. Not all of my workouts will nullify your chakra, but this one always will. If you wish for me to apply seals to you, the going rate is $200 for weight seals and $400 for resistance seals. Unfortunately for you, Fuinjutsu is the family business and I need to make a living. That is actually pretty cheap, Naruto. Asuma chipped in as he struggled to light a cigarette, which made Kur and I recoil in disgust. Yeah, well you all get the family discount. For those that wish to stay for chakra training, you are welcome too. Guy sensei if I'm going to have this many people, I'm going to need more equipment. Would you be able to requisition it from the Hokage for me? Naruto asked the enthusiastic man. Guy nodded somberly. That is a most youthful request. Unfortunately, my student lost to you, so I wish to know his punishment before I accept this new task. As his sensei, I will join my youthful student in his punishment since it is my duty as his jonin sensei. Naruto's smirk looked truly feral, and he looked between Guy and Lee. Very well. For the next two weeks Lee must get a fashion makeover by Ino Yamanaka and dress according to her instructions. Ino, I will pay you a C rank for each of them, deal? Ino nodded before she paled and froze on the spot due to being exposed to the sunset of youth. In fact, everyone froze and grew bug-eyed as the constant waves crashed on the beach of the terrifying Genjutsu. If it weren't for Tenten's club, everyone would have remained stuck in the cursed Genjutsu until permanent damage was done. A weeping Lee wiped away his youthful tears. Very well. Naruto. I have no choice but to set aside the most youthful clothing given to me by Guy Sensei. I will not let this obstacle dampen my flames of youth. Thus, CrossFit became the morning workout for teams 8, 9 and 10. Of course, Lee's team would often go off and do more workouts after the CrossFit session, but at least they brought energy to the butt crack of dawn. For all of the non-crazy people, they grew to enjoy Naruto's non-torturous training that followed the workout. Growing up with Tsunade, and having a previous life's experience, made Naruto a very effective instructor when it came to chakra control and manipulation. He didn't fight it because he was glad to see all of his friends getting stronger alongside him, except Team 7. Itachi took over after the morning workout and chakra control session and would often take his group to training ground aid and have them do teamwork exercises. He broke down team roles, threw them into situational exercises and did full-on mission run-throughs against Naruto's shadow clones. Itachi was a committed and attentive sensei that showed Naruto exactly what he missed out on during the last run-through. After teamwork exercises, he did one hour of individual training that he used shadow clones to address each member's individual needs. He helped Hinata adjust the traditional gentle fist and adapt it to her water affinity. Hyashi provided Hinata with her mother's Juho scroll, which was her mother's interpretation of the gentle fist for those with a water nature affinity. It was much more fluid and graceful and truly fit the beautiful Hyuga. Additionally, Itachi helped her understand his support role in the team as an archer, which was the area Hinata truly shined in. Naruto was enjoying his time with the beautiful Hyuga heiress immensely. He concentrated his efforts on building up her confidence, an area she was still lacking in. Although he knew Hinata liked him, he wasn't ready for anything more than friendship because she was still far too young. There was also Tamari, 
but Hinata didn't know that, and Naruto didn't feel like breaking her heart. Rather than complicate everything, Naruto was content to adopt a more brotherly role in Hinata's life for the time being. Shino was almost completely reliant on his clan's jutsu, which revolved around his kikaiku. Itachi worked to develop Shino's earth affinity and he taught him how to use it effectively. Shino was the ultimate support type ninja in a battle with his kikaiku and earth jutsu. Itachi taught Shino how to shape and guide the flow of the battle to benefit his allies and lead enemies into traps. Shino grew the most during the first month of training physically and with chakra control. This was largely due to the fact that Hinata and Naruto were so far ahead of him, but that shouldn't take away from his accomplishment. Shino also had one of his kikaiku queens on Naruto constantly during training sessions and this yielded some interesting results. A new strain of kikaiku that were larger and faster than Shino's standard hive emerged. These kikaiku bugs consumed chakra at a much faster rate and they became more resistant to Naruto's potent and corrosive chakra. Naruto explained the difference between a normal shinobi and jinchuriki when it came to chakra type and density. He explained how each village had access to jinchuriki and how he could encounter them on the battlefield. This new hive was Shino's first attempt and an answer on how to counter the threat represented by jinchuriki and other powerful ninjas. If Shino's battle prowess were quantified according to Jinan standards, it would have been about a 4 tenths to start and he was at about a 6 tenths after the first month. As far as Naruto was concerned, his relationship with Itachi was much better than in his previous life. Naruto opened up to Itachi and shared almost everything with him. Itachi helped him wherever he could, but he focused on diversifying Naruto's kenjutsu and taijutsu, since he lacked Naruto's chakra affinities. He offered his advice where it fit, but he would be the first to admit that Naruto was more of a peer than a student. Itachi acted as Naruto's bridge to the Uchiha and the Hokage. After a month, Naruto had earned Itachi's trust and confidence, which painted a much more detailed picture on the behind-the-scenes details of the village than Naruto had before. Naruto realized how ignorant he was in his previous life due to the guidance and tutelage of Itachi. He also realized how much of an asset Itachi was and how much his mere presence changed in this timeline. After an evening CrossFit session, teams 8, 9 and 10 along with Kurenai went to Akimichi Barbecue to relax and catch up on recent events. They had reached out to Team 7 on multiple occasions, but they were shut down repeatedly. The more vocal members of the teams hogged the conversation and complained about the boring and monotonous rank missions. Team 9 laughed at their misfortune, but they were still relegated to the village chores in between their C ranks. So, Team 8, are you going to share how you got on the leaderboard for the Torah mission? Asuma asked, looking between Itachi and the members of Team 8. Itachi smirked, maybe my team is just better than yours, Asuma. Asuma looked offended and Ino stood up for her sensei. No, no way. There is no way you completed the Torah mission in 10 minutes. You must have cheated. Itachi's smirk never fell, and Naruto did an overly exaggerated shot through the heart gesture. You wound me, Ino. I thought you trusted me more than that, Naruto said as he acted out his fake wound to the heart. Oh, shut up and spill Ruto, Ino yelled petulantly, which made Shino, Hinata and Itachi snigger. Naruto tapped his finger on his chin, hmm. Well, hypothetically, if there were a seal master in the village, and said seal master was repeatedly assigned the same capture mission, then maybe the seal master would come up with a solution to his repeated headache? Ino growled and Shikamaru said, quit being troublesome, Naruto. I already have one troublesome blonde to deal with. Naruto shrugged, I won't disclose such information for free. He made a show of his obstinance and stuck his tongue out at Ino. That is the logical thing to do. One must maintain their advantages in battle, even over their allies. Shino added, playing into Naruto's game. Lee, dressed like a normal person due to repeatedly losing to Naruto during the physical assessments, added his two cents. That is most unyouthful Naruto and Shino. You should always help your allies' flames of youth burn brighter. For the fans of Lee, one of the greatest characters in Naruto, the kami of this fanfic will describe Ino's makeover. Lee's bowl cut was transitioned into a faded military style high fade haircut with enough hair on top to spike into a stylish look. The caterpillars were tamed into thin streamlines that emphasized the big, genuine eyes of Rock Lee. Just this change had a great effect on Lee's popularity, and it provided a great amount of gossip. Evidently, the ladies at Eno's preferred salon had to take turns plucking the eyebrows and Lee's eyebrows conquered three of the attendants at the salon before the ladies were satisfied with their work. Eno then changed Lee's whole wardrobe, obviously. Ino modeled him after Naruto's look after she saw what she was working with under the hideous jumpsuit. The boy's body was incredibly toned and Ino had to suppress a blush when she saw Lee topless. 
She had Lee buy four black beaters, four white baggy pants and a black leather jacket with the kanji for guts on the center of his back. For his ninja uniform, she modeled it after the traditional Konoha Chunin uniform, except she took the sleeves off of everything. Lee's biceps and triceps were truly works of art. Naruto got a pair of black knuckle dusters with steel plates on the back. He engraved the weight seals into the gloves and shin guards that he bought for Lee. He also applied the resistance seals free of charge since Lee was an orphan, but Guy insisted on trading Naruto taijutsu lessons for his services. Naruto accepted the generous offer because he knew Guy was the premier taijutsu specialist of the elemental nations. As a brief note, Naruto scanned Lee's damaged chakra coils and began coming up with a plan with Tsunade to let Lee use chakra reinforcement, which would make Lee a total monster. Back to the conversation, Naruto sighed internally, you can dress him up, but he is the same eccentric guy. Ah, Lee, would it make your flames burn brighter if we give you the answer or to have you figure out your own youthful solution? Lee was stumped by the question and Neji was audibly scowling by this point. Ino decided to speak up on behalf of the group. Okay, Ruto, you want to trade? If you tell us how you did it, then I will let you take me on a date, Ino said while fluttering her eyelashes at him. Hinata gasped, the group was shocked and the senseis looked on amused at the interaction. Naruto froze as he debated internally with himself. He had been messaging Tamari almost every night, but they weren't official yet. He felt scummy for thinking about it that way, but a date with Ino would just be like hanging out with her at this point. Despite all of her bravado, she was still a supremely innocent girl. Deciding that there was no harm in indulging Ino, Naruto decided to call her on her bluff. Plastering a confident smile on his face, Naruto looked Ino directly in the eyes making Azure clash against a wavering baby blue. Deal. I placed a tracking seal on Tora's collar along with a paralysis tag. It is as simple as a scoop and grab. Jaws fell and Itachi smirked in pride. Pick you up at 6 this Friday? Ino was blushing furiously and Hinata's Byakugan activated subconsciously with a look of desperation and rage on her face. Naruto pretended not to notice, but he was internally crushed by guilt. He never should have done that in front of Hinata, despite moving toward friendship with the Hyuga heiress. The group stared in an awkward silence as they all felt Hinata's rage, but that turned to worry when Hinata ran out of the restaurant without saying goodbye. Naruto shot an apologetic look in the group, excused himself and chased after Hinata. Naruto found her crying in the alley around the corner from the Akimichi restaurant and he sat down next to her. He pulled her into him and began rubbing her back in a comforting manner. Hinata, I, I am sorry. I never should have done that in front of you. Ino is such a flirt and I forgot myself. Naruto's pathetic attempt at consoling her made her tears pour out at a faster rate. Naruto took a deep breath and wrapped Hinata in a warm hug. Kami, it would have been easier if you could have erased my feelings for those I loved. Hina, I want you to understand something, Naruto whispered soothingly. I count you among my most precious people. I love you in a way that very few would understand, but I don't love you in a romantic way. We are still kids and that may change in the future, but for now I want to be honest with you. Hinata's tears turned to rage as she looked up with hardened and teary eyes. Why am I not good enough for you? Is it because I don't flirt like Ino or flaunt my figure? Naruto sighed, Hina, I don't know how to explain it that well. When I feel closest to you, you feel like family. I want to protect you, love you and see you grow up into a happy and beautiful woman just like my sisters. Kami, this was a terribly awkward conversation to have in an alley. Hinata began to whimper again, and her resolve was failing her. In a moment of desperation, she leaned up and pressed her lips against Naruto's, catching him completely by surprise. Hinata used the kiss to try to convey her feelings, but it was her first kiss, and she was supremely inexperienced. Nevertheless, Naruto felt her love and decided to give her the kiss she desired. Maybe after feeling the lack of a true connection, she would understand. A blushing Hinata pulled back after 30 seconds and locked eyes with Naruto. Do you still see me as a sister first? She asked with a wavery voice and flitting eyes. Naruto smiled sadly at her. Yes. That was a great kiss and I wish I felt the spark, but for me it is familial love. I don't want to see you cry over an idiot like me, I am not worth your precious tears. My only hope is that you can come to love me in a similar way, Hinaheim. Just because my feelings are not romantic doesn't make me love you any less. Hinata broke eye contact and sunk her chin to her chest. F fine, Ruto. I, I will detry. Naruto placed a kiss on her forehead and walked her back to the Hyuga compound. For the next month, he went out of his way to show Hinata that he would still be in her life, even if he wasn't her boyfriend. When Hinata spoke about it with Yashi, the usually stoic man enveloped his daughter in a hug. While he could understand where Naruto was coming from, 
it didn't stop the paternal instincts from flaring up. The next few interactions between Naruto and Hyashi had a healthy amount of killing intent laced into every word. A fact that Naruto respected and eventually Hyashi treated the Senju boy with a begrudging respect since his actions were honorable. Despite the drama with Hinata, Naruto committed himself to the date with Ino. While she was still too young for him to want anything sexual, the spark he felt with Ino was undeniable. She made him feel like a kid again and the weight of the war disappeared in her absence. Since she knew about his connection to nature, they spent time in the shop, forests and parks enjoying a mutual interest. However, today was different because it had the date label slapped on it. Ino was in the process of turning her bedroom inside out looking for a cute outfit to wear that would blow Naruto away. She had enlisted the help of her stepmother, then ignored all of the advice her stepmother gave, rampaged through her room in a futile attempt to choose an outfit then called her stepmother back in. While Lena was amused by the spectacle, she sat Ino down and offered some good motherly advice. Ino, the kid already likes you. You don't have to do anything super special or over the top, just be you. With that, Ino decided on a regal purple sundress with yellow daises printed into it. She wore one of her mother's old amber necklaces that was cut into a flower shape and let down her hair. She swept her bangs over the right side of her face and thought that it was cute when she partially hid her right eye. With a spray of a floral scented perfume, Ino walked downstairs 30 minutes late. She giggled internally like a schoolgirl when she saw Naruto's breath hitch in his chest, and she got butterflies when she saw how he cleaned up. Naruto had arrived at the Yamanak house at 5.59 p.m. and was welcomed in by Inoiki while Lina hovered over his shoulder. Despite Inoiki genuinely liking the boy and being his psychiatrist, he still had to put on the stern and protective father mask. He hardened his eyes as he looked at Naruto and the bouquet of fresh-picked flowers he was carrying. Damn it! it is hard to be a hard ass when this kid is doing everything right. So, Naruto, what are your intentions with my daughter? Ino used his interrogation voice to address the boy attempting to court his daughter. To his dismay, he saw it was minimally effective. Naruto smiled at Inoiki, understanding the game at play. Well, Mr. Yamanaka, my plan is to take her out for a nice date and a picnic. If you would allow her to stay out late, I have a blanket and I planned on doing some stargazing while I get to know her better. Aw, that is so cute. Of course, you can keep her out late. Home by midnight though. As they say, nothing good happens after midnight, especially when teenagers are involved. Lena chirped excitedly. Inoiki groaned, the damned woman just gave him permission to keep his daughter out late. Look, young man, you will respect my daughter, keep your hands off my daughter and you will have her home by 11.59pm, or you will not be allowed to take her out again. Am I understood? Naruto bowed his head respectfully, Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Yamanaka. Ino saved him from further interrogation as her heels clattered down the steps of the Yamanaka house. Honestly, Naruto wasn't expecting much because this Ino was still only 13 and she had developed into the soul crushingly beautiful woman that she was in his previous life. Despite that fact, Naruto's breath still hitched, and his heart raced when he saw her in her purple sundress with a radiant and slightly self conscious smile on her face. Wow! That one word escaped his lips and Lena smirked proudly as she watched her stepdaughter come down the stairs. Since Naruto's first trip to the shop, she could tell that Ino was making a concerted effort to give her a fair shake. It had reduced a majority of the friction in the household and made way for a genuine mother-daughter relationship. Ino got to the bottom of the stairs and did a little twirl that made her platinum blonde hair and purple sundress dance. As she came to a stop, she smiled shyly and looked Naruto in the eye. So, what do you think, Ruto? Naruto blinked dumbly before regaining his composure and saying, You look absolutely beautiful, Ino. Like, wow, Ino giggled excitedly before she ran up, took his arm and waved goodbye to her parents. Once a safe distance away from her house, she kept her arm interlocked with Naruto and leaned her head on his shoulder. Naruto knew he would have to have a discussion with Ino about Tamari, but he didn't want to ruin the moment or the whole date. Flashback, three nights ago, Kazekage Mansion, Tamari's bedroom, Tamari was going through the motions of life whenever she wasn't performing her Janan duties with her brothers. Everywhere she went in Suna she saw reminders of Naruto and when everything in life slowed down, a profound sense of loneliness filled her heart. She knew that this was part of a long-distance relationship and it had always been that way between her and Naruto. Despite knowing that, Tamari found that this separation was by far the worst, especially since dreams and memories of their heated session never ended. The one thing Tamari had to look forward to almost every night was exchanging messages with Naruto. The communication scroll he gave her was a game-changing invention and they were using it to make the distance more bearable. It was a far cry from hearing his voice and feeling his touch, but it was still enough to give her goosebumps in anticipation. Just like every other day, 
she rinsed off the desert's grunge in the shower before plopping herself on the bed and getting ready to read and write. In the past month, Naruto had told her about Samui's seduction attempt turned friendship and he even told her about their kisses. Tamari couldn't help the jealousy, but Naruto had told her straight up that she was nothing compared to his desert lily. She accepted that and moved on, but it did bother her how naturally Naruto made friends of the female type. Sure, she knew that he had a bunch of guy friends too, but it was the girl she was wary of. Once everything is revealed, Naruto would be the most eligible bachelor ever in the elemental nations. Of course, Tamari knew that, and she had zero plans on relinquishing her claim. Naruto was, is and will always be hers. Naruto had told her that the only two girls that were actually close to him were Hinata and Ino. She didn't know why those two were so special and she didn't know why they were special to him even before returning to Konoha. There was still something that Naruto couldn't tell her, he wanted to, but he literally couldn't. That frightened Tamari, but if she knew one thing, she knew that Naruto was a good and genuine man. That is why the current message terrified her. Yeah, ranks suck, but I think we are close to our first C rank. Anyway, we were having a group lunch and I kind of got in a situation where I agreed to go on a date with Ino this Friday. You know that I love you and I will cancel if you don't approve, but I wanted to ask you if it is okay. I know this is incredibly awkward and probably not fair of me to ask, so, yeah. Tamari couldn't stop the trickle of tears as she rolled onto her back and looked at her ceiling. Kami, even the ceiling reminded her of Naruto because of that wooden fan he made for her. Normally, getting lost in the cycle of its blades comforted her, but now it made her pain hurt even worse. She had the right to be jealous, right? After 10 minutes, Tamari worked up the courage to respond. I guess that is okay. I know it isn't fair of me to expect you to wait around. Naruto read the message and knew that he fucked up. Kami, this situation was genuinely unfair and torturous. Naruto looked to the heavens and flipped Kami off, after which he heard an ethereal chuckle. Damned goddess and her pension for dramas and soap operas. Naruto took a deep breath and thought out his response. I am going to cancel then. I love you too much to hurt you like this and I already knew it wasn't fair to ask. Tamari, I want you to know that you are the most important person to me. Next time we see each other, I will explain everything so that you understand. You will be the last person my contract will allow me to share my secret with, but I am confident I am making the right choice. Sorry again for asking. Tamari read that and her breath hitched. The last person he could tell? Would she finally get to know all of his secrets? Did she deserve to be the only one he could tell? Kami, curse you for giving me female hormones. Ruto, if you are that serious then I want you to go on the date. Use this opportunity to make sure I am the one you want to share your full self with. No sex. If someone else takes your virginity, I will remove your kunai and smoke pellets with my fan. Naruto laughed as he read her message. It was so like Tamari. Kunai? Wouldn't it be more of a katana? Or at least a kadachi? Tamari laughed uproariously at that. This was the man that could always make her feel like everything will be alright. Fair enough. If you sheath your katana in anything but me, there will be repercussions. Naruto gulped before writing. Are you sure you are ready for that? Tamari blushed furiously, but the time apart confirmed her feelings. Yes. What are you wearing right now? I just got out of the shower, so your tank top and an emerald thong. How hard are you right now? Um, let's just say my katana could pierce the feared diamond armor of Iwa at the moment. Giggle. Lol, Ruto. I miss you. I miss you too, Mari. When I get the Hiraishin down, I am going to stay with you every night. Oh, is that so? Then why do you need a date with Flower Girl? Face palm. You will know next I see your beautiful face and taste your luscious lips. Nice recovery. Blush. Which lips? Falls off the bed in surprise. Both the conversation turned into more of a light core sexting session, and we will let the lovers have their privacy. End of flashback, instead of losing himself in thoughts of Tamari. He enjoyed Ino's warmth and close proximity as the blonde couple turned heads while walking down the street. Naruto took Ino to an upscale sushi restaurant, since sushi was Ino's favorite food. She always said that it was super tasty and low-calorie, even after she broke herself from that wretched diet. Naruto enjoyed the jealous stares as opposed to the hateful glares and he maintained a positive mood during the walk to the restaurant. Naruto broke out all the stops, making sure to pull out Ino's chair, refill her water, let her order first, let her do most of the talking while actually listening, asking insightful and probing questions when appropriate. He sat with a smile on his face as Ino blabbered on about her team and the struggles of ranks and the flower shop. It was nice getting one-on-one -on -one time with her as opposed to the usual group environment. So, Ruto, what do you think about the current situation with the rookie teams? Ino asked. 
Naruto shrugged, I like it a lot. It is awesome to train with everyone every day. It is much better than being stuck with the same three people and isolating yourself from everyone else. Ino frowned, yeah, Sakura is having a hard time. She says her sensei doesn't teach her anything and is always late. Plus, Kiba is a horny mood and Sasuke still won't give her the time of day. Naruto frowned thinking about Team 7, yeah, well if she wants to join our workouts you are free to invite her but warn her that she will need to use her inside voice. As for Team 7, they have refused to join us. Probably because Kakashi is too lazy while Sasuke and Kiba are too proud to ask for help. Ino twirled her straw in her water. Ruto, do you think Sasuke will ever come around? No. Ino raised an eyebrow at his quick and prompt response. Care to explain? Naruto lightened his tone up. No, I don't really want to talk about Sasuke when we are alone together. I would much rather get to know more about you. What you want to know? Ino asked in a flirtatious tone while fluttering her eyebrows. Naruto tapped his chin as he thought out his question. If you could change one thing about me, what would it be? Ino smiled brilliantly. Okay, but after I answer, you have to answer. Naruto nods. Okay, well, hmm, I would say I wish you were only mine. I am not stupid, I see how girls flock around you and you told me about that Tamari girl from Suna. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. Okay, okay. You can't blame a guy for trying to find his soulmate. Hmm, what would I change about Ino Yamanaka? Is nothing an acceptable answer? No. Ino's pouty face made Naruto laugh. Okay, fine. Hmm, maybe I would want her to have more self-confidence. I would want her to know and realize how truly amazing she is rather than rely on the insignificant views of others. Naruto answered while maintaining eye contact with Ino. An embarrassed smile fixed itself on Ino's face. You, you really think I am that amazing? I don't think, I know. You are a catch, Ino Yamanaka, and anybody who says otherwise is a damn fool. I will bet a million dollars that you grow up to be the sexiest Kunoichi in Konoha to boot. That being said, it is your inner beauty that draws me to you. Ino was blushing furiously, and her mind was racing a million miles an hour. She barely processed that Naruto grabbed the check and paid for their meal. Before she knew it, she was hitched to Naruto's arm again and they were walking toward the clan compounds. Um, Ruto, it isn't even dark yet. You don't have to take me home. She grabbed onto his arm and snuggled even closer, as if that action would make sure he couldn't drop her off at the Yamanaka compound. Oh, we aren't going to your house. I wanted to show you what I have been working on. Naruto replied casually. But, Ruto, the Senju compound is in the opposite direction? Who said anything about the Senju compound? Ino just shut up and enjoyed the walk, she especially enjoyed the jealous glances from the clan girls that were hanging out around the clan district. Eventually, the night came and streetlights flickered on and Ino realized that they were almost directly below the Hokage monument on. The edge of the clan district. Naruto was walking up to an empty plot of land and Ino was genuinely confused. Then, a gate appeared, and Naruto walked her through the gate into a truly beautiful world. Inside the Namikaze compound was Michelangelo's depiction of the Garden of Eden. They were trees and greenery everywhere, with lush fruits and flowers of all sizes, shapes and colors. The path through the compound was clear of nature's obstructions, but the vibrant energy of nature filled the jungle that greeted Ino once she passed through the gates. Ino's head spun in every direction as she soaked in the beauty of nature all around her. Her mind barely realizing and marking plants that she had never seen before. What, what is this, Ruto? She gasped in amazement. Naruto pulled her in and twirled her around. This is my mother and father's compound. This is where I do my senjutsu and makuten training. I built this garden with you in mind, Ino, because every time I am in nature it reminds me of you. Ino felt like melting into Naruto, she was pleased by his compliments and simultaneously embarrassed half to death. T thank why you, Aruto. It, it is amazing. Naruto led Ino through the path of beautiful plants, bushes and trees and took her to a small pond with a picnic blanket laid out. He sat her down and unsealed a bottle of wine, two glasses and a box of chocolates. Ino was overwhelmed by how much thought Naruto put into the evening and that idea made her flush even more. Before Naruto could open the bottle of wine, Ino lunged over and crashed her lips into his. Naruto saw the move coming and pushed the wine and glasses out of the way. He accepted her clumsy advance and slowly took control of the kiss. With a lick and nibble to her bottom lip, Ino opened her mouth and gasped when Naruto's tongue sensually entered and stirred her tongue into action. The delicate and passionate dance of tongues began as the young blondes attempted to meld their bodies into one. Ino transitioned from a lean and started straddling Naruto, 
who laid back down and guided the makeout session to a more comfortable position. As the young couple made out, flickers of green light filled the clearing and the garden seemed to light up in a positive energy. The trees seemed to hum in delight while the insects created a symphony of croaks and flapping wings celebrating the union of their master. The overwhelming natural energy caused the flowers to bloom more vibrantly and some of the petals created a myriad of incandescent lights. Eno was in heaven as her first ever date and first ever makeout session were the definition of perfect. Her whole body felt hot, yet completely content. Her passion overcame rational thinking as the kissing intensified and the delicate dance became more of a salsa. The fight for control of the embrace, the game of getting your lover to moan more, the start of roaming hands. Her whole body was in a state of contented ecstasy and before she knew it her sundress was slid up and Naruto's firm hands were kneading her soft and supple butt cheeks. Ino moaned into Naruto's mouth, and she slapped him on a firm set of pecs as their kiss was disrupted by Naruto's smirk. Naruto took advantage of the lapse in the kiss to reverse position and ended with his right leg tucked in between Ino's legs. While his right hand roamed up her dress and began caressing her torso, his left hand pinned her hands above her head. Ino struggled internally as she forced herself to accept her domination and eventually enjoyed the sense of powerlessness as Naruto escalated the makeout session. Naruto was glad that all of his alter egos were out tonight. They usually made sure that they had the weekends to themselves, but Naruto thought that taking things this far would be super awkward with Hikari or Rias or any of them watching on. He returned his attention to Ino as her moans demanded his constant affections. He trailed his fingers just below Ino's bra line, clearly asking for permission to proceed. As Naruto waited for her response, he set this as the self-enforced limit that he wouldn't pass. Ino felt Naruto's finger dancing around her breasts, and she freed one of her hands and forced Naruto's right hand under her bra and urged him forward. Ino used her newly freed hand to pull Naruto deeper into the kiss, completely enthralled in the act of surrendering herself to this incredible man. Ino's body froze, and she felt a pressure building up as Naruto attended to her right nipple. Naruto freed her other hand and began applying dual stimulation to her nipples while nibbling on her collar bone. Naruto had a crazy idea pop into his head, and he decided to trust his instincts. It was how he always operated on the battlefield, after all. Naruto toned down his dense chakra and began swirling it around Ino's perky nipples through his fingertips. He felt her body shudder and considered upping the amount of chakra he was feeding into her, which he did slowly. Ino's body began convulsing and Naruto took great enjoyment watching her eyes roll up into the back of her head as she came to her first real orgasm. Naruto's genes were slick with her womanly juices, and he relented on his ministrations to let the young blonde come back to her senses. As Ino cracked her eyes opened and her brain came down from the high of overstimulation she felt the soft, tender kisses and nibble coming up from her collarbone and trailing up her neck back to her lips. Ino kissed him greedily and pulled his head down to her. She began working at his belt, but Naruto's calloused hands halted her efforts. Ino, my flower princess, let's stop here. I do not wish for our relationship to be about sex. I value you and us too much to let it be simply physical. Naruto placed a soft, tender kiss on Ino's lips to let her respond. Oh oh okay, Ruto. I love you. Her disappointment turned to excitement as she saw Naruto smile. Naruto placed a tender kiss on her nose, I love you too, Ino. Naruto knew what he was doing was probably wrong, but it felt so right. He was confident Tamari would understand once he shared the memories with her, which left him with trying to figure out how to tell Ino. He didn't want to be cliche and claim it was because he would be in the CRA. That would be an absolute last resort and he would commit the time between now and the Chunin exams to figure it out. Naruto picked Ino up off of the picnic blanket and Ino gasped as she saw the plants glowing with luminescent light. The garden in the Namikaze compound looked like something out of Avatar as the compound literally hummed with life energy. Naruto wiped some of the dirt off of Ino's dress and let her recompose herself. He shifted his throbbing erection to prevent it from pitching a tent and then pulled Ino into him for another passionate kiss. He then walked her out of the compound and back to her house. Ino was on cloud 9 as she walked through Konoha streets arm in arm with Naruto. The smile on her face would have threatened to split her face if she didn't feel so content. She removed her head from Naruto's shoulder and jumped on his back. She relished the feeling of Naruto's toned body and his arms snaking under her legs. She leaned her head on his shoulder and enjoyed the state of quiet contentment as the sounds of Naruto's shoes echoed across the empty streets of Konoha. Naruto arrived at the door of the Yamanaka household at 11.55pm and after checking his watch Naruto decided to make the most out of his last five minutes. As Naruto's lips touched Ino's, the door flew open, and a respectable amount of key flooded the doorstep. Naruto didn't even look the slightest bit apologetic as he met Inoiki's fiery gaze. Inside young lady, Inoiki said in a firm tone, 
despite the apologetic look that Lena was shooting the couple over Inoki's shoulder. Oh, can it daddy? Ino leaned up on her tippy toes and planted a passionate kiss on Naruto before winking at him and sauntering into the house. Inoki saw the shit-eating grin on Naruto's face and scowled. Look here, young man, that there is my daughter. She is my princess, and you will treat he as such. Naruto nodded and smiled disarmingly at the irate man. I know, she is my princess too. That took the fire out of Inoki's sails, but he still maintained his stern look. Cough, well, good. I am glad we came to that understanding. Yup, so I am sure we will be seeing each other more often. On my mother, I swear that I will treat your daughter like the princess she is. I am sure you know that as a near 16, the council is going to try to put me under the control of their greedy paws. When the time comes, I hope I have your support. Inoiki's scowl deepened as he understood Naruto's meaning and knew that he was 100% correct. If my daughter wishes to continue things with you, you will have my support. Thanks, Mr. Yamanaka. See you next week for my session? Inoiki blanked, was he just talked down in less than a minute by a teenager? Cough, sure, I will see you then. It will be a solo session without your alters. How is the memory separation going? I am still having lucid dreams, but nothing like direct transfer. Every dream shows them in heightened emotional states, like when Rias is hooking up with Anko or Hikari is playing with her friends. I am trying to respect their privacy, but I think my subconscious is saying that I cannot completely separate from them, Naruto said, clearly deep in thought. Inoiki, in professional mode, nodded along. I think you are right. We will continue to keep a close eye on it. Continue the resting periods for each of them and make sure to stay on top of your meditation. Any new personalities emerging? Nope. Well, it's late and we can start from there next week. Thanks, daddy. Before Inoiki could retaliate, Naruto used Shunshine to disappear from sight. Inoiki growled and slammed the door closed behind him. Damn brat. He saw Lina and Ino talking excitedly about the date and a pleasant smile worked its way onto his face. He was about to sit down on the couch and join the conversation when both blondes screeched at him and claimed that this was girl talk. With a final scowl, Inoiki retired to his room for the night. A request from Wave, Team 8 was finished with their morning workouts, and they were making their way to the Hokage Tower. Kurenai was attached to Team 10 for the week and it was clear to the Jinan that Itachi missed the soothing presence of the red-eyed woman. Naruto, Hinata and Shino already had multiple conversations and planning sessions on how to set the two up. It boiled down to Itachi being too reserved and Kurenai being too fixed on traditional gender roles, which was strange since she was about female empowerment. The group guessed that she was submissive when it came to relationships. Before Team 8 entered Hokage Tower, an Anbu appeared in front of the group and bowed his head to Itachi. What is it for? Itachi asked calmly. Team 8 needs to report to the Hokage. An urgent mission request came in from Wave with a request for Blondie there. Bohr reported to his old captain. Message received, we will be there momentarily. Itachi replied and hurried his team into the Hokage Tower. As they entered the room, Hiruzen smiled, good morning, team 8, just the team I was looking for. Naruto, a request from Wave came in for you and your mother, but your mother said you should be able to handle it. Gotcha, old man. What's going on in Wave? Naruto responded casually. Naruto. You will show respect to your Hokage, Iruka yelled from the corner of the room. Naruto turned his head and glanced dispassionately at Iruka. Oh, hi, Iruka. My relationship with the old monkey is my own. Please let him explain why we are here. Naruto's dry tone and complete lack of the sensei honorific shut Iruka up. Naruto is right, Iruka. That is what he has always called me, and I rather enjoy it. Back to the mission, Kaisa sent us a request for assistance to deal with bandits and some missing nin. That makes this a B-rank mission, and I wouldn't typically give it to a fresh Janon squad. If you would prefer a Jonin team, I could set that up. No need for that. We have Itachi sensei, and our team is not your standard Janon team. Plus, that is my home, and we will have basic shinobi support from the first-gen graduates. Itachi looked interested at this, Naruto, Wave doesn't have its own shinobi, Naruto laughed at that while Hinata and Shino looked on confused. Well, we seen just are the protectorate of Wave. We funded a shinobi academy and trained up some teenagers and got the children started. Those kids should have graduated earlier this year. The Hokage adopted a firm look on his face and used his firmest tone. Why did you not inform me that you created another shinobi village? Naruto looked back at the Hokage blankly. It is not a hidden village. It is a security force that has shinobi training. Maybe your intel is slacking without the evil old goat hiding in the shadows. Hiruzen growled, 
Don't play word games with me Naruto Senju. Naruto shrugged, last I checked they allied themselves with the leaf, thanks to a Senju. If you have a problem, take it up with Tsunade. Can we get back to the mission? Are you going to send us or what? Itachi bonked Naruto on his head for his rudeness. I understand your hesitation, so why not send us with another Janan team? Surely, I and another Jonin sensei would be more than enough to deal with anything. Hiruzen nodded at this and inspected the Janan roster. Okay, Team 7 is free and they have been bothering me about getting a C-rank mission. The Hokage smiled and looked at Itachi. I would give you a chance to go on another mission with your senpai as well, Itachi. Naruto and Hinata groaned while Shino buzzed with agitation. I think we would rather go alone, Lord Hokage, Hinata said on behalf of her team. Hiruzen cocked an eyebrow at the young Hyuga, care to explain? Of all the rookie teams, Team 7 has refused every attempt we have made to reach out. Not to mention the Uchiha is a complete ass and Kiba is a horn dog while Sakura is pretty useless. Hinata broke it down in a bland tone. Her confidence and the way she spoke surprised everyone, including Naruto. Well then, this will be a good opportunity for them to bond with their peers. Thank you for volunteering to assist them, young Hyuga. Hiruzen replied cheerily before placing his pipe in his mouth and waving the team out. Okay team, I will find Kakashi. Be at the front gate, fully loaded, in two hours. Prepare for a two-week or month-long mission. Itachi ordered his Janan. Two hours later, Team 8 was waiting alongside Team 7 for their Jonin instructors to show up. Sasuke was scowling at Naruto with his arms crossed leaning against the gate. Naruto paid him no mind and continued talking with his team, who were rapidly worming the way into his heart. You know, Kit, I have come to like these too. That bug boy is most interesting. I was mad that you were feeding him my chakra at first, but it has had amusing results, Kurama said through the mind link. Yeah, that's good to hear Q. Sorry I asked you to tag along for this mission everyone, Naruto said through the open channel. Rias groaned, yeah, well it's not like we can be apart from you for that long. Plus, it will be good to see our friends back in wave. Yosuke, are you going to rekindle things with Himawari? She is a great lady, but I can't exactly have a long-term relationship with her when we are living in Konoha. Yosuke answered. Sorry about that, Suke. I am still trying to find a way to push you guys into blood clones without completely destroying my psyche. Naruto's mental tone was pitiful. No need to apologize, Naruto. You have already done more for each of us than we could ever ask for. Yosuke answered. Yeah, big brother, at least you didn't just try to absorb us like you did with Yami. I have my friends because of you. Hikari's cheery voice filled his mind and brought a smile to his face. Yami is still here, Hikari. He is just a part of me, and I realized a long time ago that I needed him. I need each of you just as much, but by the time my soul healed you were each unique and separate. It just didn't feel right to take that from you. Naruto addressed his altars in a manner that brought a true grin from the kitsune. That is why you are worthy of being my container, Naruto. I am proud of the man you have become, Kurama said with fake sobs mixed in. At that point, Kakashi and Itachi appeared in front of the group and drew Naruto's attention. They inspected their Janan's loadouts and that was when Sasuke's condescending tone drew teammates' attention. Sensei, why are you checking our loadouts when those losers don't even have their packs? Sasuke sneered, which drew laughs from Kiba and Sakura. Sealing scrolls, duck butt. Naruto simply replied as his team each held up scrolls. And all of our combat supplies are in these bracelets. So, anything else to say, duck butt? Pinky and dog breath? This earned growls from Team 7 and they each turned their heads up at Team 8. Itachi bonked Naruto on the head and Kakashi cast an apologetic look over at Team 8. They moved out and had to let Sakura set the pace since she was the least physically fit. It was so slow that Team 8 each upgraded their resistance seals to at least get something out of the journey. Due to the slow pace, they were forced to camp out that night, which only served to escalate tension. Naruto set up and secured his tent, along with the tents of his teammates. He also set up a barrier around the camp to ensure that no unwelcome visitors entered their camp at night. They still had a watch rotation, but this night was the first night that Rias got up to something sneaky in years. When Naruto fell into REM sleep, Rias took control of his body and snuck out of the tent. She snuck up on Sakura, who was on watch, and cast a pleasurable genjutsu on her, Illusion Arts Dash Land of Dreams. Sakura fell into a wet dream in her position on the tree, moaning pleasurably and muttering Sasuke's name. Rias took out a permanent marker and got to work. Once she was done with Pinky, she infiltrated Kiba's and Sasuke's tent. After 30 minutes in control of Naruto's body, and a quick masturbation session to prank her original, Rias went back to sleep and released her control. 
The Jinan teams woke up and were eating breakfast. Team 7 was still half asleep and failed to notice the markings on their teammates' faces as they dug into eggs and bacon prepared by Naruto's clone. They failed to notice the stifled laughter of Kakashi and Itachi, or the full-blown giggle fits of Team 8. Finally, after breakfast and a chance to wake up, Sakura blushed and snuck a look at her Sasuke-kun. Sasuke. What's on your face? Who did this? Sakura darted over to more closely inspect her crush's face. She saw a duck butt written on his forehead with a handlebar mustache that ended with arrows pointing to his hair. Sasuke looked incredulously at Sakura and noticed the marking on her face. Pinky was written across her billboard brow, a penis with the Uchiha clan emblem on the ball sack touched the corner of her mouth and on the other side was a chibi Sasuke. What's on your face, Sakura? Kiba looked up and broke out laughing. That was until he noticed the raucous laughter from Team 8 and saw Naruto pointing at him. Kiba took a kunai out of his pouch and inspected his own face as Akamaru whimpered. He saw dog breath scribbled on his forehead as a miniature dog was on the top left corner of his forehead with its leg raised. Little water drops were all over his face as they spread out from the stream that led to Kiba's mouth. Naruto was rolling on the ground laughing and praising Rias within his mind. It was truly genius and a hilarious prank, which he genuinely appreciated. Everyone within his head, Kami that sounded crazy just thinking it, was filling the mind link with their own laughter. Hinata had her back turned to the group, failing to suppress the laughter threatening to overtake her. Shino was audibly laughing, and his bugs were jittering rhythmically. Kakashi had excused himself from the campsite because he didn't want to further humiliate his own team, but Itachi had no such reservations. He walked over to Sasuke and poked him in the forehead with two fingers. You should always keep your guard up, little brother. Itachi chided him, which was the last straw for Sasuke. Sasuke roared out in anger and charged at Naruto. Naruto threw a hand to his team to tell them he had it handled. Itachi respected the call as well and watched his brother get thoroughly handled while sighing in dismay. Sasuke crossed the campsite at Janan speeds and leapt into the air before spinning and bringing his right leg down into an axe kick. Naruto, who had long since stopped rolling on the ground in laughter, rolled out of the kick's path and used the momentum to kip up and land on his feet. Sasuke's foot impacted the ground and left small, spider web cracks at the point of impact. Sasuke looked up at Naruto and scowled deeply. You will no longer disrespect the Uchiha clan, send you scum. You will fall under the might of the Uchiha, Sasuke roared before dashing at Naruto again. Itachi and Kakashi grabbed Kiba and Sakura respectively to stop them from entering the fight. The two cast betrayed looks at Akakashi, who simply I smiled and shrugged. Sasuke launched into a flurry of blows, making Naruto actually use his hands this time to deflect the flurry. The Uchiha had improved moderately and with the resistance seals activated, Naruto actually needed to fight the raven-haired boy. Naruto began threading counter-attacks into the taijutsu battle and each one clearly affected Sasuke in a significant way. The battle was clearly one-sided, but Sasuke's rage kept urging him on. As Sasuke's frustration grew and his body couldn't keep up with the blurring assault of the Senju's fists, he subconsciously began channeling chakra to his eyes. As the itch grew and another blow impacted on Sasuke's abdomen, he hunched over in pain and the world took on a different tone. The spittle dribbling from his mouth seemed to fall to the earth slower and Sasuke saw the world in more detail than ever before. As Sasuke rose back to his full height, he glared at Naruto who looked at him in an amused fashion. Congrats, duck butt, you finally unlocked your eyes. Of course, it was only five or so years after your brother, but congrats nonetheless. Sasuke didn't know whether to jump in joy or tear this impudent senju apart limb by limb. A hand on his shoulder made the decision for him. He turned and looked into the firm, proud and compassionate eyes of his brother. That is enough, little brother. It was a harmless prank, and it wasn't actually Naruto. Plus, he helped you unlock your eyes. Let it go, we need to get moving, Itachi said in a calm but firm voice. Sasuke TSK'd before turning his back on Naruto. You are lucky my brother is here, Senju. Next time we fight, I will end you. With these eyes, you can no longer defeat me. Naruto, sickened by the cocky and condescending tone, decided he couldn't let him have the last word. Oh, really? Well, last I checked Hashirama never lost to Madara and spared his life twice on the battlefield. I am sure I can give you many other examples, but you aren't worth the words. Have fun with the marker, if I know the prankster, it will be there for 24 hours. Naruto returned to Team 8, sniggering in delight as Rias confirmed his suspicions. The conversation in his head was raucous and Naruto felt whole for the first time in a while. Hinata had gotten her giggles under control and Shino's hive seemed to have calmed down. 
Team 7 went to a nearby river and attempted to scrub the marker off their faces, unfortunately it would prove ineffective in the face of chakra reinforced ink that Rias preferred. After scrubbing their faces raw with no effect, Team 7 tried demanding that Naruto undo whatever he did. He told them they were stuck like that for 24 hours from time of application, which drew groans from Kiba and Sakura and a deep scowl from Sasuke. Itachi and Kakashi forced them to move out toward the new land bridge that linked Wave to the Land of Fire. The journey was awkward, and it was clear that the tension from the prank didn't help bring the two teams closer. Before they arrived at the bridge, a group of bandits dressed like pirates appeared in front of the Janan teams. At the front of the group were two ninjas that Itachi and Kakashi recognized from the bingo book. The Demon Brothers were leading a group of 20 pirates, and they addressed the group. The Land of Waves is closed for business. Turn around, Konoha ninjas, or, PSH. Gozu broke out in a fit of laughter, pointing his gauntlet at Team 7, whose faces were still covered in permanent marker. Mezu looked over and began laughing uproariously, followed by the rest of the pirates. Naruto sighed, he thought he changed this part of the timeline. Kami, what the fuck were these two worthless farts doing here? Oi! Gozu, Mezu, why the fuck aren't you two back in Kiri? With all the money I sent that red-headed beauty she should have wrapped things up by now. Naruto got their attention. Mezu cocked an eyebrow, who the hell are you, Gaki? And what the fuck are you talking about? Naruto buried his head in his hands, deeply saddened by the implications of the presence of these two. Look here, dumbass. Last I checked, Mei Terumi was finishing up the rebellion. She should be the god I'm Mizukage by now. Since y'all are pretending to be pirates, I call for a parlay between Team 8 and your leader, who I am assuming is Zabuza Momochi. Everyone looked incredulously at the blonde boy calling for a parlay. Of course, they were pirates, and they must respect the tradition, but how in Kami's name did he know about Zabuza? Kakashi and Itachi each scrutinized Naruto wondering why and how the boy would be connected to a foreign nation that had been locked in a civil war for the past decade. Gozu stepped forward and growled. How did you know our leader was Zabuza? How do you know so much about Kiri? Naruto shrugged, the land of waves is under the protection of the Senju, i.e. me and Tsunade Senju. During our stay here, we saved refugees and slaves from Kiri and gave them a home. I have been communicating with Mei for the last three years and using profits from my family business to send her funds and supplies. Now, I order you to stand down and honor the tradition of parlay. Gozu looked to Mezu and had a whispering conversation. The group of pirates stood in an awkward silence, not knowing what to do and grumbling about not being able to kill a bunch of brats. Meanwhile, Kakashi and Itachi were having a conversation between themselves, wondering exactly how they should move forward. We will need to go consult our leader. You can't get through the bridge anyway, it is blocked by a barrier. You will wait here, Gozu said. No, we will not. I made those barriers and as I stated, this land is under my protection. I will not be waiting for Zabuza's lazy ass because we have been traveling for the last day and a half. I will meet Zabuza here with three of my companions tomorrow at noon. That means he can bring you two knuckleheads, Ice Girl and himself. If he doesn't feel like listening, inform him that May will melt his balls off if he raises another finger to my people. The Demon Brothers made a nod with their head and the pirate group cleared the way for the two teams. It was clear that the brat knew too much, and they doubted they could handle him and two Jonin instructors. Plus, they knew pirates, even well-trained ones, were nothing in the face of two Jonin. Teams 7 and 8 just cast strange looks at Naruto before walking cautiously past the group of pirates and onto the bridge. Halfway onto the bridge, there was a guard station and Naruto saw a group of defenders sitting behind the barrier looking frazzled and nervous. When they saw the two Konoha teams, their shoulders relaxed, and smiles flashed upon their faces. Then Naruto emerged from behind Itachi and the guards cheered. Lord Senju, it is great to have you back. Lord Senju, thank you for responding to our call. Lord Naruto, thank you for protecting our people. Each exclamation made Sasuke drown in jealousy and the other Janan look at him in confusion. Naruto returned the greetings and made sure that the barriers would continue to hold. It wasn't this barrier he was worried about, but the emergency barrier seal array centered out of the police headquarters. If his guess was right, the seal had been active for days and would be running low on chakra. Thanks guys, and enough with the lord crap, I am just Naruto. I will be heading to police HQ to talk with Kaisa, hang in there. The pirates should leave you be until tomorrow, but don't let your guard down, Naruto said abashedly. Yes, Lord Senju. The guards replied in unison, with smirks on their faces. Team 7 and Team 8 made their way to the end of the long bridge. Sasuke finally had enough when he saw the plaque at the end of the bridge. 
The Great Senju Bridge, thank you to the Senju clan for guiding Wave into an era of prosperity. We will always remember and honor your contributions. What the fuck, Senju? Why the fuck is the bridge named after your family? Sasuke growled, which made others look at him with confused looks. Naruto sighed, really not wanting to deal with this bullshit. Look, Sasuke, when I fled Konoha and found Tsunade, we ended up settling down here. Let's just say we helped the place out and they were grateful. Now, shut up and follow me. Sasuke was about to retort, but it was shut down by Itachi and Kakashi. As the group walked through the town, literally everyone greeted Naruto and groups formed up around him. He drew so much attention that very few villagers even noticed the markings on Team 7's faces. Naruto greeted the crowds graciously as the tension that hung over the village immediately dissipated in his presence. It took 15 minutes after leaving the bridge for Team 7 to make it to the police HQ. Upon entering the HQ, Itachi let Naruto take point since it was clear that this was his home and his people. Naruto walked confidently to the main office of the building, completely unobstructed by the officers that were holding down the fort. He pushed open the door and allowed Itachi and Kakashi to follow him in. The sensei told their other Janan to wait outside. Kaisa looked up from his desk and immediately broke out into a smile. Naruto, it is great to see you again, bud. We have some catching up to do, but why don't you have a seat so we can get you brought up to speed? The trio sat down, with Naruto in the head position. It is good to see you too, Uncle Kai. So, what's the damage? How is the emergency seal holding up? Naruto asked. Kaisa sighed, the seal is running low. Each of our shinobi and trainees have been meditating and rotating while powering the seal, but without your power supply they are at their limit. As far as damage, there were no lives lost in the initial raid but Gen 1 is still hospitalized. They were able to raid some warehouses by the docks and we lost a bit, but nothing too crazy. When they took their loot to the ship, we activated the barrier. Since then, they have set an embargo around our island ports and at the bridge. Kakashi whistled and Itachi asked a couple questions. Thank you for the summary, Officer Kaisa. I am Itachi, Naruto's Jonin sensei and this is Hitake Kakashi, sensei of Team 7. Do you know their numbers or projected strength? Kaisa shook his head in the negative. No, they used a mist laced with chakra to maintain the element of surprise and raid the warehouse. When the 10 members of Gen 1 confronted them, a single man with a massive sword nearly killed them all. Since then, we have confirmed four ships around the island. Naruto scowled before adding in his two cents. Look, these pirates are not what I am worried about. It is Momochi Zabuza, Demon of the Bloody Mist and his three companions. One is an ice bloodline wielder and the other two are the Demon Brothers. Really not that much of a threat, but definitely too much for you to handle, Uncle Kai. Is your family alright? Before Kaisa could answer, Kakashi spoke in a disappointed tone. Naruto, I know you are strong, but you are nowhere near Zabuza's level. He is an elite jonin. Naruto looked to Itachi for support, which made the Uchiha sigh, Kakashi, trust Naruto. He can handle Zabuza if it comes to it. Kakashi looked incredulously at Naruto. He can what? Bullshit. Damn, I thought big brother figures were supposed to have faith in their little brothers. Look, Kakashi, I won't take him in a straight Kenjutsu fight. I have so many tricks up my sleeve that I guarantee you I will win. First and foremost because he will underestimate me like you just did, Naruto said, attempting to keep his tone even. Um, Ruto, why are you talking like you will be the one fighting Zabuza? Kaisa asked, clearly missing something. Because, rather than kill 20 or more people, I called for a parlay. It is likely Zabuza doesn't know the war is ending or the role the Senju and Wave have played in ending it. He went missing Nin six years ago and I doubt he is able to stay in the loop. I am hoping that I don't even have to fight the guy. Naruto answered. And you think he will honor a parlay? York asked, appearing out of the corner of Kaisa's office. Haha, York, who knew you would be a natural at the chameleon jutsu. I was wondering when you were going to show yourself. Yes, he will honor it. I already demonstrated that I know what tricks he was up to and who he was with. Damn it, brat. I can never hide from you. Anyway, can I go with you? York asked. Naruto looked to Itachi and Kakashi, but it was Kakashi that answered. No, while Naruto told us you were trained, we have not worked with you. At the very least we will be meeting with one of the seven swordsmen and three chunin level shinobi. Naruto shot an apologetic look at York. Look, York, Shizun would skin me alive if I brought you with and you died. You are paying for our services, so let me deal with this. York protested the decision. If she would skin you alive, what would she do to me if you were hurt? When have you ever been able to beat me in a spar? 
Naruto countered. Kaisa laughed and slapped York on the back. He has got you there. We didn't learn to access chakra until we were already adults. We have no place in a meeting of such monsters. Itachi was interested by this, Naruto, your academy taught adults? It is very challenging to awaken an adult's chakra. Not when your grandmother is the slug Sanin, Tsunade Senju, the legendary sucker and ultimate medic, Naruto laughed as he rattled off his mama's titles. A look of understanding found its way onto Itachi's and Kakashi's faces. Kaisa and York agreed to let Naruto handle the meeting and told him that they would bring dinner over to the Senju compound that evening. Naruto left the HQ with Team 7 and 8 in tow and guided them to the Senju villa. The teams marveled at the beautiful villa that was being kept clean by a couple of the women that Naruto saved from Gato. Sasuke fumed in jealousy at the popularity and hero worship of the Senju clan on this whole damned island. He saw Senju crests flying over many stores in the town and now he sees the upscale villa that they owned outside of Konoha. It agitated his inferiority complex and put him into a truly foul mood. Despite the dark cloud hovering over Sasuke, the other Janan were enjoying the beauty of the Senju Villa. Kiba and Akamaru were working out some of their pent-up energy by running through the gardens and training grounds. Hinata was taking her time appreciating the garden and natural beauty of the island. Shino was looking for bugs in the garden and Sakura was hovering over Sasuke in an attempt to comfort him. Itachi, Kakashi and Naruto were discussing a game plan for the parlay session and coming up with contingency plans. Since Naruto was the one to call for parlay, and he was the elected representative of WAVE, he would be the one heading negotiations. They were sure this would get a reaction out of Zabuza, but Naruto assured them that he could handle it. Their meeting was cut short by the arrival of Kaisa, Tsunami, York, Himawari, and Yosuke, who Naruto had let out of the seal to spend time with his love interest. While the Konoha teams enjoyed a nice dinner at the Senju Villa, two demon brothers walked nervously onto their leader's ship. In the captain's quarters, a massive man was lounging with his feet up on the desk and playing with a massive sword. There was a ninja in a traditional Kiri Hunter mask standing at his right side and she tensed when the demon brothers entered the quarters. Zabuza scowled beneath the bandages that covered his face. What do you two want? Gozu stepped forward and bowed to Zabuza. Zabuza, we have come to inform you that two teams of Konoha Janan have entered wave. When we attempted to stop them, a Janan named Naruto Senju claimed that this land was under the protection of the Senju. He also claimed that Mei Terumi and the rebels have won the rebellion and that he has been providing aid to the Kiri rebels for the last three years. He called for a parlay. Zabuza grabbed his sword with one hand and leveled it at Gozu's neck before scowling deeply. And you just let them pass? Are you a complete idiot? Mezu stepped to his brother's defense. He called for parlay. It is clear that he knows our ways and we couldn't refute his claims. Plus, I got the feeling that he could have dealt with us easily, not to mention the two Jonin. Haku placed a calming hand on Zabuza's shoulder. Master Zabuza, I believe they did the right thing. If what they claim is true, we can return home. The only reason we resorted to piracy was to fund another attempt at a coup. If it is not needed, then we no longer need to live on scraps. Fuck it. When is this parlay? I will just deal with them then. Zabuza asked, clearly infuriated by the situation. The next day at noon, the Janan of Team 7 and 8 were waiting at the guard post on the bridge behind the barrier. Naruto had used Kurama's chakra to charge the chakra storage attached to the barrier, which was greatly appreciated by the exhausted wave shinobi. Naruto, Kakashi and Itachi decided to go to the parlay with just the three of them, to the loud protests of Sasuke. And Kiba. Kakashi left a shadow clone to keep the Janan in line, but ready to assist if worse should come to worst. Itachi, Kakashi and Naruto were waiting at the clearing in front of the bridge as a mist began to pour in from the tree line across from the bridge. Naruto didn't feel like dealing with the headache the mist would cause, so he took a deep breath and thought wind style, great breakthrough before he exhaled a mighty gust of wind that blew away the mist. The Konoha group immediately felt the surge of killing intent coming from the forest. Damn it, brat, couldn't you let me make my intro? Zabuza said while sauntering out of the wood line with his massive cleaver slung over his shoulder. While I can appreciate a flashy entrance, I don't trust you enough to let you have your mist, Momochi Zabuza, wielder of Kuba Kirabocho and master of the silent killing technique. Why don't you have your three tools join us? Yes, I can feel the ice user, Naruto stated calmly. Zabuza made a slight motion with his head and three shinobi dressed in various kiri attire appeared behind Zabuza. Zabuza stepped forward and stopped approximately 20 meters away from Naruto. What the fuck is that on your face, brat? Everyone got into a position where they could see Naruto's face clearly. His eyes were shadowed in a deep, forest green with the markings descending from each eye in a fang-like pattern. 
On the center of his forehead, markings that looked like a giant tree were prominently displayed. Itachi gasped when he saw Naruto in his sage mode for the first time, and he activated his Sharingan. There was a film of natural energy hovering around Naruto's body and the density of the energy inside his body was nowhere to be seen. The natural energy was shielding Naruto's chakra signature, as if he were protected by the Senjutsu chakra. Don't worry about it. So, Zabuza, for what reason do you attack lands protected by my clan? Naruto asked in a powerful tone that left no room for bullshitting. Zabuza looked incredulously at Kakashi and Itachi. You are letting this brat be your representative? Itachi cast an amused glance at Zabuza and Kakashi shrugged. Naruto didn't let the attention drift from him. I am Naruto Senju, heir of the Senju clan. For the last seven years, these lands have been under the protection of the Senju. I will ask you again, for what reason do you attack my lands and steal from my people? Zabuza scowled, I don't negotiate with brats that aren't even out of their diapers. Very well, by rules of parlay, as the aggrieved party, I will set the rules of our duel. The duel will be a duel to first blood. Do you accept these terms? Naruto challenged. Zabuza barked out a laugh, very well, brat. Don't go crying to mommy when I cleave you in half. Haku, will you join Itachi Uchiha is presiding over the duel, please? Naruto asked loud enough for all to hear. Haku reeled back, clearly rattled by the fact that Naruto knew who she was. H how do you know who I am? I have been in communication with Mei Terumi, who has been looking for your little group for the better part of three years. Once I beat Zabuza, I expect the pirates to vacate the oceans around Wave Country and you are to report to Mei Terumi. Zabuza, what do you wish for if you beat me? Zabuza pondered the idea, I will claim one million dollars worth of food and supplies from Wave Country. Very well, Itachi and Haku, if you please, Naruto said calmly. Kakashi looked supremely uncomfortable when he saw Itachi walking forward as if nothing was wrong with letting a Janan fight against a legendary swordsman of the mist. Before Kakashi could protest, Naruto put a calming hand on his shoulder and let some of his overflowing natural energy sink into Kakashi. Naruto gave his shoulder a gentle squeeze, winked and turned around to face Zabuza. He unsealed his mother's katana, Benihim, whose midnight black blade gleamed in the light and the bloody color red hilt promised blood to be spilt. Naruto took a ready stance with his left arm pointed toward Zabuza and his right arm bent and parallel to the ground at shoulder level. Zabuza saw the blade and gasped, that blade was legendary among swordsmen. Then he saw the stance and he suppressed a shiver that was racing down his spine. Kid, where did you get that blade? Naruto smiled menacingly at Zabuza, maybe if you beat me, I will tell you. Naruto closed his eyes and disabled all restrictive seals on his body, knowing that would be necessary to keep up with Zabuza. Zabuza smirked at the challenge, letting his bloodlust flow throughout his body, creating a demonic aura behind him. He flared his key and was marginally impressed that it had zero effect on the boy in front of him. Zabuza cast a look at Haku, demanding that the duel be started immediately. Haku glanced at Itachi, who nodded calmly with a small smile on his face. Begin. Zabuza blurred forward with the massive form of Kuba Kirabocho held in two hands to his right side, ready for a diagonal slash. Naruto waited for the incoming swing before using Benihim to parry the blow over his head as he ducked the attack. Zabuza, undeterred by the parry, launched a knee at Naruto's chest and used the momentum of his sword to swing into a spin that would allow him to move into an overhead chop. Naruto saw the knee and pivoted on his knee before spinning around Zabuza and bringing Benihim overhead to redirect the downward slash. Zabuza's cleaver screeched as the momentum of the sword put Benihim's craftsmanship to the test. The momentum of the downward slash was too great and Zabuza felt a slash on his left calf. Naruto spun into a backflip to create distance from Zabuza before landing on his feet and slashing his sword to clear the blood from the blade. Haku stepped forward in a hesitant tone and began speaking winner. Before Haku could say anything further, Zabuza flew into a rage and unleashed a flurry of slashes and swings at Naruto. Thanks to the enhanced senses granted by Sage Mode, Naruto was able to dodge and dance through Zabuza's attacks. As the rage and bloodlust clouded Zabuza's judgment, it also empowered him, increasing his natural strength and speed. Naruto's smaller body began to struggle to keep up with the increased pace of Zabuza's frenzied slashes. As Zabuza spun into another powerful spin attack, Naruto created ten shadow clones around him and ducked under the slash before phasing into the ground using Earth-style dash underground projection fish technique, which allowed him to move underground and reposition himself. As Naruto was underground, Half of his clones used their chakra imitations of Benihim to put pressure on Zabuza. Despite the clones not being as powerful as the original, five swords covered in wind chakra were a threat to a ninja of any rank. 
As Zabuza was put on the defensive for the first time in the fight, the five shadow clones began molding their chakra and weaving through seals. In unison, the clones called out, Earth-style mud flow river. Immediately, the influence of a massive amount of Naruto's chakra on the earth around the duel immediately turned into a raging river of mud that swept Zabuza and the shadow clones up in its current indiscriminately. As the tall swordsman lost his footing and was encased in the muddy river, the real Naruto rose out of the ground next to Haku. Since your master violated the terms of the duel, I'm going to incapacitate him. I expect you to honor your end of the bargain. Before Haku could respond, Naruto blurred forward at intense speed and held out both hands, making guns out of his pointer fingers. He called out water style, water pistols before he began peppering Zabuza with condensed, high-speed water bullets. Each bullet that missed, made a sizable splash in the mud around Zabuza after penetrating nearly six inches. Each bullet that landed on Zabuza drew a groan of pain out of the scary swordsman and did real, internal damage to him. After receiving nearly 30 water bullets while being dragged toward the tree line by an irresistible muddy current, Zabuza's head slumped as he passed out unconscious. He continued his muddy trek until his body slammed into a tree. Naruto darted over to the tree and was forced to dodge a volley of Senbone as he attempted to put a seal on Zabuza. Stand down, Haku, I do not wish to harm you and I will not kill your master. If you continue this, my comrades will get involved and I will not guarantee your lives. Naruto barked in a no-nonsense tone. The timid girl halted her movements with Senbone in hand as Itachi's blade rested against her neck. The two demon brothers were already in a precarious position, thanks to a chirping, electricity-coated hand that Kakashi had pressed against Gozu's back. A tense standoff ensued and Haku realized that they were truly outgunned from the start. What are you going to do to him? She said in a resigned tone. I am going to seal him in a stasis scroll that only May Terumi can unlock. You will take this unruly man and your pirates away from Wave and Fire Country. You will deliver him to May along with a letter from me. An uncomfortable stay in a stasis scroll is the least he deserves for dishonoring the terms of our duel. Naruto answered calmly, never breaking eye contact through Haku's hunter mask. Very well, Haku sighed in a resigned tone as she dropped the senbone from her hand. Naruto proceeded to weave through seals before placing his hand on Zabuza's chest. Kanji spread from his chest in thick black lines and came to a halt as its influence sealed Zabuza into a stasis state. Naruto then took out a prisoner scroll and sealed Zabuza's body into it before he used his brush to place a chakra seal on the scroll. He sealed Kubakirabocho into a separate scroll and then walked calmly over to Haku before giving her both scrolls. We will not have any further issues, will we? Naruto asked. Haku shook her head furiously in the negative after Itachi removed his sword. No, Lord Senju, you will have no further issues with us or the pirates. Great, Naruto said with a genuine smile. Now, please wait for me to write a quick letter to Mei. Naruto took five minutes to write a message to the rebel leader and create an incomplete communication scroll before he handed the sealed letter and scroll to Haku. Thanks, Haku, last I knew she was on Kambi Island just to the south of Kiri. If she finished up the rebellion, then my guess is that she would be in Kirigakor. Thank you for your mercy, Lord Senju. I will deliver this to her without fail, Haku said before her, and the demon brothers disappeared in a water sunshine. Naruto sighed as the last of his stored natural energy faded and the markings on his face receded. Kakashi stepped forward with a completely incredulous look on his face. Naruto, what the fuck was that? How can you keep up with an elite jonin? Naruto let Itachi answer on his behalf with a tired gesture of his hand. Why don't you come to the morning and evening workouts and find out? I am sure my brother will act up, but in time it would be good for him. No, no way. The workouts guy has been raving about? No way. I am not subjecting my team to that. Plus, workouts are not enough for those kinds of results, Kakashi said. Itachi cocked an eyebrow at his senpai. Kakashi, your team is by far the weakest Janan team specifically because of those workouts. Before you raise a stink, try challenging any of the rookie teams and see if you win a single match. Spoiler, the answer will be no. At this point, even Ino Yamanaka would be able to match up against my little brother. Oh, please, Itachi sensei, Ino would destroy Sasuke. I have been giving her, lessons, on the side. I told her that I would expect any potential wife to be strong and that seemed to do the trick, Naruto said while laughing internally. Kit, please make your mate fight the Uchiha. I want to see the look on his face. Kurama begged, with special backing from Rias and Hikari. Yes, little brother, I demanded. If not, I will take over again at night and get you in trouble again. Rias taunted. Sheesh, it isn't up to me. While I hate the bastard for his previous life, I don't think I want to break him that badly this early. 
Naruto thought back. Kakashi looked incredulously between Itachi and Naruto. You think my team is the weakest? Both of them nodded and Kakashi pushed his head into his hands. How much have you taught them? The better question, Kakashi, is what have you taught them? Itachi countered. Kakashi seemed to think for a brief second. Well, teamwork exercises, rank missions and we completed tree walking before coming here. Yup, your team is the weakest, Naruto said cheerily. Kakashi's look demanded an explanation. Okay, fine, every rookie has been equipped with resistance and weight seals. Weight seals are self-explanatory, but the resistance seals are the ones my father used to train his speed and internal resilience. Ino has had them on for five months now while Shikamaru and Hinata have had them for seven months. Huji and Shino have had them since they returned to Konoha, and I don't even need to explain Guy's team. Naruto explained. Okay, but that doesn't make that much of a difference. Sasuke is still a prodigy. Kakashi countered. Itachi broke down their reasoning. At the Jinan level, Taijutsu is the most effective combat art due to lower chakra reserves and less potent jutsu. Speed and strength are key variables in Taijutsu. Furthermore, Naruto's training includes mandatory weapon training, advanced chakra control, chakra reserve building, basic elemental manipulation and C-rank jutsus of elemental affinities. Not to mention they spar against one another every day. I love my little brother, but his ego would be shattered if he were to fight against the other Janan teams at this time. How about a bet, Kakashi? I am sure you have seen Guy and his mini-me had a complete makeover lately. Think you would fare any better against me? Naruto asked cockily with a smirk spreading across his face. Kakashi thought about it for a minute, deal, but I get to choose the Janan Sasuke fights against. As long as the Janan attends my workouts and participates in our joint training, I am fine with that. Naruto responded. I will referee that spar. What are the terms of your bet? Itachi said in a neutral tone. If I win, Kakashi has to wear Guy's old outfit for a month, Naruto said without even needing to think about it. Kakashi's eye widened in horror. No, no way. No way in hell. Kakashi sputtered out. What? Too scared your prodigy student will get put in his place against any of the rookies? Naruto taunted. Even on the off chance that the Janan chosen defeated Sasuke, there was nothing in the world worth taking that bet. Kakashi would rather commit seppuku than wear that hideous outfit that he tricked Guy into wearing all those years ago. Your terms are unreasonable. There is nothing of equal value that I could possibly think of when Sasuke wins the spar. Kakashi answered, thinking that he had saved his reputation. Fine, you will wear Guy's old outfit on duty for one whole day. Naruto conceded. If Sasuke wins, I want the complete, signed limited edition set of Icha Icha with illustrations. Your grandfather is Jiraiya, so you should be able to swing that. Kakashi answered. Deal, Naruto said quickly while extending his hand for a handshake. Kakashi hesitated a moment, shuddered visibly, gulped loudly, then accepted the handshake sealing the deal. Itachi bore witness and smirked deviously at the thought of seeing his old sensei in Guy's outfit. The Konoha trio made their way back onto the bridge. Kakashi's clone had tied up Sasuke and Kiba for insubordination, evidently, they made a break for it and tried to join the fight when they felt the chakra spike. The clone dispelled, transferring its memories, when it saw the trio walking back down the bridge. Kakashi groaned and Naruto snickered when he saw the tied up boys, at least the markings had faded by this point otherwise Naruto would have lost it. The pouty looks on their faces, the screeches of Sakura and the annoyed look on Hinata's and Shino's faces were priceless to Naruto. What happened? Is the fight over already? Sasuke demanded from his seated position. Itachi walked over, bent down and poked Sasuke in the forehead like he used to do when he was little. Yes, little brother. The missing ninjas and the pirates have been dealt with. We will remain on the island and conduct patrols for the next week to make sure. Kakashi stepped forward, in the meantime, once patrols are completed, Team 7 will be training with me. Naruto got a devious smirk and elbowed Hinata lightly in the side. Hey Kakashi, why not join us for our workouts? We have plenty of equipment back at the villa? Kakashi, not wanting to demoralize his students before the spar of destiny, as he thought of it, answered Naruto, no thanks, Team 7 will be conducting their own elite training regimen. He was really hoping that the word elite would motivate his team. Kiba barked out a laugh, yeah, as if Team 8 could keep up with our elite training. Akamaru whined by his master's side. Shino spoke up, in a shocking turn of events, Kiba, your statement is illogical. Naruto has clearly demonstrated Team 8's superiority. Just because Kakashi Sensei uses the word elite doesn't make your workout elite. Hinata, picking up on where Naruto was going with this, added, 
Yes, Team 7 has always refused to join us for workouts and joint training. I will bet my bow that Team 7 cannot complete the workout we will be doing tomorrow morning. Before Kakashi could interfere, Kiba and Sasuke exclaimed, You are on. Subchapter, Date Night in Wave, After catching up with Yosuke once the teams returned to the Senju Villa, Naruto created a wood clone and willingly transferred control of his body to his warrior ego. It was Naruto's idea to make sure that Yosuke could fully enjoy anything that happened during or after the date. Yosuke graciously accepted Naruto's offer and took his time preparing for the date. He dressed in a royal blue, short-sleeved kimono that exposed his chest down to his sternum. He tied his black hair back in a high ponytail and wore wooden sandals with blue straps. Ow ow, Rias exclaimed through the mindscape as Yosuke was looking in the mirror. Looking sharp. Naruto added, finding it strange communicating through this side of the mental link. Got get her, big brother, Hikari exclaimed excitedly. If Yosuke hooks up with the human chick, does that mean my kit cheated on his mates? Kurama asked. Your commentary is enjoyable, yet unnecessary. I would appreciate a bit of privacy as I court Lady Himawari, Yosuke said calmly through the mental link before closing it. Naruto, Kurama, Rias and Himawari just smirked because they could still watch what was going on through the big screen that grew to encompass the whole room. Suddenly, the surround sound speakers kicked on, using Yosuke's ears as the audio input. Naruto kicked his feet up onto the coffee table and leaned back into the couch with a contented sigh. So, this is what this feels like. Thank goodness you guys weren't present for my date with Eno. Rhea snickered, Oh, Ruto, we saved the memory. I give it to you, little brother, you did some good work on that date. Himawari blushed, Big sis didn't let me watch after the dinner though. Thank Kami for that, Naruto said exasperatedly. Quiet, we are getting to the good part. Kurama barked as he materialized some beer and popcorn. Back in the real world, Yosuke knocked on the door to Himawari's residence. She chose to stay in wave and become one of the Gen 1 defenders as well as the manager of the orphanage and academy. Be there in a minute. Yosuke heard a womanly voice call out through the door. He leaned back into the door and looked at the blue and yellow water lilies that he had grown, thanks to Naruto's bloodline. They were beautiful flowers and Himawari was a woman truly deserving of such a gift. Yosuke heard the door crack open and turned around to see Himawari done up in a light blue kimono with white snowflakes. Her black, silky hair was done up into an ornate bun and she was wearing light blue lipstick and eyeshadow. Her beauty made Yosuke forget to breathe as the warrior froze on the doorstep of a goddess. He was broken out of his stupor when Himawari giggled and twirled to show off her outfit. So, what do you think? She asked playfully. I, um, wow. That outfit truly becomes you, my lady. Yosuke answered while still dazed. Himawari blushed a bit and giggled playfully. Oh? So, I am your lady, am I? If you wish to be, then I humbly accept you to be. Yosuke answered in a whisper to her ear. Himawari blushed and linked arms with the tall man. I think I would like that. So, where are we going for our date? I have made reservations at your favorite restaurant and then I have a surprise plan for you afterwards. Yosuke answered in a soft voice as Himawari laid her head on his shoulder as they walked. After a stroll through town filled with thumbs-ups and catcalls, the couple made their way into Ocean's Bounty, Gourmet Restaurant. The waiter escorted them to the VIP booth that was reserved for the most prominent families on the island. Yosuke ordered a bottle of white wine that he knew Himawari liked and a started dish of baked scallops before the waiter left and he returned his attention to his beautiful date. The dinner was filled with flirtatious chatter and topics that brought the two closer together. After eating their sushi platter and polishing off the bottle of wine, Yosuke took her hand in his and guided her to the surprise. The evening sky was perfect as stars flittered about and the two walked onto the private docks. Yosuke guided her to a private sailboat that was named Lady of the Wave. He helped her board the modest sailboat before taking control and creating a couple shadow clones to man the vessel. He guided Himawari to the front of the boat, and she saw a blanket and pillows laid out for them, along with some candles, chocolates and strawberries. She slapped him playfully on the arm. What tonight just your way of showing off that you always listen to me? She asked giddily. And if it were? Yosuke replied in a deep tone. Then I think I would reward you with something like this, Himawari whispered as she leaned forward and placed a gentle kiss on Yosuke's lips. The gentle kiss turned into a kiss of passion as Yosuke's warrior spirit burned a new reason to fight into his heart. The warrior shamelessly pulled on the memories of Rias and Naruto to ensure that he was putting forward his best performance. The two collapsed in a joint heap on the blankets and pillows as the clones guided the sailboat away from the pier and out onto the ocean. The cool ocean breeze and rhythmic bobbing of the waves lulled the two into a state of bliss and contentment. 
For Himawari, she had been waiting for this man to declare his feelings ever since he saved her from Gato. He was one of the main reasons that she stayed in Wave, despite being guaranteed passage back to the land of water. Who could blame her though? The beautiful land of waves or a war-torn country, it wasn't a hard decision to make. In the mindscape, Naruto had his hands over Himawari's eyes. He had a brotherly instinct to protect and guard his altar's innocence. However, the little blonde elbowed him in the stomach and declared that she was just as old as he was. While true, everyone that resided in Naruto saw her as the little sister they must protect. That night, Hikari got to see what happens when two adults love each other very much. Who knows, maybe nine months later she would see the results. End of subchapter. The next morning, Team 7 was dragged out of bed and given a very rude awakening by Naruto clones who were in drill sergeant mode. Naruto always did love the movie Full Metal Jacket, or at least the parts with Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. He channeled his inspiration and prepared one of the most difficult CrossFit workouts that he knew Hinata and Shino could complete. A very tired Team 7 walked out onto the Senju training grounds in their workout attire. They saw York, Tsunami, Kaisa and a couple of members from Wave's Defense Force standing next to boxes, kettlebells, pull-up bars, sets of dumbbells and multiple jump ropes. They were intrigued by the workout equipment, but they were confident that they could keep up with anything Naruto could. Naruto ordered them to begin stretching as he explained the workout. Okay everyone, welcome Team 7 to CrossFit. This workout will be unlike any workout you have done before. First, this workout will be completed chakra-free. Second, this workout is timed and the standard for completing the workout in a passable time is 15 minutes. Third, this workout will be completed in stations. Since we have so many people joining us, we will divide evenly into two groups. One group will motivate, count and coach the other through the exercises. Idiot, you think 15 minutes could ever be enough of a workout for an Uchiha? I train every day. Sasuke barked out, interrupting Naruto's explanation. He adopted a confused look when everyone laughed at him and made comments like we will see or I can't wait to see his face after he pukes. Itachi just facepalmed in shame, knowing that his brother had never done a workout without chakra before. Naruto coughed to regain the group's attention. Anyway, as I was saying. Today we are going to do the filthy 50. Groans came from those that knew what Naruto was talking about and he responded with a chuckle. For those that don't know. The Filthy 50 is a workout of 10 different exercises that you will complete in the fastest time possible. The stations are as follows, 1 box jumps with 24, 36 and 48 options. Team 7 start on 24. 2 jumping pull-ups, start below the bar, jump and execute a pull-up. Completely release and repeat. 3 50 kettlebell swings with each arm. The rep is counted when the kettlebell comes to a complete stop in between your legs. 4 50 walking lunges on each leg. Additional weight can be added for more experienced members. 550 Hanging knees to elbows. Hang from the pull-up bar and bring knees to elbows in a controlled manner. 650 Push presses or military presses. I have 45, 60 and 75 pound dumbbells prepared. 750 Back extensions. Lay flat on the ground and raise legs, arms and torso off the ground. 850 Wall balls. I have 20, 30 and 40 pound medicine balls. Throw the ball as high as you can off the wall. Catch in a controlled manner and repeat. 9, 50 burpees, self. Explanatory. 10, 50 double unders, jumping rope except you must revolve the rope twice in one jump. Any questions? Kiba scoffed, what's so hard about that? Naruto ignored the question and looked over the group. Is everyone done stretching? At nods from most of the group, he continued and formed a hang sign. Okay, say goodbye to your chakra. Team 8, pair up with Team 7 and guide them through the workout. Since they are so elite, we will let them go first. Everyone else, move at your own pace, respect your fellow crossfitters and remember that this exercise is timed. Try to beat your previous record. Naruto secured wrist weights, ankle weight and a weighted vest before walking over to Sasuke. Why are you wearing weights, Senju? Sasuke asked Naruto. He was worried that he couldn't access his chakra and his worry was overshadowing his pride. To make this fair. I have done this exercise many times before and I need weight if I want to get the most out of it. Naruto held up his hand. Don't even think about asking for weights. If you can do the exercises in less than 12 minutes, then you qualify for additional weight. Sasuke scoffed and crossed his arms. Fine, whatever you say. Let's get this over with. A Naruto clone blew a whistle and half of the attendees blurred into motion. Those that were used to the workout operated at a brisk pace but made sure to keep their breathing even. Team 7 blew through their first workouts, box jumps for Kiba, jumping pull-ups for Sasuke and double-unders for Sakura. 
they were keeping up with the group or maybe a little ahead of pace. Naruto kept telling Sasuke to pace himself, which was duly ignored by the Uchiha. At 10 minutes in, Sasuke had completed five of the exercises and he was huffing and puffing as he moved to the back extensions. He flopped on the ground like a fish and performed sloppy back extensions. Naruto broke out drill sergeant mode and kept saying zero until Sasuke did the exercise to the standard. Incited by his anger, Sasuke gained a second wind as he completed the extensions and ran to the wall ball area. He took the 20-pound ball and began throwing it at the lowest line, which was 10 feet up. He didn't know why it was so hard, but the exercise made his arms feel like lead every time he caught the medicine ball as it was falling. Naruto stifled a laugh and decided not to antagonize the Uchiha that was clearly giving the workout his best effort. Sasuke moved slowly through the burpees, not realizing how tired his body was or how hard it was to repeatedly fall, jump back up and raise his dead weight arms above his head. His breathing became ragged, and his face was flushed as blood was pumping through his body at its fastest rate ever. After burpees, Sasuke made his way to the jump ropes and began attempting double unders. Once again, he was slowed down by not being able to complete the exercise effectively and his frustration got the better of him. He was breathing so hard as he moved into his last exercise and his head was spinning so badly that he hadn't realized that everyone had already finished, and they were waiting on him and. Kiba. Sakura had already given up 10 minutes ago when she fainted while doing the military presses. Sasuke's pride willed him forward as he completed his box jumps at a snail's pace. The fact that the end was in sight was the only thing keeping him on his feet. Each jump was like moving the weight of the world as the lead in his legs weighed him down. Finally, on the 50th repetition, Sasuke shouted triumphantly before passing out. Itachi, knowing it would happen sooner or later, caught his brother and laid him by Kakashi, who was lying on the ground spread eagle and panting. Okay, good job everyone. Next iteration, get ready, begin. Team 8 completed the workout relatively easy, when compared to Team 7. Naruto finished the advanced version of the workout in 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Itachi, who was also weighted, completed it in 11 minutes and 59 seconds. Hinata finished the medium difficulty options in 12 minutes and 30 seconds and Shino completed the standard workout in just over 13 minutes. Naruto wrote everyone's times down on the board and shared the results with the group. Great job everyone, big round of applause for Team 7 completing their first ever CrossFit workout, Naruto said and earned a round of claps for Team 7. We all remember getting our chakra cherries popped, don't we? A round of laughter from the group. Well, here is your chakra back. Remember, the stronger the base, the better the end product. I am proud of each of you, and it was great seeing you all again. Feel free to stick around for the shinobi exercises or get on with your daily duties. As Chakra returned to the area, Team 7 began breathing easier as their Chakra worked to soothe their aching muscles and replenish the lost energy. Team 8 sat down next to them, knowing that they would demand an explanation. Naruto, what the fuck was that? That was worse than my Anbu workouts and it only took you 15 minutes. Kakashi asked. Naruto chuckled. That was a CrossFit workout in a chakra null zone. I have my training ground sealed, which took for fucking ever by the way, to disable all chakra within the barriers of the seal. No internal chakra molding, no chakra reinforcement, no healing or replenishment, just you as you were born into the world. But what is the point of that? Asked Kiba, truly perplexed now that he was feeling better with his chakra restored. If I asked you guys to do that workout with your chakra, how much faster could you have done it? Naruto answered the question with a question. I don't think I would have broken a sweat. Kiba answered. Okay, so what is the point of chakra then, Kiba? It makes us stronger and lets up perform jutsus. Kiba answered simplistically. Sakura, what are the two basic elements of chakra? Why do you think I disabled chakra and how would that help you? Naruto asked the brainchild of Team 7. Sakura thought about it for a bit. Well, chakra is broken down into yin and yang components, spiritual or physical energy. You took it away, so that we could build more yang chakra? Sakura guessed. Close, but no. When combined, spiritual and physical energy combine to form chakra. Us ninja become so reliant on the chakra that we don't even realize we are suffusing our bodies with it, and we use it as a crutch. That is why so many ninjas are so lanky, they simply rely on their chakra to do everything. Naruto began explaining before Sasuke cut him off. And what is wrong with that? It is chakra that grants us power and makes us stronger, Sasuke said in a sure of himself tone. Wrong, Sasuke. Chakra is a force multiplier. I disable chakra to build upon your foundation. Sakura, let's put it this way. In the equation of overall strength, chakra x base strength equals overall strength. 
If you just build up your chakra, how does that affect the equation? Well, it would be the same as just building your foundational strength since it is multiplicative. Okay, Kakashi Sensei, is it easier to build strength or chakra? Naruto asked. Strength, because chakra has too many factors. Kakashi answered, starting to see where Naruto was going with this. Naruto snapped his fingers. Exactly. Chakra is affected by density, nature, speed, flow, size of coils, reserves and a couple other factors. Sure, you can slowly build them up, but everyone has an upper limit when it comes to chakra potential. That growth rate will slow down, and you will find yourself plateauing. By forcing you to work out without chakra, I build your yang chakra reserves, I build your foundational strength and I build both factors of that equation to make you much, much stronger. Sakura looked with a newfound respect at Naruto while Sasuke sneered at Kakashi. Why have you never explained this to us, sensei? Kakashi I smiled and shrugged. You are kids, you don't need to know advanced chakra theories and applications. We are in a time of peace, after all. The answer infuriated Sasuke, but surprisingly it was Naruto that spoke up. Kakashi, you better grow up rapidly. Your lax attitude will get your students killed and you will have another name on the memorial stone to waste your life away looking at. Our profession has us dancing with death every day. As soon as they adorn the Hishiate, they lost the right to be children because the world and our profession demands that we be adults. Take it seriously or watch them die in front of you, it is your choice. Naruto's tone was frigid, maybe a bit of resentment from his previous life was affecting his outlook on the situation. Kakashi was about to wave him down, but Itachi backed Naruto up. He is right, senpai. You used to know as much when you were in Anbu. This peace is only temporary, you should see every day as an opportunity to prepare them against the horrors of the world. What would have happened if your team took this mission alone? Would they have survived the encounter with Haku and the Demon Brothers while you fought off Sabuza? Would you have been able to win the fight against Sabuza? Kakashi was backed into a corner, finally he hung his head and admitted defeat. Naruto released him from his depression by making the offer. Look, guys, you don't like us, and we don't like you. Fair enough, I don't feel like sugarcoating it. That being said, you are still my comrades, and you will someday fight alongside me. Feel free to join us for our morning workouts and our other exercises. Give the other teams a chance. If you don't, I promise you we will leave you behind. Naruto ended by gathering up Team 8 and moving to conduct their follow-on exercises, leaving Team 7 with a lot to think about. The remaining time in Wave was fun for Naruto, even though Team 7 refused to join them for the morning and evening CrossFit workouts. Naruto finished a couple of projects for Tazuna that were put on back order due to his absence whenever he was able to work in privacy. Yosuke continually took over Naruto's body each night and stayed with Himawari while a wood clone of Naruto held it down at the villa. Team 7 and 8 worked alongside the self-defense force of Wave Country, SDF for short, AN. He he, I couldn't stop myself once the idea came to my head, by patrolling the island and making sure that the pirate threat was no more. On the 8th night in Wave, Yosuke brought Himawari over to the Senju Villa for a very important and awkward conversation. Himawari noticed how nervous he looked, and her lady senses were tingling as they walked through the villa. After Yosuke brought her into Naruto's room in the compound and sat her down, he undid his transformation and changed into Naruto. Lady Hima, I beg your forgiveness if you feel like I deceived you in any way. There is a very good explanation for this, and I humbly beg for a couple minutes of your time, Yosuke said in Naruto's form with his head pressed to the floor of Naruto's bedroom. Himawari had her hand over her mouth with tears brimming at the edges of her eyes. She looked at Yosuke with fear and confusion in her eyes. Naruto, who saw that Yosuke had frozen up, took control. He formed wood clones and pushed them out of his back, and they began transforming into their unique forms. Unfortunately, Yosuke felt so ashamed that the wood clone reserved for him just turned into a clone of Naruto. Okay, Himawari, it is me, Naruto Senju. Yosuke has frozen up and is too scared to come out and deal with this right now, so I will explain as best I can. Naruto then pushed through her. Stunned mental state and broke into an explanation of his alter egos. It was the cover story he used with anyone that wasn't in the know, but it was true enough. Once Naruto finished his explanation Himawari broke down crying, which made Rias and Hikari go and comfort her. After a couple minutes, Himawari spoke in a choked voice. T thank why you for T telling me the T truth. C can I, can I s speak to Yosuke, P please? Q, push him into this one, his warrior s can't leave his woman crying like this. Naruto thought through the mental link. Got it, Kit. Kurama returned. 
Naruto created a wood clone and this time it began transitioning into Yosuke's chosen form. He looked downcast and ashamed, unable to meet Himawari's cocoa-colored eyes. She stood from her chair and walked over to Yosuke, whose head was buried in his chest. She tenderly grasped his chin and pulled it up to meet her gaze. Yo-yo, you should have told me sooner, my love, Himawari whispered. Yosuke had tears leaking from his eyes as he refused to break the intimate eye contact. Lady Hima, it was never my intention to deceive you. My first act of independence was the night that I saved you and the other women from Gato. Since then, Naruto has let us have our own lives, but we kept this secret closely guarded. It would do harm to Naruto and the Senju clan if it was known that the heir suffered from a mental disorder. Shh, it's alright. I understand. We have all come to know Rias, Hikari, and Naruto. It makes a lot more sense now that I think about it. I only need to know one thing. She trailed off and looked meaningfully into Yosuke's eyes. Do you want to be with me? Yosuke smiled as the tears dried on his cheeks. It is my heart's truest desire. Himawari leaned forward and placed a chaste kiss on his lips. Then we will find a way to make it work, my love. The next day, nine days after arriving in Wave, Teams 7 and 8 were preparing to leave Wave Country. Naruto prepared multiple pairs of communication scrolls, a set for Wave and him as a professional channel between Wave and Konoha, a pair for him and Tazuna's family and a pair for Himawari and Yosuke. All of the scroll pairings required blood and chakra between the two parties communicating. Since Naruto was the one linked to all scrolls, he became the official liaison to Wave, which he kind of already was anyway. Three days later, rebel base on Kambi Island, Mei Terumi was in her office reviewing the plans for the final assault on Kirigakor. Over the past few years, the rebels have managed to secure every island surrounding the main island of Kirigakor and they have taken both southern forts. Fighting at the forts was usually fierce, but it had died down over the past six months. Yagura, after suffering so many losses, had turtled up in Kirigakor and was drawing out the conflict. May had the supply lines cut and it was a matter of time until the blockade forced Yagura's hand. She had lost a couple ships to the fully transformed Jinchuriki in the waters near Kirigakor's northern edge, but the supply blockade had effectively isolated the remaining anti-bloodline forces. As she was sipping on some tea and enjoying her alone time, she was disturbed by a knock on her door. After hearing Ao's voice, she told him to invite their guests in and she saw faces she hadn't seen in a long time. Faces she had kept an eye out for over the past couple years. Ah, Gozu, and Mezu, long time no see. I was wondering when you would come to join the good fight. Who is your friend here? Mei asked in a silky sweet voice. L Lady T Terumi, T this is Haku, a apprentice of M Momochi Zabuza. Mezu answered, clearly scared despite the woman's overly sweet voice. Mei cocked an eyebrow as the young girl nodded. Oh ho? And where is Zabuza? Did that idiot finally get himself killed? Ao snickered at Mei's comment. Haku took a hesitant step forward. Lady Terumi, I would like to know if you know a young man named Naruto Senju. Mei made a signal with her hand and three guards appeared with blades at the necks of her three guests. Where did you hear that name and how do you know he is associated with me? Haku held up her hands and tried to steady her voice to speak calmly. Zabuza ordered us and our crew to raid Wave Country to try and gain funds for another coup attempt. Haku was cut off by a flare of Mei's killing intent. You idiots did what? Mei screamed, truly enraged for the first time in a long time. Haku bowed her head. We stole from Wave and Zabuza ordered us to go back for more, but a barrier emerged and covered the whole island. Two days later, two teams of Konoha Shinobi responded to an urgent request from Wave. They were led by Naruto Senju, who claimed the lands were under his protection and he invoked the tradition of parlay. Haku's words came out in a rapid-fire panic that belied her terror in the face of Mei's power. Mei sat back down in her seat with a scowl on her face. How did that idiot fuck that up? He met Lord Senju for the parlay, and he informed us on the state of the rebellion. Zabuza said he wouldn't listen to a brat and accepted a challenge to a duel to first blood and lost. He proceeded to attack Lord Senju after losing the duel until the boy was able to defeat him in single combat. Itachi Uchiha and Kakashi Hatake were also there and acknowledged the boy as the representative of Konoha for Wave Country. They stopped us from interfering in the duel. Haku explained in a rush, hoping to appease the enraged woman. Mei began massaging her temples, hoping that she wouldn't lose one of her greatest allies in the war effort. Anything else? What happened to Zabuza? Haku bowed before speaking again. The boy sealed Master Zabuza into a stasis scroll and gave me a letter to pass on to you. Haku then took the letter out of her pocket and Ao snatched it out of her hands. After inspecting the letter, he handed it to Mei. 
the auburn-haired woman opened the scroll and read the message. Hey Ame, ran into this idiot in wave. He is either too stupid or his skull was too thick to understand that we are allies. Know that I don't hold his actions against you, but I would appreciate it if you disciplined him a bit. He is in the stasis scroll and I told Haku it would only open to your chakra signature, but that was a bluff. Bonk him over the head for me after you get him some medical attention. I have attached an incomplete communication scroll that will allow for instant communication between you and I all you need to do is add blood and chakra to the bottom right hand seal. Once active, write your message on the scroll and push chakra into the seal on the upper right hand corner until it glows blue. If you see the seal on the back of the letter blinking red, it means you have a message from me. I hope everything is going well with the rebellion. I know you should have it wrapped up any day now, be careful and don't die. I would very much like to keep you as my ally. If it is Yagura holding you up, let me know and I will create some bijou suppression seals for you. Keep fighting the good fight, Naruto Senju may smiled as she placed the letter back down on her desk. To Ao's frustration, he was unable to read the letter due to some few injutsu protection or another. May scowled at him when she sensed his Byakugan was active. Ow, turn that eye off or I will kill you. I have told you many times not to pry into my affairs, especially when Naruto is involved. May growled, which made Ao gulp and obey out of fear. She turned her gaze back to Haku. You and your crew will remain in the brig until I decide what to do with you. Your actions could have cost us a valuable ally. May unsealed the stasis scroll and an unconscious Zabuza fell onto the floor. Ow, take this man to the medical bay. He is to remain in cuffs during his treatment. Inform him when he wakes up that I will be holding onto his sword until he proves himself worthy of wielding it once more. Update with the Neighborhood Watch Naruto and Tsunade had been operating under the moniker of the Neighborhood Watch for several years now. They have done much good, issued warnings, provided assistance and acted as a faceless and benevolent organization that is out to help the world. Really, they don't have a spy network or that much power, they just have Naruto's memories from the past. They have used that knowledge as power and inspired fear and respect in the leaders of many nations. Their attempts to get a letter to Nagato have proven futile and the elemental post will no longer take letters into Ame. After losing two of their postmen, nobody could blame them. Since the postman died, Naruto and Tsunade never knew if Nagato received their letters, but since they never received a response from him, they figured that he never read them. They decided to deal with Nagato and Ame at a later date. Naruto had sent nearly semi-annual letters to Iwa, Kumo and a couple smaller shinobi villages. He used his knowledge from missions and revelations of his previous life to scare those leaders into heeding his words. It was a genius bluff that had paid off for the most part. He had never heard back from a minor nation, and only one cage was willing to sign the Uzumaki blood contract, but Naruto thought that he was still making a difference. I, after receiving multiple letters from the faceless organization, each letter coming with a gift that helped to protect his village, decided to trust his benefactor. It confused I why all of the seals he received were purely defensive in manner and could only really be used to protect his village, never take the offensive, but it all made sense after he picked Samui and Amoi up from Konoha. Samui immediately showed the rakage the communication scroll, easily understanding the ramifications this could have if applied to shinobi operations. I saw similar handwriting and sealing that he had been seeing for the past couple years. Then, the kicker, I had a letter from the neighborhood watch waiting for him when he got back to Kumo. They thanked him for his participation in the exchange program and for not breaking the trust of either of his new allies. Then AI unsealed the Uzumaki blood contract, and the final piece fell into place for I. His intelligence department had informed him of the Senju family and their impact of Wave and Suna. Funnily enough, most of the impact was done through the efficient use of seals and skilled application of ninjutsu. Merchants sent to Wave and Suna reported seeing homes protected and improved with seals that improved everyone's quality of life. He had received seals that improved everyone's quality of life and that protected his village. Seeing the Uzumaki name, knowing them to be the cousins of the Senju, let I piece everything together and sign the blood contract without much hesitation. That left him with this message, Lord Reikage. I am glad that I can finally share my identity with you. I am Naruto Senju Uzumaki, and I am sure that you met me when you stopped by Konoha. Samui and Amoi are great shinobi and I instructed each of them to the best of my ability, since our academy standards have fallen so far. Feel free to test them, I am sure they will be the best in their generation. I invite you to join me for a CrossFit training session during the Chunin exams, and it would be great if your brother B could join us. Anyway, I will continue to be your ally and I will continue to help Kumo. If you ask me why, I will tell you that I am barred from disclosing that information by a contract more powerful than the one you just signed. I simply ask you to trust me, at least until we can meet and speak at the tuning exams. All that being said, 
the serious message I have for you is that the Akatsuki will start moving soon. Make sure to clean out your council and protect your Jinchuriki. I recommend liberal use of the truth seals during routine screenings. As of now, I have been able to use the neighborhood watch to help prepare each village as best I can. I cannot understate how dear a threat they are. I hope to see you soon enough, Naruto Senju Uzumaki, Konoha Head of Neighborhood Watch PS If your intelligence department hasn't acquired Senju clothing yet, I highly recommend that you get some for yourself and your Kunoichi. I have applied multiple seals to that clothing line that will make them happy and protect them from the scum of the earth. PSS- I know you are a busy man, but Mabui is absolute fire, and she has a thing for you. Don't forget to appreciate the small things in life. Today, I sat in his office looking at the message from Konoha that had recently been delivered. It was the invite to the Chunin exams, and he knew he wanted to send a couple teams. It would be the first time since the Hyuga incident, but enough time had passed, and Kumo had made amends. Making his decision, he called Mabui, the silver-haired beauty, into his office. Mabui, please bring me Daru, Yugito, and B. Back in Konoha, one day after leaving Wave, Hiruzen leaned back into his chair after listening to the mission report from Naruto, Itachi, and Kakashi. The other Janan were dismissed and Hiruzen was mulling over the implications of what Naruto just shared with him. Naruto, do you understand what could happen if it was discovered that Konoha was providing aid to rebel forces of a foreign nation? Hiruzen sighed out while rubbing his temples. Do you understand that I never once associated the aid I sent with Konoha? Never once did I ask for anything back or anything that would benefit Konoha? I simply did what was right under the Senju name and I will continue doing so. Naruto retorted passionately. Naruto, it isn't that simple. The Senju clan is directly connected to Konoha. Hiruzen countered. Not for the past seven years it hasn't been, old man. It is well known throughout the nations that we have been in Suna and Wave. I acted as the Lord Protectorate of Wave and sent aid. If Konoha doesn't want another ally, then that's your call. Damn it, Naruto, why are you so insistent on helping foreign nations when you don't do the same for your own village? Hiruzen's weariness turned into frustration as he asked the question. Itachi and Kakashi squirmed uncomfortably as they were thrown in the middle of the argument between their Hokage and Naruto. I have sold my seals to Konoha just the same as the other villages. If the stupid council wasn't so proud and stingy you already would have received the security upgrades. Once Konoha regains my trust, I will share Uzumaki clan Fuenjutsu levels 1 through 5. I am not being unfair, I am simply securing my clan's future. Naruto's tone began to rise for the first time in the exchange. Well, I have heard that seals matching the Uzumaki protection seals have popped up in Iwa and Kumo. Did they pay for them? Hiruzen showed one of his cards and the source of his frustration. Naruto took the implications with a grain of salt and didn't let it show on his face. Look, what I do with my clan's knowledge is my business. I am building trust and allies, allies I thought I may need to protect me from my own damned village and the enemies out there that hate me for who I am. That is not how this works. You cannot act independently of your Hokage, Hiruzen shouted. I have not. I have not shared anything since my swearing in as a Janan. As for my actions prior to returning to Konoha, I have the approval of Uncle Kinji. If you wish to debate this further, take it up with him because I am tired of being yelled at for making the world a better place, Naruto shouted. Hiruzen didn't realize that he was standing up and leaning over his desk. He took in deep breath and sank back into his seat. Somehow this child always knew exactly how to press his buttons. Fine, I will drop this for now, but the council is quite upset with you helping our adversaries. What are these communication scrolls that you are using that Itachi informed me about? They are instant communication scrolls that are linked between two chakra signatures. You can write and receive messages and there is no maximum distance. It is the culmination of one of my projects. Naruto answered. Hiruzen leaned forward as the implications raced through his mind. What would it take to get these for Konoha? $1,000 per scroll pair, blood and chakra of the parties you wish to be linked and a formal request to the Senju clan. Naruto answered matter-of-factly. $1,000. That is extortion. An explosive tag cost $40 to $50, Kakashi exclaimed. Naruto cast a sidelong glance at him. And I have proprietary rights to the technology, I need two hours to draw the seal matrices and I also need to link the chakra signatures. That is enough, Kakashi. For something this valuable it is more than worth the price. How long would it take you to make 100 scroll pairs? The Hokage asked. About a week. Naruto answered. Tamari requests, on behalf of her father, that a communication pairing be made between you and the Kazekage. So, you have already given her a communication scroll? Hiruzen asked with a cocked eyebrow. 
Yes, after graduation I gave Tamari and Samui a scroll each. They were my test. I have also given scrolls to the representatives of WAVE as well. WAVE has requested you respect me as their liaison, for obvious reasons. Naruto answered. See what I mean? You go off on your own or negotiate with foreign nations, Hiruzen said, completely exasperated at this point. To be fair, WAVE is my home away from home. Mama or I are the only realistic liaisons. Naruto shot back in a neutral tone. Very well, I will get the council to approve the request for the communication scrolls. We will also address the security updates as well. That is all I have for now, you may leave, Naruto. Itachi, please stay. Naruto and Kakashi disappeared from the Hokaye's office in various shunshines. Hiruzen turned his gaze on Itachi. Report, Itachi, Hiruzen said firmly. Itachi smiled at the old man, Lord Hokage, the kid is amazing, and I do not see why you make this more difficult than it needs to be. He will be loyal to the village if the village proves worthy of his loyalty. You only need look at what he has done for Suna and Wave to see that. Then why is he so resistant in helping to maintain Konoha's supremacy, Hiruzen shouted before covering his mouth, realizing his slip up. Itachi frowned and cocked an eyebrow. Maybe because he doesn't want supremacy, but a world that works together. Look at all of the seals he has created and shared. They are all defensive in nature and the ones he sells literally make the world a better place. That is naivety, Itachi. I would expect better from my successor. Hiruzen countered. You claim to extol the virtues of the will of fire, a philosophy created by the first Hokage. When Hashirama subdued the nine bijou and had them under his control, what did he do? Did he claim them as property of Konoha and use them to put the other nations under our foot? No, he shared them in hopes of equalizing the balance of power. And look how that worked out for him. We have had three great wars since then. One of those wars claimed his life. Hiruzen shot back. The will of fire is the belief that the next generation is the future of any village. The belief that the next generation will be better than the last. I believe the world wasn't ready to come together at that point and I admit that Hashirama was naive. You don't give foreign powers weapons and expect them not to abuse that power. Itachi explained in a calm monotone. You are making my point for me. Hiruzen pointed out. Yes, but Naruto isn't giving weapons. He is providing them with a sense of security, building trust and making everyone's life just a little bit better. If Lord Hashirama had taken that approach instead of handing out weapons of mass destruction, then the three wars probably wouldn't have occurred. Itachi finished his explanation and train of thought. Itachi, you are going to be my successor and we will announce it at the tuning exams. I cannot afford to have you carry on these naive beliefs. You need to see the world for what it is or Konoha will fall, Hiruzen said wearily. I recently watched a child defeat a so-called demon with ease. I have watched said child instruct his peers and prepare them for conflict in a way that no Jinan has been prepared before. I pity the first person to truly break his trust, Lord Hokage. Don't let that person be you, Itachi cautioned. Seeing the Hokage had nothing more to say, Itachi asked a question. Lord Hokage, why has Lord Jiraiya not returned yet? The boy can now freely go into sage mode, and it bears a striking resemblance to the first sage mode. Hiruzen looked relieved by the change of topic. I called him back, but he said the neighborhood watch told him that Orochimaru was up to no good in rice country. He went to investigate, but he should be back around the tuning exams. It can't be helped then. The crow boss was heavily intrigued that a child could master Senjutsu without instruction from a sage or summoned animals. The crows are a minor clan, but Kario said he would be reaching out to the other summons. Have you told Enma about it? Itachi asked. Yes, he said he hasn't heard of such a thing since Hashirama. Maybe it is because Makutan is so intertwined with natural energy? Regardless, I cannot afford to pull Jiraiya off Orochimaru for this matter alone. One week later, a trip to the desert, Naruto was relaxing with Ino in the Senju Gardens after an evening training session. She had been spending more and more time with Naruto after everyone left. She had developed into a beautiful young woman and had the makings of a fine kunoichi. She was laying back into Naruto's chest as the two reminisced about the spar she recently won. Flashback, two days ago, the rookie teams were called together for a joint training session and Team 7 was included. Before the training began, Kakashi announced that there would be a spar between Ino and Sasuke. Ino began panicking, not wanting to fight against her former crush and not believing that she could win. Of course, Naruto was there to comfort her and build her confidence up. After a couple minutes of private counseling by Naruto, Ino emerged from the tree line and looked determined to win the spar against her former crush. She took her position across from a smirking Sasuke that looked like he wasn't planning on taking this spar seriously. 
Ino pig, why are you even fighting Sasuke? He will just destroy you, it would be better if you gave up on the spar and on that blonde idiot. Sakura shrieked. Ino scowled and glared at her pink-haired banshee of a friend. Shut it, billboard brow. Unlike you, I have actually worked hard to improve myself. And if you call Naruto an idiot again, I will break your nose so that not even Tsunade can make it look pretty again. Ino cast a glance at Naruto and got a wink out of him. Sakura shrank back at the glare and threat. Itachi stepped forward, that is enough, girls. The rules for this spar are no killing or maiming techniques. I will interfere if this rule is broken or if one of you is in mortal danger. Ready? Begin. The rookie Janan watched on with interest as Ino engaged in a stare-off with Sasuke. You might as well give up, Blondie. You may have gotten stronger under Naruto, but only an Uchiha can beat an Uchiha once the Sharingan is awakened, Sasuke sneered condescendingly. Ino blurred forward with mid-tuning speeds at Sasuke and engaged him in Taijutsu. In between blows, Ino was forming hand seals, out of view of Sasuke's Sharingan. Sasuke was winning the Taijutsu exchange, due in large part to the precognition that the Sharingan granted him. Despite taking a couple hits, Ino maintained her attack and game plan until Sasuke landed a spinning kick on her chest after dodging one of her attacks. Sasuke maintained the offensive and had a clear advantage for the first three or four minutes of the fight. Sakura was cheering him on the whole time while teams 8 and 10 watched on with worry. She hadn't taken any severe damage yet, but she needed to break the status quo of this fight. Ino took another hard punch to her chest and rolled with the blow to create a little space between her and her opponent. Ino recovered from the blow and looked up in time to dodge a downward punch from Sasuke. With an open palm, she placed he hand on Sasuke's chest and forced her chakra into his system while calling out Yamanaka Kinjutsu, sensory deprivation. Sasuke began lashing out in a blind rage as his world went hazy and he couldn't hear or feel properly. Ino's jutsu was messing with his senses and it rattled him. Her father had mastered the jutsu to the point that he could completely cut off all five senses, but Ino wasn't on his level yet. Ino regained herself and let Sasuke burn himself out by lashing out blindly. Seeing an opening, she sped forward and landed a hard punch on Sasuke's jaw, forcing his head down and making him scream out in pain. With practiced ease, she grabbed Sasuke's head and planted her knee into his chin. Sasuke crumpled to the ground, completely out as he entered a forced sleep due to a glass jaw. Naruto ran over to Ino and scooped her into a victory hug and twirled her around. Ino enjoyed the attention her love interest was giving her, and she watched as Sakura fretted over the unconscious Uchiha. Ino leaned into the hug as the rookie teams watched the spectacle with pride. Despite their advanced training, nobody expected her to defeat Sasuke, especially since he had awakened to Sharingan. It served as a powerful moral boost for the Janan teams that struggled through Naruto, Guy and Itachi's crazy torture, or training, sessions. End of flashback, Ino was giggling profusely as they discussed the fight yet again and remembered the soul-shattered look on Kakashi's face. He had been forced to immediately change into Guy's old outfit and he wore it until the morning training session the next day. Watching Lee and Guy comment on how youthful Kakashi looked was worth every bit of pain that Ino endured during the spar. It was even funnier when Guy pointed with an exaggerated thumb towards his own chest and told Kakashi that his flames had already evolved from the jumpsuit level to the super suave level. You know, Ruto, next time you want to use me in one of your schemes, maybe you could let me know ahead of time, Ino said playfully as she trapped Naruto's hand under her bust. To be fair, I didn't know Kakashi was going to choose you. We made that bet in wave and he was given the power of choice. I am proud of you though, he said as he placed a kiss on the top of her head and tried to free his hand from her grasp and tickle her. Ino leaned back into him contentedly after preventing his hand's escape and closed her eyes before she whispered, what did I do to deserve you? Naruto smiled into the back of her head. You are you. You make my life better every time you are near me. Your happiness makes me happy. Before the lovebirds could continue their youthful affections, Naruto sensed an anbu at the Senju gate. He stood up and took Ino's hand in his. They went to see what the impromptu visit was about, and Naruto was told he needed to report to the Hokaye's office. After giving Ino a kiss goodbye, Naruto used Shunshine to report to the Hokaye's office. Itachi was waiting for Naruto outside of the Hokaye's office. Once he arrived, he entered alongside his blonde charge. They both bowed respectfully to the old monkey and waited for him to inform them of the reason for their required presence. Ah, Itachi, and Naruto, thank you for coming so quickly. Naruto, Team 8 is being assigned the diplomatic mission to Tsunaga Corps. You have the communication scroll we prepared? Naruto nodded. Very good, Team 8 will take that scroll and the invite to the tuning exams to Tsunaga Corps. 
you will remain there until the Kaze Kage informs you who he will send to participate in these exams. Any questions? No, Lord Hokage. Itachi responded. You will know when the scroll is activated by the red blinking seal, old man. Don't freak out. Naruto added before he left the Hokage's office with Itachi. Please let Hinata and Shino know that we will leave tomorrow at 8 a.m. Itachi requested. Sure thing, sensei. Naruto responded. Ten minutes later, Naruto arrived at the Hyuga front gates. He was granted entry by the gate guards and taken to Hyashi's office. The stoic clan head was reviewing paperwork and Hinata was at a desk position next to her father since she had been helping run clan affairs. Ah, Naruto, it is good to see you again. What brings you to our compound? Hyashi asked. Naruto bowed respectfully to Hyashi. I have come to inform Hinata that we have a diplomatic mission to Suna tomorrow. We will leave thee at 8 a.m. Expect a two-week mission. Bandits have been popping up at the oasis stops in wind country, so be ready for a fight. Make sure to bring plenty of arrows. Naruto had turned to address Hinata, and he smiled as the girl blushed. Thank you, Naruto. I will be sure to be properly stocked, Hinata said, playing with the sealing bracelet that Naruto gave her. Hyashi looked with interest at his daughter. Hinata, how effective are the bow and seals that Naruto has shared with you? Hinata inclined her head respectfully to her father. Very effective, father. Archery came naturally to me, and the sealed arrows diversify my combat ability and increase my combat effectiveness exponentially. Hyashi nodded and turned his head to Naruto. I am most grateful for your assistance in Hinata's training. Her progress was most unexpected and welcome. When you return, perhaps you could demonstrate your seals. Since the Hyuga clan is still recovering, it may be time to incorporate some changes. We could set something up, Lord Hyuga. However, I would be prouder of her progress in the medical arts than combat. It is very refreshing having a capable medic on the team. Tsunade always praises Hinata for her medical prowess, Naruto said with pride tinging his voice. Hinata was blushing furiously and refused to make eye contact with Naruto or her father. Is this true, Hinata? Hyashi asked with a pleased smile. Why yes f father? Lady Tsunade said that she would take me on as her apprentice when I make chunin. Hinata answered, eventually overcoming her embarrassment. That is good to hear. You honor the Hyuga clan with your actions. Hyashi responded. Okay, well I will let you get back to your work. I just wanted to let you know about the mission. Naruto chirped before disappearing in a water sunshine. That boy is something else. Have you made any progress in your affections for him? Hyashi asked. Hinata blushed tomato red, father, Naruto and I are just friends. He sees me as a little sister and wishes to help me. Hyashi frowned at that, would he refuse an offer for arranged marriage? He has gone out of his way repeatedly to help our clan after all. Hinata nodded sadly, yes, father. I believe he is dating the Yamanaka heiress. He also has a strong relationship with Subaku no Tamari. The Kaze Kage's daughter? Yes, father. Hinata answered sadly. Very well, we won't push. You are growing into a beautiful young woman. Sooner or later, he will come to see that, Hyashi said while patting her shoulder with a resigned smile on his face. The next day, Team 8 left the gates in the early morning and headed out toward Suna. It was a three-day journey to get to Sunagakor and they would be moving at Shinobi pace after a light workout each morning according to Itachi-sensei. After an equipment check, which consisted of Itachi checking all of their sealing scrolls, he signed the group out from the front gate. As he was leaving, Kotetsu chirped at him. Oi, Naruto, say hello to your blonde girlfriend for me. Naruto scowled and saw Hinata's sad face as he turned to address the Eternal Gate Guard. Oi, Kotetsu, enjoy guard duty and napping. When I get back, I will be sure to tell the Hokage that you volunteered for gate duty until after the Chunin exams. Before the Chunin could respond, Itachi shook his head with a mischievous grin and directed his team onto the Shinobi Highway, aka the treetops. The group made good time for their first day and stopped at the border town on the edge of the Land of Fire, before entering river country. After dinner and an evening workout, Naruto sent Tamari a message through the scroll letting her know they would be there in two days. He also reaffirmed his promise to her that he would explain everything, which made the blonde Suna Kunoichi screech in excitement. The trip through river country was no problem, seeing as the country had moved into allied status with Suna and Konoha due to the increased profits from the expanded trade routes. Since river country shared over 90% of their borders with the lands of wind and fire, it made sense for the daimyo to push for a full allied status. This was another change that Naruto noted to the timeline, but he couldn't think of any ramifications for this change. 
They stopped the 2nd night at the desert's edge and got prepared for the trek through the hot and sandy environment of wind country. Itachi took an hour in the early morning to instruct his team in the chakra control exercise of sand walking. It used chakra to bind the surface granules of sand together so that one didn't sink every step they took. Naruto helped train his teammates on this and while they were learning, he applied the temperature control seals to their jackets. He also pulled two turbines out of his scroll with similar seals on them and gave them to Hinata and Shino. All in all, it made the trek through the desert 100 times more bearable. At the second oasis rest stop, Naruto sensed trouble from a kilometer out. He informed Itachi and the team approached the rest stop with caution. The team surrounded the small building that was erected near the oasis and saw three camels and a small wagon with the crest of the wind daimyo on it. There were eight thugs standing guard around the building and they could hear screams of an older woman coming from inside the building. Using hand signs, Itachi passed a message to his team. Hold. Naruto. Any. Ninja. Naruto closed his eyes and focused on spreading his senses. A light layer of his chakra enveloped the rest area and he felt two developed chakra signatures. From this distance, he estimated mid chunin to jonin level. He opened his eyes and signaled to his team, 12. Total. 2 ninja. Chunin to jonin. 4 enemy. In-house. 6 civilian. Itachi sucked his teeth as he thought of the best approach. He saw Hinata was nervous, and Shino was barely restraining himself from launching his hive of bugs in to save the distressed females. Their screams were horrific to listen to in the Abarame air abhorred rape. A couple months ago, two of his cousins were brutally raped and left for dead by Iwa ninja belonging to the Kamazura clan. Luckily, one of Jiraiya's spies saved them and got them back to Konoha. Itachi made up his mind and signaled to his team. Shino. Bugs. Distraction. Hinata. Bo. Eliminate. Naruto. I infiltrate. Kill. All. Naruto and Shino signaled back immediately confirming their orders. Itachi saw that Hinata's Byakugan was activated, and he could only guess what horrifying scene she saw playing out inside. Itachi saw the hesitation in Hinata's posture before she firmed her resolve and responded in the affirmative. Shino sent out as many of his kikaiku under the sand as his body could afford. It wasn't uncommon for bugs to be near the oasis in the desert. As the hives burst out of the ground around the building, the eight guards began screaming in horror as the bugs began eating them alive. The guards shouted bugs and began running toward the water of the oasis in an attempt to escape the wrath of the insect swarm. Two of the lower rank shinobi opened the door to investigate what was going on and caught arrows through their eye sockets for their trouble. As soon as the distraction began, Naruto and Itachi darted forward to close the distance to the building. As the thugs opened the door, Itachi saw the arrows impact the enemy's heads and he didn't hesitate to force his way into the door, shortly followed by Naruto. His Sharingan let him process everything at lightning speed and he immediately dashed for the man that had shredded the clothes of the female girl. Naruto, following shortly after Itachi, saw the mark that Itachi left for him. The man was still buried inside a woman in her early twenties and his hands were holding her tied hands over her head on the couch that was provided in the rest area. Without hesitating, Naruto blurred forward and kicked the rapist through two walls of the rest area, leaving a sizable hole in the shelter. He created a shadow clone without using hand seals that stood protectively above the woman before he dashed through the hole in the wall. He saw the man recovering and stumbling slightly as he stood to his feet. His pants were still down around his ankles and Naruto's kick had left him in a dazed state. Kurama was working to hold back his chakra as Naruto's elevated rage pulled subconsciously on his power. With the help of Yosuke, Rias, and Hikari, they were able to stem the flow of the potent chakra, but Naruto was still enraged. He unsealed four kunai from his wrist brace, coated them in wind chakra, and launched them at the man that was stumbling to his feet. The kunai went straight through the man's elbow joints as well as both of his shins. Naruto stalked forward with an evil grin on his face as his eyes flickered red. The rapist cried out in pain but forgot his pain when he saw the flickering demonic eyes of the Konoha shinobi. Stalking towards him. As the man struggled to crawl away with his mangled limbs, Naruto knocked him unconscious with a blow to the back of his neck. Itachi had easily neutralized his designated opponent and immediately moved to support Hinata and Shino. Shino's Kikaiku had killed three of the eight outer guards while Hinata had killed two more with well-placed arrows. There were three thugs hiding in the oasis in an attempt to escape the painful pincers of Shino's Kikaiku. Hinata and Shino had already surrounded the small pond when Itachi walked up. Your choice is simple. I only need one of you alive to talk. The other two will die. Who chooses to live? Itachi said in a monotone voice with his hands resting behind his back. Itachi used this posture to forcibly calm himself down and restrain his rage. 
one of the thugs swam to the edge of the pond raising his hands in surrender and volunteering himself. The other two thugs were shooting looks of betrayal at him as they attempted to figure a way out of this mess. Itachi didn't give the two time to think, he appeared in a shunshine on top of the water, bent down and grabbed the two by the collars of their shirts. He tossed them unceremoniously out of the oasis, not wanting to dirty the life-giving water with their blood. Before they impacted on the surrounding sands, they were engulfed in a massive fireball. Their screams lasted only a second before their bodies crumpled to ash. Back with Naruto, he had pulled the pants of his captive up, not wanting to look at the disgusting and shriveled sex organ. His paralysis seal would hold the man long enough for him to complete his intended punishment on the man. He approached the oasis in time to see two thugs being burnt alive by a fireball. He smirked at the ease with which his sensei summoned the wrath of such a potent fire technique. He tossed his captive down next to the one remaining thug. Sensei, I will ask your approval first, but I have a special punishment for this scummy rapist. Shino, it involves you and you are free to opt out. Naruto finished by looking directly into Shino's shades. Shino pushed his glasses further up onto the bridge of his nose. That will not be necessary, Naruto. What did you have in mind? Atoni was having a bad day. He was tasked with kidnapping the daimyos, the wind daimyos, Nisa's punishment for refusing to negotiate with Otogakor. He had killed her guards with ease, and he was in the process of extracting some pleasure from this miserable desert when his fun was interrupted. Now, his mind ached as a migraine sent piercing pain through his head, disrupting his thoughts. He felt a splash of water and a hard slap to his face. Ah. What? What the fuck? Stop. That hurts. Atoni screamed. Naruto snarled down at the ninja, oh, you think that hurts? What about the woman you were raping? Get over yourself, you little bitch. Naruto finished with an extra hard slap to the man's cheek. Atoni sputtered as his vision began clearing up and he processed his situation. He couldn't move his body and he was in a lot of pain. He was surrounded by what looked like a Janan team from Konoha. What the fuck do you leaf bastards want? Naruto held up the Hishiate with the music note symbol on it. I want you to tell me what village you are working for and who told you to kidnap the daimyo's niece. Atoni spit blood at Naruto, who simply leaned aside and let the projectile sail over his shoulder. Go fuck yourself. Shino, if you please, go with the new breed, Naruto said before returning his attention to Atoni. Look, rapist, this here is an Abarame. That little bug on his finger is going to eat you from the inside out. To make it more fun, I have applied an enhanced sensitivity seal to you. To make his point, Naruto slapped him again. You can either die screaming in pain, or I can end you with one stroke. The choice is up to you. Naruto finished calmly. Naruto made a motion with his hand and Shino set the red kikaiku, which was about twice the size of his normal hive, into the wound on the man's elbow. Atoni began screaming in pain as the kyubified kikaiku began devouring the flesh of his left arm. After a minute, Shino ordered his bug to halt and left Atoni in a panting and sobbing mess. Stop, stop, please stop. I will talk. Naruto made a hand gesture saying to get on with it. I work for Odogakor, the hidden village in the land of rice paddies. Our leader ordered us to capture the wind daimyo's niece. Hinata had to walk away from the brutal interrogation, and she retreated to the rest stop for a reprieve from the screaming. And who is your leader? Itachi asked in his usual monotone. The man hesitated to answer, which earned him another minute of being eaten alive by the kikaiku. All right, stop, Kami please stop. It is Orochimaru. Our cage is Orochimaru. Why did he order you to capture the daimyo's niece? Itachi followed up. I don't know. The daimyo refused to work with him. That's all I know, I swear. Atoni was break down crying as the pain from his wounds occupied his senses. Where is Odogakor? Naruto asked, hoping he may get an answer in this lifetime. It isn't a village. It is a series of underground bases. I only know where my base was located. Atoni answered instantly this time. Where is that? Itachi asked, taking control once again. Near Paddy Village, a quarter mile to the west. Look for the twin rocks with a genjutsu covering a metal hatch. Atoni answered, pleading for a merciful death at this point. Shino, let your bugs feast, but make it quick. Itachi stood from his crouched position and looked dispassionately down at the human scum in front of him. The trio walked back toward the rest stop while Atoni's screams filled the desert air. Everything went silent just before they entered the shelter. Each Shinan of Team 8 felt their adrenaline fade and then their mouths turned sour. To the side of the building, three Shinan were puking their guts out. Naruto because he had never tortured anyone before, and it was gruesome, Hinata and Shino because those were their first kills and it finally caught up to them as their adrenaline faded. 
Itachi made a note to pull his team aside and address how to properly deal with the weight of a first kill. After checking to make sure the women received basic medical attention, Naruto took out his communication scroll and wrote a message to Tamari. Hey beautiful, ran into trouble a rest stop 33. Wind Daimyo's niece rescued from auto ninjas. Multiple rape victims, requesting medical team. We'll take direct route to Suna, meet us on the way. Send message to Hodo that his niece is okay. Yours, Naruto Naruto pocketed his communication scroll and returned his attention to the group. Hinata was applying some medical salves to the women that were raped, luckily it was only the attendants that caught the worst of it. Naruto cautiously approached the sobbing teenage girl that he recognized from pictures. Heya, princess, I have some new clothes for you if you need them. Are you okay? He said in a gentle voice. She looked up through teary and weary eyes that met Naruto's azure blues. You, you are Naruto Senju. Uncle Hodo talks about you all the time. Naruto noticed that life was returning to her eyes a bit as he distracted her. Oh yeah? What's that old man want with me? I haven't seen him since my 10th birthday. A flicker of irritation crossed her face, he told me that I need to marry you for the good of wind country. It is all he ever talks about. As if realizing she overshared, she blushed and looked away abashedly. Naruto chuckled but spoke in a tone that kept the conversation between them. Yes, I know. He has sent more than a few marriage proposals to my grandmother. No offense, I don't need old people choosing who I'm going to be with for the rest of my life. I forgot to catch your name. Though. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck abashedly and offered the princess a copy of his jacket to cover her modesty. It's Kiyami, the one ST princess of the Land of Wind, she said proudly as she accepted the offered jacket and covered her ripped top. Why didn't you even agree to meet me? Then you could have decided for yourself if I was marriage material instead of leaving it to the old farts, Naruto chuckled, well, Princess Kiyami, I didn't want to put you in that awkward situation and I kind of already have a girlfriend. I have loved her since I was a little kid. Kiyami cocked an eyebrow, life and confidence fully returned by the playful conversation with the handsome blonde. Oh ho? And who is the lucky lady? Subaku no Tamari Naruto answered calmly. Kiyami frowned at that, you would choose that tomboy over a princess like me? Naruto smiled genuinely, every day of the week. That tomboy is the shell for a soft, genuine and amazing girl. I am not dismissing your beauty or worth, but I have loved Tamari since I was six. Kiyami's frown deepened as the unfamiliar feeling of jealousy swept over her. Itachi pulled Naruto away from the conversation and informed him that they would be moving out soon. Naruto let him know that Suna should be sending a protective and medical detail. Itachi put Naruto on point, since he knew the desert better. After burning the bodies and sealing the heads of the two Otto Shinobi, Naruto led his team and the princess entourage toward Suna. After traveling at a slow pace for three hours, two teams of Suna Shinobi landed near Team 8 and one of their blonde Kunoichi darted over to Naruto and tackled him onto the desert sands. Playful and flirtatious laughs reached everyone's ears as the pair tumbled around in the desert sands. A man with half his face covered by a sand veil stepped forward and talked to Itachi. The second Suna team began inspecting the women of the group and ensuring the safety of the daimyo's niece. Kiyami watched Naruto roll in the sand with Tamari with more than a little jealousy on her face. Every girl in Wind Country wanted him after all of the good he had done for Suna's people, and now she wanted him too. Now that he wasn't just a name coming out of her greedy uncle's mouth, she really wanted him. She stomped over to the flirting and sand-covered duo and stood over them. Ahem, she said in a very fake attempt at clearing her throat. Naruto looked up with his back pinned to the sand and flashed a smile. How can we help you, princess? Kiyami blushed and Tamari barely suppressed a scowl. In a proper tsundere tone, Kiyami responded, Are you not supposed to be protecting me? You should be grateful that I accept a foreigner as my guard. Yet, you flirt shamelessly with another woman right in front of me. Tamari shot a confused look at Naruto, who shrugged innocently before reversing their positions and pulling a squealing Tamari up by her waist. As the flirtatious banner continued, Kayama adopted a pouty posture and started tapping her foot on the sand. Tamari made a show of ignoring the spoiled princess and leaned into Naruto before planting a fiery kiss on his lips. This caused Kiyami to humph. In frustration and jealousy. Sadly, it also nearly drove Hinata to tears. The Hyuga heiress didn't understand why Tamari got the man she wanted. She also had conflicting feelings because she felt like Naruto was cheating on Ino, one of her good friends. She knew she was missing something, but she didn't know what and jealousy filled that void very quickly. Naruto felt her sadness leaking off her and ceased the playful flirtation, casting a careful glance at Hinata. Across the dune, back where the Suna teams originally landed, Gara watched stoically as his best friend got reunited with his sister. 
It was a great feeling for Gara to see such a thing, but it made him feel like he was missing something in his life. As that thought flittered across his mind, he noticed something sparkling amongst the dunes. A single glittering tear had caught the sunlight and garnered Gara's attention as the beautiful Hyuga heiress cried over the rejection of her feelings. Gara had a heart-stopping moment as his heart beat one particularly strong beat, urging him forward to prevent the shedding of more precious tears. Gara disappeared from his spot in a sand sunshine and appeared next to Hinata. Hinata was lost in her emotions, failing to suppress that bitterness of rejection that was overwhelming her spirit, crushing her heart and wringing tears from her ducks. She was so lost, that she was surprised when a tender finger trailed up her cheeks and caught a tear before it could fall. Gara held the tear up on his pointer finger, letting it glisten in the light of the desert sun. He knew Hinata well and he knew of her feelings for Naruto. Hell, Naruto had told him of her feelings as well as his reason for rejecting them. He believed that they would be better as friends than lovers. The seed that Naruto planted in Gara's mind was finally beginning to sprout as the words came to his mouth and left his lips in a soft tone. There is no reason for a girl such as you to spill tears in a place such as this. He paused her to dry the tears off of her other cheek. I know why you cry, Hinata, and I know it is painful. Know that I am here for you, and if you promise to keep a secret, know that my heart is drawn to you. In time, my hope is that you may consider my feelings once you have processed your own. Hinata was blown away, completely dumbstruck by the affectionate actions of the usually stoic Gara. She had always liked him as a friend, whenever she had time to spend with him during the study sessions or at the academy. She leaned into Gara and noticed that the sand armor normally protecting him disintegrated to let her truly fall into his embrace. Thank you, Gara. You have been a good friend and I will consider your words. Once I have processed my feelings, I will let you know, she said before moving her head upwards to let him see a soft and genuine smile on her face. That is all I could ask for, Hina Haim, Gara whispered, completely blown away by his own display of affections. Up in Kami's realm, Kushina was snickering as Kami enacted a bit of divine intervention. Minato sighed and face palmed himself. Kami-sama, was that necessary? Must you intervene in such matters? Minato sighed out wearily. Humph. I am Kami and that Hyuga girl is a great girl. I support your son's decision and I do not wish to see her in pain. Kami shot back passionately. He he, let it go, Minato. So, Kami-chan, if you intervene for this, what will you do for my son's two loves? Kushina asked with interest. Kami's energy seemed to disperse rapidly, and she tapped a finger to her chin and thought. Do you too approve of him having two loves? I know that his memories and feelings transferred over, and I admit that it has been super cute to watch, but I feel like I am doing an injustice to the women of the world. Minato shot a thumbs up at the goddess and Kushina giggled. Kami-chan, I approve. His feelings are genuine, and it is not out of lust. Let's set the limit at two and you can give him a divine spanking if he breaks that rule. Minato hummed in thought for a bit, hmm, what about the alter egos? They are each getting into relationships as well, Kami giggled, oh, I know, it is so much fun to watch. The first ever person with MPD that can make clones and transform them. Kukaku, it is better than any of those old American or Korean dramas that I watched. So, you are okay with them? Minato asked hesitantly. Oh, Minato-kun, I cannot tell you how much fun I am having with this. With you two to helping me with paperwork, I even feel like dabbling. You know, my old friend Yahweh, used to appear to people in dreams. Oh, yes, Kukaku. Kushina got a mischievous look on her face, okay, Kami-chan, spill. Kami waved a playful finger in front of her face. Ah, 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 Kushi-chan. It will be a surprise. Back in the desert, the Suna and Konoha teams had arrived at the front gates of Tsunagakor. Team 8 was escorted to the Kaze Kage's tower alongside their new charge, Princess Kiyami. The princess spent the better part of the journey glaring at Tamari and Naruto, since the two had traveled hand in hand pretty much the whole way. After hearing her uncle talking about the blonde for years, something inside her turned possessive of the blonde, especially since he saved her and protected her modesty. Kiyami simply didn't know how to inject herself in between the duo without coming off like a spoiled princess. Surely her uncle would back her up if she claimed him as her own, right? Shaking off those thoughts, it was far too late for her to act now that they were walking into the Kaze Kage's tower. Maybe she would try to get some alone time with him in the hotel. The group walked into the Kaze Kage's office to see Rasa with his hands folded over his desk, waiting for the group and watching them enter with an analytical eye. He took in Team 8 and cracked a small smile when he locked eyes with Naruto. He watched Itachi step forward with a scroll from the Hokage. Lord Kaze Kage, Team 8 reporting from Konoha to deliver the invitations to the Chunin exams coming to Konoha. 
Also, the communication scrolls between yourself and the Hokage has been prepared, after discussing the rescue of the Wind Princess, we can get that set up. Very well, Kiami, it is good to see you safe. I will up our patrols of the rest stops, they seem to attract more bandits than we are used to. You have my apologies that something so egregious happened within our territory. Rasa inclined his head slightly to the princess. After that, he got the report from Team 8 and agreed to pay them an A-ranked mission for rescuing the princess. Those scum knew we were traveling and where we would be, Lord Kazekage. They were not simply bandits. Thankfully, Lord Senju was able to make it in time before any harm befell my person or modesty. I would like to reward Lord Senju with a private dinner to demonstrate my gratitude, if you could arrange for that to happen, Kiyami said in a sweet voice, completely ignoring the growl coming from Tamari. Internally, she was patting herself on the back at her genius maneuver. Rasa shot an apologetic look at Tamari and Naruto before responding. That sounds reasonable. Will the invite be extended to the whole of Team 8? It sounds like each of them played a key role in your impromptu rescue. Kiyami stuttered for a bit then found her solution. My father will be sure to reward them. Lord Senju was the one that prevented my attacker and comforted me afterward. I do not believe I am asking too much. Naruto gave a squeeze to Tamari's hand and mouth that he loved her. Thank you, Princess, I humbly accept your invitation. What time should I pick you up tonight? Naruto just wanted to get this over with, so it wasn't hanging over Tamari's head. Kiyami blushed before she frowned, Forgive me, Naruto. I am not presentable after my journey through the desert. Why don't we schedule our date for tomorrow at 6 p.m.? Kiyami pushed through her slip up, despite the rise in key from Tamari. A crack appeared in Naruto's smile as Kiyami used the word date, knowing exactly how that would set Tamari off. Unfortunately, he was the Senju heir and needed to play the political game as much as, if not more than, Tamari. Very well, Princess. I will pick you up from your hotel at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Kiyami turned on her heel and began exiting the office, Lord Kazekage, thank you for your hospitality and assistance. I will be sure to put a good word in with my uncle. With that, she left the Kazekage's office with a skip in her step and Naruto's jacket. The incredibly awkward atmosphere Kiyami left behind was broken by Konkuro, always dependable for some comedic relief. Well, sis, that's what you get for dating hero boy. Konkuro's screams and Rasa's sighs filled the office for the next five minutes. By the time Rasa was able to call Tamari off, Konkuro was huddled in a corner in the fetal position with multiple bumps appearing all over his body. The Konoha team, aside from Naruto, watched the spectacle with a mortified amusement. Rasa coughed to get back on track. All right, Naruto, if you would walk me through activating the communication scroll. Itachi, your team will be hosted at the Senju extension to our mansion. The letter says you will return with the applications of the teams we will be sending. I should have that ready in five days after I speak with my counsel and Jonin sensei. Rasa began, but Itachi stepped forward, implying that he had something to add. Rasa inclined his head and listened. During interrogation, we found out that the thugs were led by two shinobi from Otogakor. Their new hidden village is being led by Orochimaru, the snake Sanin. Have you had any dealings with him recently or has he approached you? The reason I ask is because it sounded like the kidnapping attempt was due to a prior refusal. Itachi explained calmly. No, I have not been approached. I would ask Hodo if the snake reached out to him. At the very least, it sounds like he refused him. Naruto, I will commission a couple communication scrolls for me and other nobles throughout Wind Country if this trial run with the Hokage proves effective. You only need but ask, Papa Rasa. Now, my team needs a shower, badly. So, if your children could show them to the mansion, I would be more than happy to run through the communication scroll set up with you. Naruto ignored the cocked eyebrows for his nickname, but Rasa merely chuckled. That night in the Kazekage mansion, Team 8 joined Rasa and his family for dinner after they cleaned up. Tamari was all over Naruto, constantly reminding him that they needed to talk. Thus, the two found themselves on the roof of the Kazakage mansion looking at the stars. Twinkling in the night sky. Tamari was leaned back into Naruto's lap as the two finally got some alone time. Did you really have to accept her shameless attempt at getting a date out of you? Tamari pouted for the millionth time that night. We have been over this, Mari. It will be a dinner and a walk around the village. Nothing more, nothing less. She has nothing on you, my desert lily, Naruto whispered soothingly into her ear. Gah, fine, whatever. So, when are you going to tell me everything? Tamari said with a pout. Ha ha, nice change of topic. We can do it now, it will take about 30 minutes, and it will knock you out though. Naruto answered her, getting her to squirm with anticipation. Hmm, 
Ten more minutes of cuddle time and then we can do it in my room. Tamari snuggled deeper into Naruto's embrace and laid her head on his chest, knowing nothing more needed to be said. Naruto enjoyed his cuddle time before things would change with Tamari for better or worse. The walked off the room and onto Tamari's balcony before Naruto kissed Tamari passionately and had her lay on the bed. His tone was full of worry and anticipation as he prepared her for the memory overload. No matter what, Mari, know that I love you and that will never change, Naruto said in between kisses. Tamari was worried, but she knew she would have her answers now. I love you too, Ruto. Now stop freaking me out and get this over with. Naruto withdrew the last memory seal from Kami and placed it on Tamari's forehead. He watched her eyes roll up back into her head and he saw them flitter as vivid and not so pleasant memories of a past long forgotten surged through her head. The twitches and eye movement stopped nearly 20 minutes later and Tamari was out cold, resting comfortably on Naruto's chest. Naruto had dozed off, waiting for Tamari to reawake, when she finally gasped and sat up suddenly in bed around 3 a.m. She shook this sleepiness out of Naruto and looked at him with wide eyes, not fully believing what she saw. One look into Naruto's eyes let her know that it was 100% real, and it was not a prank. Holy shit, Ruto. Kami? For real? Was how Tamari opened the conversation. Yes, I failed Tamari. Everyone died and the bastard Uchiha brought the end of the world with his foolish pride. Now you know why I was so set on helping Suna though, Naruto whispered back, his tone lacking the usual confidence. So, all of that was real? The war, the deaths, our love, my death? She said disbelievingly. Yes. Did you see anything after your death? Naruto asked. I saw you fight, I saw the end and I saw bits and pieces of you and the Yamanaka girl. After your death, I was so broken, Mari. I had lost hope, but everyone still needed me. I never stopped loving you, but I loved, and still love, Ino. Tamari bit her lower lip and thought about her next response. So, how do you see this working, moving forward? She asked timidly. Naruto sighed, rubbed his eyes and sent a prayer to Kami. Would it be too much to ask you to share my heart with Ino? I swear on the Uzumaki and send you names that I will take no other. I have tortured myself with these thoughts ever since I returned to Konoha, and my heart can't choose. To do so would destroy me, Mari. It hurt bad enough pushing aside Hinata's feelings before giving her a chance this go around. A tear fell down Tamari's cheek and landed on Naruto's hand. He wiped the tears and forced the guilt down doing everything he could to provide support to the woman he loves. Am I, am I not enough for you? Naruto wrapped her tighter and pulled her into his chest before whispering into her ear. It is not like that, Tamari. I if I had no memories of my past life, I would have been more than happy to spend my life with you and you alone. I simply can't move past the past. These feelings in my heart won't go away and if I am being honest, I don't want them to go away. I, I love you, Ruto. I need to think about this and process everything she whispered while fixing her gaze on her feet. I understand. I will give you your space. Let me know when you are ready to talk. Naruto kissed her on the top of her head and left her room. He knew he wouldn't get much sleep, but he forced himself to try. He would probably end up going into the mindscape and talking it out with his family there. Tamari tossed and turned all night, trying to make up for the absence of Naruto's warmth with her usual body pillow. It proved to be a pathetic substitute and she tossed and turned all night, tormented by the choice that Naruto left her with. That night, elsewhere in the elemental nations, Kami made her move, appeared in a blonde girl's bedroom, and sent some very vivid dreams to the Konoha blonde beauty that we all love. Vivid dreams and haunting memories filled her mind as she struggled to wrap her subconscious mind around the meaning of the dreams. The only thing Ino knew is that those weren't mere dreams. They were way too vivid, and she remembered them too clearly for them to be dreams. The fact that they almost always came from Naruto's perspective and the fact that they both looked older didn't escape her notice. She missed her blonde bundle of sunshine, and she knew that she would have to talk this out with him when he returned from Suna. The next day, Naruto took his team around Suna and showed them some of the improvements made to the sand village. With water came life, and with life came spirit for Sunagakor. Rather than the same, dull, sand-colored buildings, there were now a myriad of colors that the people of Suna used to express their individuality. The team marveled at the giant lake in the middle of Suna and the green park in the middle of the desert that surrounded the lake. Naruto took this opportunity to share another one of his many secrets with his teammates. He demonstrated his Makutan bloodline by growing a big maple tree in a spot he had discussed with one of Suna's engineers earlier in the day. Then teammate took a dip in Suna's lake and enjoyed their time much more than they thought they would. Gara and Konkuro joined the Konoha team, assisting Naruto as tour guides. 
Naruto noticed Gara's longing looks at Hinata and he gave his brother the push needed to make a move. At the lake, Gara worked up the nerve to ask Hinata out for a dinner date, with some prodding from Naruto. To his surprise, Hinata accepted his offer, but he was confused by the sad smile on her face. Naruto pulled him aside when they returned to the Kazekage mansion and gave him the rundown and his express approval. Their relationship would do nothing but good for the two of them and the alliance. Naruto put on some decent clothes and went on the date with Kiyami. He indulged her a little bit but kept things strictly platonic. He didn't miss Tamari's scowl when he left the compound or the fact that she was waiting up for him when he returned. He told her that he had been a perfect gentleman with Kiyami, who was swooning over him the entire time. He made her giggle when he told her how he rebuffed Kiyami's advances, especially when he told her how he spun out of an attempted goodnight kiss. There was still a definite tension between Naruto and Tamari. It seemed like she hadn't come up with her answer yet, so Naruto spent the night after the date hanging out with Team 8 and the San Sibs. Naruto gave her a kiss on the cheek before retiring to his own bedroom for the night. Once again, he was condemned to tossing and turning for his perceived selfish actions. Thoughts of losing one or both of his blonde loves haunting his thoughts and staving off the Sandman's advances. Tamari was in a similar state to Naruto until she cried out in frustration, threw her body pillow against the wall and stomped out of her room. She made her way silently into Naruto's room and climbed into his bed. He was still awake, but he didn't protest or ask her why she was there. He simply lifted up the covers and let her snuggle into him. Both of them found peace in the other's presence and instantly drifted off into a truly contented sleep. The next day, Rasa had an unexpected, yet entirely welcome, visitor enter his office. He stopped what he was doing and immediately signaled his dust to clear the room when he saw the serious look on Naruto's face. What's going on my boy? It is rare to see you look so serious. Rasa asked with a clear interest in his tone. Naruto took a deep breath and stiffened his posture before bowing to Rasa. Lord Kaze Kage, I, Naruto Senju Uzumaki, humbly request your blessing to ask Tamari to marry me. I know we are young, but I am sure. Without her, my soul is incomplete and my life lacks meaning. Rasa smiled and stood up to walk around his desk, about time, kiddo. Does your grandmother know? We have discussed it, but she chose to leave it up to me. I will inform her upon my return to Konoha. Before you accept it so readily, I will tell you that I plan on taking one other wife in the future. I have explained this to Tamari, and it falls under one of those things that I must ask you to trust me on. Rasa paused but kept his hand on Naruto's shoulder. It wasn't strange and he was more than ready for this situation, but as always, the blonde intrigued him. And Tamari is okay with that? She took a full day to think it over, but she gave me her answer last night. I swear, Papa Rasa, I will never hurt your daughter. I would sooner rip my own heart out of my chest before I did so. Rasa lifted Naruto's chin and looked into his eyes. I know, my boy, I know. You have my blessing. That night, Naruto took Tamari out for a date on the town and broke out all the stops. He spoiled her silly and ended the night on the walls of Suna, gazing out into the clear night sky of the Suna desert. Once again, the two were cuddled up after a perfect date and they were whispering sweet nothings in between makeout sessions. Suddenly, Naruto broke the kiss and backed away from Tamari. As she opened her eyes, she saw him down on one knee and holding a diamond ring with a beautiful golden band. Subaku no Tamari, my desert lily, you now know all of my deepest and darkest secrets. If you didn't know already, you are an integral part of my soul and I want nothing more than to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you do me the honor of marrying me? Naruto said in a shaky tone. Tamari froze on her knees with her hands over her mouth as her mind processed the engagement ring and her love down on one knee. A small gust of wind spurred her into action, and she blurred forward and slammed her lips into Naruto's. The kiss was passionate and lasted for an indefinite amount of time before Tamari broke the kiss and whispered into his ear while hugging him tightly. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. In this life, the next and however many more it takes. Happiness spread through Naruto's body and trees began growing on the outer walls of Suna. The overflowing positive energy manifested itself through Naruto's bloodline and that particular overwatch on the Suna wall would provide shade to Suna's defenders for years to come. Naruto leaned back into the newly emerged tree truck and Tamari leaned back into him. That one moment provided some desperately needed healing to Naruto as Tamari's piece of his soul finished merging with the rest, leaving an unblemished and shining light in the depths of his being. In Kami's realm, a red-headed woman was running all over the place and shouting with joy. A blonde man was chasing behind her and attempted to subdue the red-headed beauty while a goddess watched on with a truly amused gaze. Congratulations my chosen one. The ethereal whisper speed across her realm and spread a sense of peace, contentment and fulfillment. 
returned to Konoha and rode to Chunin exams, Naruto enjoyed the rest of his time with Tamari, although they only shared the engagement details with her brothers and father for the time being. Inter-village marriages were very rare due to the risk of village secrets escaping the confines of a village and they needed to be handled delicately. Rasa prepared a marriage contract and gave it to Naruto to give to Tsunade but stressed that it was to remain in the family until the time was right. He also made hints that said right time would be during the Chunin exams before he ruffled Naruto's hair and pulled him into a hug as he wished him a safe journey. Gara actually showed emotion when Naruto and Tamari told him and Konkuro about the engagement. All of Gara's sand armor crumbled to the floor and he wrapped his sister and soon-to-be official brother in a tight hug. Konkuro was crying happy tears as he joined the hug, which was a sorry sight as many streaks appeared in the purple makeup, I mean war paint. It was a moment filled with so much brightness that it would eternally be etched into Naruto's soul as a source of strength during the struggles to come. Speaking of Gara, with encouragement from Naruto, he took Hinata on a simple date to a Dengo diner and then he took her to the lake. Of course, Naruto, Tamari, Konkuro and Shino spied on the date, wanting to make sure they had a good time and provide tips after the date ended. Unfortunately, Konkuro was about as stealthy as Rock Lee when he was in a conversation with Mike Guy. The bumbling puppeteer was caught almost immediately and Hinata activated her Byakugan and pointed out the rest of the spectators. The sand hand spanking no jutsu left Naruto, Tamari and Konkuro with red behinds as Gara threatened his family with a sand burial if they didn't give him and Hinata privacy. Naruto played it off with a laugh and was relieved to see that this actually served as an icebreaker for the duo. It also gave Naruto an opportunity to transform several shadow clones that would take over spy duty as the original retreated to the Kazekage mansion with the others. Gara returned to the mansion that night with a smile fixed on his face and a blushing Hinata. He wouldn't share any details, but Naruto's clones had already dispelled and showed that Gara received a small kiss on his cheek for a great date. This let Naruto breathe easier knowing that this would help transition Hinata into more of a best friend zone than a one-sided love interest. He was also extremely happy for his brother, remembering that Gara was never able to settle down and find a proper girl in his previous life. At the gates, Tamari had shamelessly laid her public claim on Naruto with a fiery kiss and a playful smack on his firm ass. She told Naruto that she would write every night and she would be waiting for him. She also gave him a letter to pass on to Ino whenever Naruto had the talk with her. She had come to grips with sharing Naruto with another and she just wanted to start off on the right foot with the flower girl. The trip back was uneventful, except for some light teasing of Hinata, and teammate returned to Konoha three days after leaving Suna. They reported into the Hokage, who had already received messages from Rasa concerning the impromptu rescue of the Wind Princess. They received their C&A rank missions pay before they were given the week off. Itachi informed his team that they would still do their joint training sessions in preparation for the Chunin exams coming up next month. When Naruto returned to the Senju compound, he found Sonate and Shizun waiting for him. He couldn't hide the shit-eating grin that was plastered on his face and both women squealed in delight for him finally making things official with Tamari. Sonate signed the marriage contract and told Naruto that she would take it to the council for approval before the Chunin exams. They then sat Naruto down and made him spill all the details of the mission as well as his date with Tamari. After hearing about the proposal, Shizun got a dreamy look in her eyes. When Naruto asked how things were going with York, she got an excited look and told Naruto that Tazuna, Tsunami, Inari, Kaisa, York and Himawari would be staying with them during the Chunin exams. She was hoping for a dreamy proposal like what Naruto pulled off with Tamari. She had been talking with York about moving to Konoha, or vice versa but they were both tied to their respective villages for the time being. Tsunade just listened to the romantic exchanges of Shizun and Naruto and sighed wistfully. She looked down at her truly younger body and wondered when some man would come and sweep her off her feet. She had considered Jiraiya, and immediately shelved the idea. She remembered a couple drunk and passionate nights with Rasa, but now their children were due to be married. She decided to focus on Naruto, the hospital and preventing the end of the world for now, and if some knight in shining armor came, then she would deal with it as it came. They had returned on a Monday, so Naruto knew that the other Janan teams would be doing their own things for a while. He sent clones out to let the Jonin Sensais know that they were invited to join him for CrossFit tomorrow morning and evening. He winced as the clone's memories hit him, especially the clone that was forcibly dispelled by a slap on the back from Guy. That dude was a beast, and he truly didn't know his own strength. Furthermore, the resistance seal training had amplified his speed and strength even further and he was a complete monster now a monster that was like Superman on red kryptonite. Naruto spent the night exchanging wishy-washy messages with his new fiancé. Tamari had jumped feet first into expressing her emotions since Naruto's proposal. 
The usually tough exterior was no more as Tamari no longer held up any walls in his presence. It was a beautiful feeling, being able to trust her completely again, body and soul. Naruto fell asleep dreaming of the nights he would have with her during the Chunin exams, nights that she promised all limiters would be off. He woke up the next morning and set up the equipment for a fun CrossFit session. Among the fitness community, it was commonly agreed upon that certain workouts were more fun than others. Naruto was one such believer and as such he decided to have a workout including all of his favorite exercises, hang cleans, deadlifts, bench press, military press, squats and they would end it with a wall sit competition. It was great seeing teams 8, 9 and 10 working out together again and everyone enjoyed the workout session. The wall sit competition was held in an escalating gravitational field that would make the exercise more difficult every minute. Naruto, Guy, Lee and Kuji were the only ones remaining on the wall after 10 minutes in 5 times normal gravity. Their legs were all shaking like leaves in a storm and burning like Hitler in the 9th circle of hell. Despite that, they all had maddening grins on their faces as they refused to give up. The 11th minute hit and gravity went to 5.5 times and took Kuji out of the competition. Lee began proclaiming about flames of youth and then he collapsed at 11 minutes and 39 seconds. Naruto was left alone against Might Guy, who flashed a smile when the clock hit 12 minutes. Coincidentally, the blinding flash from Guy's teeth made Naruto lean away and his legs could no longer support his weight. He fell to the ground, rubbing out his legs as Guy tried to jump up and thrust his fist into the air in victory. His exclamations were cut off as his legs gave out and he collapsed in a heap next to Naruto. As the groups were cleaning up the equipment, Ino approached Naruto. Um, Ruto, I really need to talk to you about something. She began hesitantly. Naruto dropped the metal disc with weight seals in a pile on top of a scroll and turned to look into Ino's eyes. The cool blue was wavering in confusion and, fear. Naruto walked forward and took her hands in his. As Naruto tenderly took her hand, yet another memory made itself known to Ino. Flashback, eight months before the end, Naruto just got through another tough counseling session with Ino Yamanaka. The blonde-haired beauty was the last of her clan on the resistance side and she was helping Naruto deal with the trauma of losing Tamari, among other things. Naruto was about to leave her office when he felt slender hands gripping his right hand tenderly. Um, Naruto, how would you like to visit Ichiraku's? I think I would like to spend some time with you as a friend rather than a therapist. Her voice wavered with uncertainty. Naruto turned fully and took Ino's hands in his own, I would like that, Ino. You were always there for me, let me be here for you. The memory continued, showing their first date, the stroll on the wall around Suna, the first time they stargazed together and their first kiss. End of flashback, Ino took a deep breath as her consciousness returned to this world and her eyes became clearer, but the wavering and uncertain depth stayed. Naruto shared the flashback with her, but he was instantly able to recognize it as a memory from his past. Naruto placed a hand on her shoulder and shunshin them to the Hokage Monument, where he sat her down on top of his father's head. He pulled her in close in a one-armed embrace. How much did you see? He asked, short and to the point. Ino looked up at him as her head remained fixed against his shoulder. You know what I saw? Those dreams, they weren't dreams, were they? Naruto looked up into the sky, not knowing whether to kiss or curse Kami. As beautiful, Ethereal Whisper said she would prefer the latter, but Naruto shook it off to return his attention to Ino. Look, Ino, since my boss decided to share those memories with you, it means it is probably okay for me to tell you everything. Are you sure you want to know? Ino lifted her head and created some space from Naruto. She put her hands on his toned chest and looked into his endless azure depths. Do you love me? More than you'll ever know. Then tell me everything, she whispered, breaking eye contact and leaning her head on his chest. Naruto began recounting a summary of events, holding nothing back. Ino listened in rapt attention, laughing, crying, screaming and questioning the events of the past. She held Naruto through it all, never letting their contact break, never wanting to be separated from his warmth again. After an hour or so, with Konoha in full spring, Naruto's tale came to a close. Wow, Ino gasped. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly, yeah. Ino fidgeted her 13-year-old mind trying to process the memories and meanings of the past hour. So, we um, we um, were lovers, Naruto whispered, and Ino blushed and nodded her head. Yes, you were the last love of my previous life. After Tamari died, you brought me back from the brink. We were together for eight of so months and you were the only reason I continued fighting. And you still love me, even if I, even in this body? She asked, blushing furiously. Naruto lifted her chin and placed a tender kiss on her lips. 
I am grateful that I get to experience our love from this age. I already know what an amazing woman you grow up to be, so I am simply enjoying you as you are. And, I have to share you with Tamari? Naruto nodded, okay, that's weird, but there are worse things. Does she know about me? Naruto nodded again and placed a kiss on her lips. And she is okay with it? Naruto pulled out Tamari's letter and handed it to Ino, before pulling her deeper into their embrace. Yes, I know it is not fair, but seeing you both alive again I couldn't bring myself to make the choice. I am far too weak for that. Ino cocked an eyebrow, you? Weak? PSH, yeah right, Naruto laughed, I don't think you saw my earlier memories, but when I was this age last go around, I was a small runt with little to no shinobi training. I ran around in an orange jumpsuit, I was loud and abrasive, and you were a Sasuke fangirl. For most of my life, I was weak Ino. Sure, I have made a lot of changes this time around, but I have never forgotten what it felt like to be too weak to protect the ones I love. Ino smiled at that and placed a loving kiss on his lips. Well, this time around will be different. Why you ask? Because you have me, she said with false bravado in a sincere and funny manner. Naruto leaned forward and spun on top of Ino, placing his knee in between her thighs. In a husky whisper, he leaned into her ear and said, I am counting on that. I love you, Ino Yamanaka. The two engaged in a liplock that lasted for Kami knows how long. Well, Kami did know how long, but she didn't feel like sharing that information with mere mortals. She simply smiled down on the blonde couple, strumming her fingers together as the changes she made provided more entertainment for her whimsical fancies. Minato and Kushina just sweat dropped at the sweet and semi-evil chuckling they could hear coming from the goddess office. Hokaye's office, one week before Chunin exams, Hiruzen had called all his Jonin into his office for a meeting that would serve two purposes. One, he would learn which Jonin sensei would nominate their teams for the Chunin exams. Two, he would share information he recently received and put them all on high alert. A week ago, he received a message from the neighborhood watch telling him that a certain snake would attempt to infiltrate the Chunin exams. He had already received notification that a Jinan team from Odogakor would be attending, and he formed a plan to smoke the snake out. As all of his Jonin and Anbu arrived, Hiruzen was pleasantly surprised to see Kakashi standing there in the front row reading his little orange book. That meant that he could begin the meeting. He channeled Chakra into the privacy array that Naruto installed on his desk and began. Alright, thank you for coming. I will start with the serious news first before I will let you nominate Jinan teams for the Chunin exams. First, I received some concerning information from the neighborhood watch. I still do not know who they are or why they sporadically offer information, but we cannot afford to ignore this in the event that it is true. Shikaku Nara, who had been informed immediately upon receiving the letter, spoke up. Before the Hokage shares this information, we cannot afford to let our enemies know that we are onto them. Preliminary protective measures have been taken, but we are hosting four of the great five and cannot afford to cancel the exams. Kakashi looked up from his book. What has you two so spooked, Lord Hokage? Orochimaru. That one word caused a stir amongst the Jonin present. After the room calmed down, the Hokage explained, we have it on good authority that Orochimaru will attempt to infiltrate the Chunin exams. For what purpose, we don't know. What we do know is that Orochimaru is the leader of the new hidden village of Odogakor. Team 8 found this out after foiling a kidnapping attempt of the wind daimyo's niece. Otogakor is sending on team to the exams, and if I know my student, which I do, he will be nearby. We will use this opportunity to trap and eliminate Orochimaru. Shikaku took the floor once again. The information we received was limited, but we have no reason to doubt it. We have buffed up our security measures and we will remain on alert. He is a crafty enemy, and we cannot afford to miss our shot when the time is right to take it. What is important is not tipping him off that we are onto him. Since we know the format of the exams, I would say that he will reveal himself and make his move during the second phase of the exam. Hiruzen paused and let the crowd calm down. We traditionally have the second phase in the Forest of Death. We have come up with an alternate exam this time around that will make it so we can easily protect our Jinan rather than let them roam in the Forest of Death. We will disseminate information via Elite Jonin, who will notify you of your teams. For now, that is all we have. Shikaku finished. Now, let us get on to nominations, Hiruzen said with a smile. There were fewer nominations this year, thanks to the threat of Orochimaru. As opposed to the usual 30-plus teams from Konoha, only 18 teams were nominated for the exams. Among those nominated were the rookies, no surprise there. After the Jonin cleared out of his office, Hiruzen turned to Shikaku. Call the clan heads together. We will inform them of this and their roles in the defense of our village. Also, 
Sonade brought me something that they will need to be informed of. Set the time for 6 p.m. tonight. It will be done. Shikaku bowed and disappeared in a shadow sunshine. Council chambers, 6 p.m., Tsunade walked into the council chambers alongside her old sensei. She had forgiven him of the past mistakes and worked to rekindle their previous master-student relationship. She vehemently denied the Hokage position multiple times, reiterating that it should be Itachi for 5th Hokage. She had shared the marriage arrangement with Hiruzen and a rough draft of an updated treaty between Kanahagakor and Tsunagakor was written up, to be approved at the Chunin exam finals. Okay everyone, I have already announced this to the Jonin, but it is necessary that I inform you all now and divide roles, Hiruzen continued to explain what he covered with the Anbu and Jonin. Lord Hokage, the Hyuga are still greatly weakened and most of the previous branch family are not active duty shinobi. That being said, I will have them stationed as lookouts and bowmen. Their Byakugan should be able to identify the traitorous snake. Hyashi offered, hoping to curry some favor and gain back some of the clan's lost honor. Thank you, Hyashi. We will incorporate that idea. I would like to know how the archery classes are going with the clan? Hiruzen replied, wanting to get this part out of the way. The Senju bows, and sealed arrows are magnificent. We can station Hyuga along the walls and provide an effective frontline defense. Those of fighting age are all being trained on the bow and the results are promising. Hyashi boasted. That is good to hear. Coordinate with Fugaku, his police will be working overtime for the foreseeable future. Hiruzen answered before moving on. Fugaku, use the new seals and screen everybody entering my village. Anbu are working to plug up our defenses, but I need you to be my eyes and ears. Fugaku bowed as his chest swelled with pride. It will be done, Lord Hokage. We were already ramping up security. May I request the village provides more of the Senju Truth Seals, Paralysis Seals and I would like to commission a job to protect the police precinct. That sounds reasonable, write up your requests and we will work to complete them. Tsunade answered for the Hokji. Isn't your son participating in the exams? Will he have time to complete such extensive orders? Inoiki asked. Tsunade scoffed, my son isn't worried about the exams. He is spending most of his time preparing his peers. If this has village priority, he can make time for it. What of Rias? Wasn't she also a seal mistress? Kuza asked. Tsunade nodded, yes, she is. However, for the bigger jobs and mass production she lacks the chakra supply. Not every seal master can have the QB providing them endless chakra. This drew chuckles from the clan heads. Sensei, can we move on to the next topic? Very well, we will continue to define clan roles and beef up village security. The topic Tsunade wishes to discuss is the marriage contract between Subaku no Tamari and Naruto Senju Uzumaki. This drew loud whispers from the clan heads, but it was Tsume that spoke up first. So, the pup went outside the village and found himself a girl? What was wrong with the girls we have in our village? Tsunade growled, well, if he didn't get chased out of the village, maybe he would have found one of them sooner. Look, this marriage contract comes with an enhanced treaty with Tsuna that will turn them from an ally into a partner. Hyashi spoke, agreeing with Tsume that the Senju bloodline shouldn't be spread outside of Konoha. I do not doubt his feelings, but this is politics, Tsunade. We simply cannot afford for another village to have access to the Senju or Uzumaki bloodlines. Fugaku agreed with his rival for once, I agree with them, Tsunade. There are many girls within my clan that are interested in Naruto. Maybe it would be wise to forget about Tsuna and redirect his attention within the village. Another clan heir can marry the Tsuna princess. Tsunade slammed her fist on the table, smashing it into splinters, and flared her key. Now, listen here and listen well. This is why I didn't want to come back, my grandson is not some village property that you can throw around and pimp out. He would sooner leave Konoha altogether than to leave Tamari. She fixed her gaze on Inoiki. I know you are barred by confidentiality, but you know it is the same story with your daughter. Inoiki hesitated as all the attention was fixed on him. Yamanakas were always good censors, and he could feel the jealousy of the other clan heads clearly. Tsunade is right. I cannot share specifics, but Naruto is the type of person that would never betray those he loves. Make no mistake, his love for Tamari and my daughter runs deep. They are just children. Koharu protested. They don't even know what love is. Tsunade turned her glare on Koharu, and the old woman crumpled to her knees under its weight. It should be noted that Tsunade had been training furiously ever since she figured out the truth of Naruto's past. Upon regaining her youth, her prowess skyrocketed as she prepared herself to face off against the enemies that were sure to come. She was high's rank at this point, probably approaching SS rank soon enough. Do not presume to know or understand my son. 
Do not presume that he is some dog you can control. His heart is his own and I would sooner see Konoha burn than let him be turned into some breeding experiment. This is not a debate, this is not up for discussion, this was a notification. Tsunade growled while sustaining her key. Jiraiya appeared out of nowhere with his hands raised in the air. Now, now, Tsunade, we are not controlling him. We are simply watching out for Konoha's best interest. Something clicked in Tsunade's mind and her key doubled as she turned her head slowly to the Hokage. You told them, she said in a deadly whisper, completely enraged by the betrayal. She saw the guilt in her sensei's eyes and the small amount of trust built up over the past months crumbled away like dust in the wind. I cannot hide something of such significance from my counsel. Hiruzen replied with his voice full of remorse. Tsunade sat down in her seat with her arms crossed. Lord Hokage, Tsunade spat out his title. The Senju clan withdraws the marriage proposal. We must decide where we wish to reside given this new information. Outrage. The shouts of the clan heads crashed against one another and conjoined into an incomprehensible jumble of sounds. It took a full five minutes for anything of importance to be understood. Finally, Hiruzen regained control of the room. Tsunade, please, you can't be serious. Hiruzen pleaded, knowing she had the protection of the Fire Lord. Haim, you cannot do that. Jiraiya got a soul-searing glare for his comment. Lady Tsunade, please, don't do anything rash. Homura pleaded, silence in return. A knock came from the door of the council chamber and the Hokage directed the Anbu to open the door. Naruto walked Kami into the council room and looked at his grandmother. You called, Mama? Naruto asked. I want to leave the village. The old monkey and toad broke our trust. Tsunade growled out. Naruto shrugged, well, can't say I'm surprised. Let me guess, these old goats had a problem with me marrying Tamari? He smiled inside at the outraged looks of offense. He frowned when Tsunade nodded, and he really wished Kurama was in the seal. He needed to talk to his partner, especially since he felt more love for Tsunagakor than Konoha this time around. He turned his icy gaze on the council before he closed his eyes and called on the natural energy around him. He heard the gasps as the sage markings began appearing on his face and emerald orbs glimmered with power and then he flared his aura. A visible, dark green chakra like the color of the dense forest appeared in an aura around him. The presence was choking, filling the air with a power that threw all of their instincts on full alert. Let me make this clear, for those of you that don't understand the position you are in. I am merely attempting to honor my parents' wishes by becoming a shinobi of Konoha. While I harbor no ill will for Konoha, I also harbor little love for it. The only thing actually keeping me here is your children. If you believe you can control me, you can't. If you believe that you can manipulate me, you can't. If you think you can lie to me, you can't. If you think you can threaten the ones I love, I dare you to try. The whole council remained frozen in awe of the overwhelming presence that was subduing them without the slightest trace of killing intent. It was simply raw power. The boy didn't speak menacingly, he spoke calmly and matter-of-factly, which made his presence that much more impactful. It reminded the elders of the council of Hashirama Senju, and they knew they may have pushed too far. Naruto closed his eyes and concentrated on drawing his overwhelming aura back into himself. He stood there, completely still, remaining in sage mode, and his eyes fixed themselves on Jiraiya. Only took you eight months to make it back after the old monkey told you about my sage mode. Tell the toads I don't care what they have to say anymore, I have it under control. Naruto once again kept his calm tone, making Jiraiya dip his head. Naruto, you just said sage mode. Was that not the Kyuubi's power there? Shikaku asked with interest. To provide an answer, Naruto reached into the seal and drew on the nearly limitless chakra of Kurama. It was harder to control without Kurama's presence in the seal, but he could still handle it. His body was strong enough to take up to five tails now, but he wouldn't need that much of the chakra to make his point. He pulled out three tails of the untamed chakra and watched as his tailed chakra cloak erupted out of his body. The presence of the sage chakra balanced out the ominous feeling of Kurama's chakra, but it still carried a menacing presence. He opened his eyes and provided a truly unique sight to the council. His eyes were still a glowing emerald green, but they had blood-red edges around the irises with black slits in the middle. The dark green sage marking shifted a bit and turned into a dark red. His canines were extended and poking out of his front lips and his lips darkened to the same color as his markings. Spikes of wood began poking out of the floor and formed a barricade between him and the Anbu that stood protectively in front of the Hokage. He turned his eyes on Shikaku, who flinched under the gaze. Understand this, Naruto began, his voice deeper and raspier due to the effects of the Kyuubi's chakra, I care not for your games. I asked for the Hokage's confidence, and he broke my trust. If you wish for me to remain in this village, 
it is time for him to enjoy his retirement. I will warn you ahead of time, nobody in this room can prevent me or my family from leaving. This may seem extreme to some of you, so demand the old monkey and old cronies tell you everything. It is their fault. Mama, shall we go? Yup, I don't feel like staying in this room any longer. Tsunade answered and walked over to Naruto. The two disappeared from the council chamber in a red flash, which drew gasps from the council. The room disabled the use of sunshine, which meant that technique Naruto just used was, oh, Kami, they fucked up. Back at Senju compound, is that how you really wanted to handle that, mama? Naruto asked, his rage constrained in favor of concern for his mother figure. Tsunade sighed and poured two saucers of sake and handed one to Naruto. No, not really. I didn't want to take it that far. Naruto shrugged, oh well, at least they know they can't stop us. I like the rookies and I will stay, if that is what you want. Tsunade downed her saucer, refilled and repeated. I don't want to bring the headache to Rasa. Honestly, Ruto, now that they know, they will never let it go. We shouldn't have trusted either of them, all they can ever care about is the village. You shouldn't have revealed as much as you did though. Naruto sighed and held out his saucer for a refill, look, mama, I don't really care where we stay. All I care about is having Tamari and Ino there with me. Ever since Kami gave her those memories, she has been even more beautiful than ever. I love them both and as long I have my family in them, I will be happy. I made a show of my power because it was needed to force their hands. For all they know, they have an emotionally unstable Jinchuriki with class abilities that they have royally pissed off. Do you really want Haruzen to retire? Tsunade asked, a blush starting to come to her cheeks thanks to the sake. You know, I was so naive in my first life, and I loved that old man. I simply never realized how much he lied to me or how much he held back from me. Yes, I want him out, especially if Itachi is his replacement. He has the will of fire and is a good man. I would trust him to wield my power for the betterment of the world, especially with the absence of Donzo in this timeline. He used to be a good man, Naruto. I used to trust him with my life. I think losing Buwako broke something in him, Tsunade whispered over the top of her saucer. I know, but he lost his step, and he doesn't fight when he needs to fight. I mean, I can't trust him with anything. If he waited until the Chunin exams, then it wouldn't even be a secret anymore. All this did was demonstrate that we can't trust him. It is actually a blessing in disguise. Naruto answered softly. Back in the council chambers, after a long back and forth debate, and the stories, explanations and attempted justifications from Haruzen, the council began debating again, with a much more somber tone. I normally keep my opinions to myself, as does my clan. Naruto Senju has been a leader of his peers, provided valuable training to my son and has helped my clan develop new breeds of Kikaiku. On top of that, my guess is that he isn't class shinobi. Lord Hokage, it is now clear to me how far in the wrong you are. I, Shibi Abarame, move for a vote of no confidence. Silence followed the Abarame's monologue, accompanied by uncomfortable shifts and sighs. Fugaku stood, I second Shibi. The Sinjis have done nothing but help the village since their return. Their seals are invaluable and have done much to improve the quality of life in the village. My son speaks so highly of the boy, and I have watched his training sessions from time to time. Not to mention, that power he just flaunted was on a level not even you can reach anymore, Hiruzen. Homura stood up, the vote of no confidence has been called. We will now hold a blind vote for the removal of Hiruzen Sarutobi from the position of Hokage. Inoiki stood up, I call for a tandem vote of no confidence for the village elders. It is clear that they are also culpable for the Senju's treatment, especially considering they used to work hand. In hand with Donzo. While their service has been appreciated, I think they should join the Hokage in retirement. Inoiki's motion was immediately approved, and a blind vote was held. It was far easier to throw two old bags of bones under the proverbial wagon than the Hokage, who they all still appreciated. Shikaku Nara, being the second highest ranked shinobi in the village, gathered the ballots from the clan heads. He tallied them up in a stiff silence and finally sighed while muttering something about troublesome blondes. The votes have been tallied. Hiruzen Sarutobi, by unanimous vote of the clan council, you are to be retired from your position as Hokage. We will notify the Fire Lord and ask for his guidance in assigning a new Hokage. Once he approves of your successor, you will have until the Chunin exam finals to announce your retirement. The clan council sees fit to approve your chosen heir, Itachi Uchiha, for position of 5th Hokage, and we will notify Lord Kinji of this. Elder Koharu Yudatane, by unanimous vote of the clan council you are relieved of your position as an elder councillor effective immediately. We thank you for your service and wish you the best in your retirement. Elder Homura, 
by unanimous vote of the clan council you are relieved of your position as an elder councillor effective immediately. We thank you for your service and wish you the best in your retirement, Shikaku said professionally while sounding like it was a complete drag. Hiruzen sighed as his eyes moved to the cracked floor with spikes coming out of it. In light of recent developments, let's call this meeting for the night. I will work toward handing everything over to Itachi and prepare him to assume the role. Let's get this party started. Dash two days later, the Suna contingent arrived in Konoha. They were greeted at the gate by Naruto, Ino, Tsunade, Shizun, Hiruzen, Itachi and the clan heads. Everyone watched as Tamari ran to Naruto and jumped into his arms, giving him a massive and heartwarming hug. Then heads turned when she was set down and walked up to Ino and gave her a hug as well. Multiple heads turned to Inoiki, who made an effort not to make eye contact and whistled innocently. Gara looked around for Hinata and was sad to see that she wasn't there. He felt a hand on his shoulder from Naruto, who was always able to bypass his natural sand armor. He looked up to see his friend cracking a smile. Don't worry, brother, Hinata will be at CrossFit tomorrow. I will send her a clone tonight to tell her to keep her schedule free for team training after our morning workout. Naruto finished with a wink and noticed the smile appearing on the edges of Gara's lips. You know, brother, that Shikaku and I thank Kami for you every time we see you. I thank you for your support in this. Gara answered in a monotone. No problem, she like moon lilies and I will grow some for you before our session tomorrow. The smile fully appeared on Gara's face after hearing Naruto's words. Naruto turned his head toward Rasa and made eye contact. Lord Kazekage, I formally invite you to join us for our workout tomorrow morning and I request a spar, if you are so inclined. Rasa shuddered before he chuckled out loud and responded. Very well, Lord Senju. It would do these old bones well to get a proper workout. The Konoha Council watched how naturally Naruto integrated with the most influential people in Suna. They watched as the Hokage was left by the wayside, further affirming their choice made two nights ago. Tsunade walked forward and embraced Rasa in a genuine hug, she used the embrace to whisper in his ear that they needed to have a serious talk, which got a subtle nod from the stoic Kazekage. Meanwhile, Konkuro looked around, feeling unimportant and lonely, desperately praying to Kami for a girlfriend. After checking in, Naruto and Ino showed Gara. Tamari and Konkuro around the village. They had just left Ichiraku's where the ramen stand had gained another faithful customer in Tamari. They talked about recent events and the missions that they had completed. Naruto's mission record was heavily skewed by the fact that he accepted solo missions from the village for his security seals, explosive seals, etc. However, Naruto was interested to hear that Suna had multiple engagements along their border with Odogakor and noticed Otto's presence in river country as well. Naruto, knowing exactly who was responsible, grew concerned, but Gara informed him that they had the situation well under control and the wind daimyo was firmly against anything to do with Otto. They walked through the village when they were rounding a corner and they ran smack dab into three children that were not looking where they were going. One boy with a blue scarf, ran particularly hard into Konkuro's private parts and had him crumpled over in pain. Hey! Watch where you're going! The brown-haired boy shouted. Naruto was instantly sent into a flash of memories concerning Konohamaru. From his childhood meeting in the Hokaye's office, the training sessions they shared, pranking Ebisu with the sexy no jutsu, all of the small interactions with his student slash apprentice and the appearance of Konohamaru in Suna after the war shifted. Flashback, Suna Gates, six months after Sasuke's betrayal, Naruto was informed by Gara that Konoha Shinobi had shown up at the gates claiming to be there under his protection. Names weren't provided, so Naruto raced to the gate to make sure everything would be okay. As he approached the gates, he felt a few, small chakra signatures that felt familiar. He finished his walk and calmed the gate guards and resistance shinobi down. He was so distracted doing this that he missed three blurs that tackled him in a hug. Big brother. I missed you. I never believed anything they said. Never. Never ever ever, Konohamaru sobbed into Naruto's chest. That's right, boss. We never believed that Uchiha team, Udon shouted as he rubbed his nose on Naruto's sleeve. Moigi was rubbing her cheek into Naruto's shoulder and swooning childishly. I would never betray my boss and one true love. I missed you, Naruto-kun. This threw Naruto for a loop, sure she was only three years younger than him but he never, ever thought of Moigi that way. Naruto stood himself and the three children up as the shinobi around him smiled affectionately. He also noticed that Hanabi, a couple Hyuga branch members and members of the Yamanaka and Nara clans were there with the kids. Shikaku gave him a short wave and a yo which made Naruto break out in happy tears. Don't cry, boss. We are going to kick some butt and make everything better again, Konohamaru shouted while slugging Naruto in the shoulder. 
End of flashback, Naruto snapped back to reality as Konkuro was lifting him up by the scuff of his shirt. He put a firm, yet friendly, hand on Konkuro's wrist. Easy, Kuro, he is just a kid. You are Konohamaru, right? As the boy was set down on his own two feet, he turned and looked at Naruto, instantly recognizing him and pointing at him. You are the senju everyone is talking about, Naruto chuckled and rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. Yup, that's me. Konohamaru scowled, you are the reason grandpa is getting fired. I hate you. He screamed childishly. Yeah, I am sorry about that. You will have to ask your grandpa about it. He did some pretty mean things to me when I was a kid. I am sorry if I hurt your feelings though, would you let me make it up to you? Naruto used his friendliest tone, despite being hurt by Konohamaru's accusation, he really wanted to make things right with him. Naruto's friendliness took all of the piss and vinegar out of Konohamaru, and he looked at Naruto skeptically. Why would you do that, mister? Tamari noticed Naruto's wistful smile and she also saw the look on his face that meant he just went through memories of his past. Because he is awesome that way. He is super strong, you know? If he trains you, maybe you could grow up to be the Hokage like your grandpa. Her words drew an appreciative look from Naruto. Ino grabbed Naruto's hand and saw a way to make this better. You know, Konohamaru, Naruto has been training all of the rookie Janan. You should watch the tuning exams and see how awesome we are. If you want him to train you after that, I am sure he would be happy too. Konohamaru switched from infuriated to looking at Naruto with a sense of hero worship. Really, boss? You would train me and my friends? Naruto nodded confidently and rubbed a finger under his nose in false pride. Damn straight, Kono. If I train you, you will be the best in your class. I will bet you a jutsu that I am a better sensei than that fool Ebisu. I bet he talks to you about shortcuts to becoming Hokage and all that nonsense. Naruto didn't feel the slightest bit guilty pulling on knowledge from his past to get his apprentice back. Konohamaru jumped and pumped a fist into the air. Awesome. Udon and Mo, get up here. The two kids skittered forward. I am Konohamaru Sarutobi, this is Udon and Moigi. So, what awesome jutsu are you going to teach us first? Naruto walked through Konoha talking animatedly with the children. Tamari and Ino watched on with wistful smiles on their faces, each of them knowing how much these kids meant to him in his past life. They made their way to training ground aid and began teaching the kids about the importance of eating healthy, how to work out and giving them a basic rundown of chakra. Naruto's demonstrations on the importance of each thing kept the kids engaged and they were even excited to learn how to perform the leaf balancing exercise. Naruto ended up leaving a shadow clone with the kids, which absolutely blew their minds. He received kisses on the cheek from Ino and Tamari, each of them had hearts in their eyes as they thought about what a good father Naruto would be. The Suna Konoha group made their way back into the village and to the Namikaze compound. Tamari insisted on seeing the gardens, especially after exchanging gossip with Tamari. Speaking of the two girls, they were talking animatedly like schoolgirls, truly throwing themselves into starting a friendship that would hopefully turn into a sisterhood in time. Gara and Konkuro gave the giggling girls a wide berth and when they were at the training ground, Kakuro unsealed his puppet Karasu and engaged in a spar with Gara. Gara didn't even unseal his gourd, he fought Karasu in taijutsu and by using various earth style and sand style jutsus. Naruto watched on proud of his brothers, who were much stronger than they were in their previous life at this point in time. Konkuro's puppet control was improved and Konkuro was an apprentice seal master, which made his puppet that much deadlier. Reinforcement seals, ammo replenishment seals, explosive tag traps and many more seals appeared on Karasu. Of course, none of those seals would be used in a spar against his brother, but Naruto would be lying if he said he wasn't excited to see what Konkuro could do in an all-out battle. Sadly, for Naruto, despite his best efforts and guidance, Konkuro still insisted on wearing war paint and the damnable cat suit. The cat suit was from the 2ND Great War when Suna's puppet corps was in its glory days. Naruto simply couldn't convince his older brother figure that he would get more girls if he wore something cooler. Even Tamari couldn't convince her little brother to change his uniform. Tamari, Gara, and Naruto were forced to resign themselves to accepting that Konkuro would be completely hopeless with the female species. After the spar and trip to the Namikaze compound, Tamari disappeared with Ino, who wanted to give her the private tour of the gardens. Gara wore a peaceful smile on his face as the ambience of the garden flowed through his body and relieved his stress. Konkuro seemed to feel the peaceful presence as well because his posture relaxed, and he wore a contented smile on his face. Naruto was proud of his efforts as he walked down the path between the walls of colors and plants. After an hour in the gardens, the kids returned to the Senju compound to see Kurama, 
Rasa, Tazana and Sunade drinking sake at the dinner table. Anko and Rias were cuddled up on a love seat next to York and Shizun who were doing the same. Kaisa and Tsunami sat on the floor next to Inari who was talking animatedly to Hikari. Yosuke was leaning against a wall with Himawari pulled into his chest. Overall, it was the perfect big family picture of contentedness. The new arrivals joined right in and grabbed some of the food that was left over from dinner. Tamari and Ino went to gossip with Rias and Anko while Naruto caught up with Kaisa and York, making Tsunami and Shizun go out back with the other girls for girl talk. The night was filled with sake, laughter and love before Ino had to go home and Tamari joined Naruto in bed. The compound got the Naruto special wake-up call the next morning for the CrossFit session. More than a couple of his clones were forcibly dispelled as the recently awakened compound crushed the clones in a variety of grisly deaths. Surprisingly, the clone dispelled by gold dust noticed that it was dispelled in Tsunade's room, which made Naruto smile. He always wanted his mama to find happiness. The death by vipers was Naruto's least favorite clone memory of the morning, but he didn't let that stop him from dragging everyone out of bed. The CrossFit workout of choice was the same assessment workout that he started everyone with, and he activated the chakra null zone. There were nearly 30 people participating in the morning session, but it just made the atmosphere competitive and brought the best out of everyone. Then came the spars, which the group decided to conduct with the chakra null zone active. This proved to be a useful exercise, even if it seemed like everyone was moving far slower than usual. Naruto sparred against Rasa, which spurred Guy to challenge Asuma, which spurred Lee to challenge Kaisa and so on and so forth. It devolved into rotating spars without chakra as excited screams were heard around the training ground as people explored their fighting capabilities without chakra. Once again, Naruto's heart filled with warmth and his soul pieced another sliver back into place. Unfortunately for Naruto, after he beat Rasa in chakra free taijutsu, Might Guy bound over to him and laid an absolute beatdown on him. Guy was the one person that was stronger than Naruto in raw strength and he was still leagues better than Naruto in taijutsu. After the morning training session, people scattered and went about doing their own things. Naruto let Hinata use the guest house showers to clean herself off and change her clothes. As Hinata changed, thoughts of Gara and Naruto danced in her head, which was progress for the usually one-track-minded Hyuga heiress. As she exited the guest house, she saw Gara cleaned up nicely as he was wearing a white button-down, with sleeves rolled and the Subaku crest on the back. He wore black skinny jeans, and he was holding a bouquet of moon lilies. Hinata blushed profusely as Gara complimented her on her lavender sundress. Naruto, Tamari and Ino spied on the cute scene and watched the two leave the compound for their date. Naruto told the girls that he would meet them at Akimichi barbecue at noon, he had something that he wanted to do before then. He gave them each a loving kiss before dashing off back toward the training area where he could still hear Lee and Guy. After pulling Guy aside and sitting him down in the Senju gardens with a glass of tea, Naruto decided to figure out what made Guy tick. He had started to get to know the man after dealing with the Akatsuki and into the early phase of the war. Unfortunately, Guy opened the eight gates in defense of Lee and a platoon of resistance fighters before he got to know him well enough to understand him. Yosh, Naruto, it was a most youthful workout this morning. I truly appreciate you helping my team. Guy started in his loud and boisterous voice. Naruto's eyes dimmed and he got serious, Guy sensei, could we talk without our masks on? Guy's expression fell and his eyes hardened. What do you mean? Young Senju. A supremely sad expression crossed Naruto's face and his eyes danced with years of pain, which shocked Guy to his core. Guy, there is a lot about my past that I will never be able to share with other people. The truth is, I have come to respect you over these past couple months, and I wanted to get to know you better. I can tell that you are wearing your mask, I just can't put my finger on the source of your pain. Guy's face fell and big tears began dripping down his cheeks. It is a sad story, Naruto. War always leaves scars and the scars on my heart were too much for me to bear. My eternal rival, Kakashi, was the only person that ever understood me. Are you sure you want to try? Naruto nodded slowly and cracked a sad smile at Guy. I can feel your pain, Guy sensei I am a powerful sensor, and the truth is I love you and lead too much to let you continue carrying this burden without help or a true friend by your side. I want to know the real Guy. Guy began weeping openly and pulled Naruto into a bone-crushing hug. The word youth was used 46 times in less than 30 seconds, but Naruto pushed through the discomfort to get to the real guy. After steadying himself, Guy began his story. It started when I was a kid. I was a talentless shinobi, but my father taught me the value of hard work. My father, might die, was a Janan to his dying day and he opened the 8th gate and saved two squads of his comrades when I was still a child. He fought off the previous generation of the seven swordsmen of the mist and was able to kill three of them. 
I was in the orphanage until I graduated from the academy when I was 10. The Three Road War started when I was 12 and I was sent to the Iwa Front along with your father and Kakashi. After your father crushed Iwa's will, I moved to the Kumo Front. I was stationed there for three years and fell in love. She was from a shinobi family of Kumo, and things were great until they weren't. We were going to elope when she got pregnant, and her family doctor found out. I fought most of her family and got her out of the compound and back into fire country. Kakashi joined me for that off-the-books mission, which is why he is my eternal friendship. Guy began breaking down at this point and his body was racked with sobs as the painful memories overwhelmed him. Naruto rubbed his back with a comforting hand in a gesture of mature support that would seem strange coming from a young teenager. After a couple minutes, Guy continued in a whisper. A week later, we found that she was poisoned by her own family. The poison killed my unborn son and by the time we got Yurina to Tsunade, she was already on death's doorstep. I buried my wife and unborn son before I joined the final assault on Kumo, where I lost myself in a fit of rage. It was your father and Kakashi that brought me back from the brink. Fast forward a while and I saw Lee struggling in school and living in the orphanage. My mind projected my lost son onto him, and he became my reason for living. He understood what it was like to be talentless, and he also was a genius of hard work like me. I wear my mask to keep him thinking positively and encourage him to overcome his adversity. Now, Naruto, you know about me. When the time is right, the beautiful green beast of Konoha will be here to listen to your story. Guy put a comforting hand on Naruto's shoulder and Naruto heard a small, yet familiar, voice telling him to share part of his story. Naruto took a deep breath and told Guy an abridged version of his story. He said that one of his alter egos gave him memories of a warrior's past and the images of the end and his failures haunt him. He avoided linking the warrior's past to the current reality, but he tried to convey as many of his genuine emotions as he could in his talk with Guy. Another shard of the past fell into its place in Naruto's soul as he gained yet another precious person that he would fight to protect. Unknown location, somewhere in Earth country. A man sounding like a snake was conversing with a much smaller and older man. He passed a file over to the old geezer and let him read the information contained within the bindings of the folder. So, can I count of your support? The slithering voice said. The little man nodded. Indeed, I have two teams heading there now. Let me hear what you have planned. Otoga Corps, hidden underground base, Dozu, Zaku and Kin were waiting in a dark and dingy underground base. Kabuto was standing behind them when chills ran down their spines all of a sudden. The shadow seemed to slither before Golden, slitted eyes appeared in the darkness of the torchlit chamber. You three, my precious little experiments. You will be going to the Chunin exams in Konoha. You will make it to the finals or suffer my wrath. In the second stage, you will test Sasuke Uchiha and Naruto Senju. If they are weak, you will kill them. The slithery voice said. Yes, Lord Orochimaru. Your will be done. The three answered on bended knee with their fists over their heart. Very good, Kabuto, you and your team will participate as well. Make your move in the second stage, it will take place in the forest of death. Kabuto, share what you know with this three. Yes, Lord Orochimaru, Naruto Senju is 13 years old and is the grandson of Tsunade Senju, son of Minato Namikaze, who was actually the lost Senju, and Kushina Uzumaki, the last princess of Whirlpool. He is ranked highly among the Janan, but the specifics on his abilities and strengths are unknown. I cannot even get mission reports related to him. He is highly skilled at Fuenjutsu based on his family's seals and activities, medical jutsu is a given since he was raised by Tsunade, he is the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Kitsune and he hosts workout sessions that leave the legendary might guy tired. Use extreme caution when approaching him. Kabuto rattled off the list of unknowns. Orochimaru frowned, making his snake face look even creepier. That is a lot of unknowns for one of my most skilled spias. I expect better from you, Kabuto. Kabuto bowed, my apologies, Lord Orochimaru. The kid is heavily guarded, almost never alone and all information related to him is locked down like a SS rank secret. Regardless, we will not let him interfere with our plans, Orochimaru said with finality. Tsuchikage's office, Land of Earth. Onoki called for his Janan teams and two of the teams were in front of him. His daughter was 14 and she was already on track to go to the Jonin exams in the next year or two. However, he needed her skills for this mission, so she was demoted to Janan. She understood the importance of her mission, the Senju boy was making too many waves already and he needed to be dealt with. Okay, you six will be going to the Chunin exams in Konoha. Kurotsuchi, your team will be led by Han. Do not draw too much attention to yourselves, go to the exams, make it to the finals and find an opportunity to remove Naruto Senju from the equation, 
Onoki said with venom. Han spoke up, are the rumors true? Is he really the son of the Namikaze? This got heads turning from all the Janan except Kurotsuchi, she had already been informed. Yes, I cannot tell you what we have planned due to those pesky security seals. Just make it to the Chunin exam finals and your follow-on mission will be given to you before the finals. Kurotsuchi punched one of her fists into her open palm. Leave it to us, old man. I will melt him. Border of Fire Country and Lightning Country Dash two teams of Kumo Janan were being escorted by the Rakage and their Jonin Sensei to the Border of Fire Country. I had enjoyed the help from Naruto, the Neighborhood Watch and the Alliance with Konoha. The benefits to Kumo overall were tremendous and his people were happier with his reign as Rakage, and he was already being hailed as the greatest Rakage ever. He puffed out his chest as his pride swelled and he looked down on his two teams of Janan. All right, Team Yugito and Team Daru, I expect you to go and represent the might of Kumo. Conduct yourselves with honor and make it to the finals where we can show off Kumo's progress to the world. Samui, your side mission still stands, but no need to rush anything. Yugito, I would also encourage you to get closer to the Senju boy. He is going to become the key player in the elemental nations as he comes of age, and I think he could help you with Matatabi. Samui, write to your boyfriend in that scroll and let him know you will be there tomorrow evening. Also, tell him that I wish to order 100 communication scrolls by the exam finals. The teams bowed to their rakage. Yes, Lord Rakage. Very good. Travel safe and have fun. I am proud of each of you, I said as he waved them off. The following evening at the Senju estate, the Senju compound was positively bustling with life in a way Tsunade hadn't seen since before the Three Road Great War. The Suna and Wave additions were just the start as Naruto informed them that the Kumo teams, the Wind Daimyo and the Fire Daimyo would also be staying with them in. Between the two ND and three road rounds of the exams. Naruto had clones running around everywhere being directed by clones of Tsunade as they played host to an ever-growing family. As Tsunade was stressing over preparing the guest houses, she felt the alarm seal on her bracelet activate, which meant that somebody was at the front gate. She decided to greet the newcomers on her own since she just sent Naruto on an errand run to grab more supplies in town. Tsunade gave a hug to Amoe and Samui, since she knew them from their time in the exchange program. Unfortunately, Amoe had lost his built-up immunity to Tsunade's beauty and this hug caused blood to trickle from his nose before he fell unconscious with a goofy grin on his face. He was forcibly awoken by a bonk on the head from Kairo, which made Tsunade laugh heartily. She greeted and welcomed Team Yugito into the Senju compound with a smile on her face. With a couple days to go until the first part of the Chunin exams, the Senju compound was a lively mix of international cooperation and friendship. It was great for Naruto to see his Kumo friends once again and he managed to form a relationship with Yugito and Matatabi. He didn't know the two from before because by the time the villages came together in the Five Cage Summit, Yugito had already been captured with the Nibi extracted. Therefore, he did his best to get to know his sister in burden before shit really started hitting the fan. A beautiful red-haired man, I imagine Kurama's human form looking like Guy Crimson from Tenshura, walked up and placed a kiss on the back of Yugito's hand. Matatabi went from purring in Yugito's mind and telling her to jump the man's bones to screaming to do it. The two-tailed cat was incredibly jealous and raged in Yugito's mindscape when she identified the man as Kurama and saw him walking around freely in the Senju compound. Unfortunately for Yugito, her seal was incompatible with Naruto's jutsu to let Kurama out of the seal. The cat's moans and groans would be the main source of Yugito's headaches for the duration of her time in Konoha. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.